Threadly Secret by Samantha Price, read by Sarah Morsey. Chapter One This house hates us. Matilda held out her thumb to her mother. See? Kate Roberts stared at her daughter, not pleased with her outburst. After all, the bishop and his wife were visiting, and she'd warned Matilda to be on her best behavior. As usual, it had fallen on deaf ears. Matilda, did you say hello to Bishop Paul and Mrs. Byler? Hello, Bishop Paul and Mrs. Byler. Matilda's tone suggested she was disinterested. She hadn't wanted to move and leave her friends behind, and she'd already told her mother she had no desire to make new ones. The bishop smiled, his silver beard moving along with his mouth as he did so. Hello, Matilda. Matilda gave a quick smile back and then turned to glare at her mother with her thumb stuck in the air. Don't you care about my thumb? Give me a look, Kate said. Matilda took two more steps until she was close enough for her mother to inspect her thumb. Kate didn't even need to look at the injury. It had to be another splinter from her bedroom door frame. Gabriel had said he'd renovated the place, so she couldn't insult him and tell him about the splinters, especially not when he was allowing them to stay there for free. Kate grasped her daughter's hand and held it up to the light. Ah, uh, it's nothing, just a scratch. Matilda's freckled nose wrinkled. It's a splinter from this dumb hoss. Now Kate was embarrassed. This wasn't good. It's not a splinter. There's nothing in it. It's just a tiny scratch. They'd think she was a bad mother who hadn't raised her child properly. The truth was, Matilda had always been difficult, and it had nothing to do with how she'd been raised. That would make no difference to Bishop Paul and Mary, whose children were probably perfectly behaved at all times, all fifteen of them. The bishop chuckled. A horse can't be dumb because it's not a living thing. Matilda looked around the room. This one's different. It feels like it's alive and wants us to leave. Kate held her breath. Ah, nay, the bishop's wife said with a laugh. There's no such thing as a living hoss. Fixing a smile on her face, Kate straightened Matilda's dress. She's always had such a vivid imagination. Matilda pushed her mother's hand away and walked over to Mary, the bishop's wife. How old are you? You don't really look old, but you must be because your husband's hair is gray and your... Kate flew to her feet. Have you finished packing your things away in your room yet, Matilda? I'm talking to Mrs. Byler. Excuse me, Kate said to her guests as she grabbed Matilda's hand. She then led her to her bedroom. Once they were out of earshot, Kate hissed. Stay there until they go. What about my thumb? Don't you care? It's fine. Be quiet for now. There's nothing I can do about it. Matilda's lips turned down at the corners, and Kate closed the door. Then she returned to her guests. Sitting down, she said, I'm sorry about that. She's got a thing about knowing people's ages these days. It's just a stage she's going through. They all go through them. Mary smiled kindly. Yes, Kate picked up her teacup and took another sip. She so wanted to fit into the new community. It was meant to give her and Matilda a new start. In their old community, it became difficult the way everyone looked at her after what had happened to her husband. No one had said anything to her, but she knew what they'd been thinking. Are you going to the fair tomorrow? Mary asked. I am. I was too late to enter one of my quilts into the competition. I was going to do it just for fun. Greta said you make fine quilts. Greta? the bishop inquired. Greta O'Toole is the lady who runs one of the best quilt stores in town. She also organizes the county fairs, too, as well as selling a lot of quilts for our ladies to the tourists. Ah, well, I wouldn't know. I don't go to quilt stores so often, he chuckled. 
or any stores if I can help it. I leave that up to Mary. I hope to put quilts in Greta's store on consignment, Kate told him. I'd heard about her store even before I got here. He nodded to his wife and then said to Kate, How are you set for money? The bishop's question took her by surprise. Oh, I'm doing okay. We have money from the sale of the house, and my quilt money will keep us going. I've been blessed to be given this house to live in for a few months. Thank you for putting me in touch with Gabriel. I think we'll be happy here until I find somewhere permanent. Yeah, Gabriel is a good man. We have a fund if you need anything. Bishop Paul wagged a finger at her. Don't keep silent. She smiled at the kindly man. I will remember that. Thank you. Bishop Paul drained the last of his hot tea and then placed the teacup down. We should go, Mary. Mary suddenly rose to her feet. Danka for the tea and the cake. I'll see you at the fair tomorrow. Yes, I'll see you there. When the bishop and his wife left, Kate sank into the couch and held her head. It had gone well. They both seemed to like her, and she liked them too. Not ready to hear her daughter's high-pitched voice just yet, complaining about anything from a small scratch to missing her friends, she closed her eyes, enjoying the silence that she knew would be temporary. All she heard was the sound of a distant car and two birds chirping. Then a multitude of birds flew overhead and their chirps rang out. She listened harder and heard the different songs of the different birds twittering their happy tunes from nearby trees. Then she heard some very different sounds from outside. A woman's voice said, The bishop's gone already. Then another one answered, I know, I can see that. What's your point, Etty? My point is, after we give her this chocolate cake, we shouldn't stay too long. I'm not the one who overstays their welcome. Kate jumped to her feet and looked out the window. Two elderly Amish women were making their way toward the house. Since Kate saw no buggy in sight, these two had to be her neighbors from next door. Gabriel had told her about them. They hadn't been at home the previous day when Gabriel had helped her and Matilda move in. She moved to the door and opened it. The bigger of the two women moved in front of the smaller one, blocking her way. Ah, you must be Kate. I am, and you two must be. The woman who was behind came forward. I'm Etty, and this is my sister, Elsa May. We live in the house next door. Elsa May said, grinning, and we've made you a chocolate cake. Eddie held out the cake toward her, and Kate took it. It looked high enough to be a three-layer cake. Oh, how lovely! Would you like to come in and have some with me? We'd be delighted, Elsa May moved into the house. Come through to the kitchen, and I'll put the kettle on. It won't take long because it's already boiled. Kate was pleased to get to know these ladies. Gabriel had told her that they'd be able to introduce her to the other ladies. While they waited for the kettle to boil, and Kate was busy cutting the cake, Matilda appeared. Hello, she said, looking at their two guests. Hello, the two sisters chorused. Then her gaze drifted to the cake. Wow, Mama, look at the cake. Can I have a piece? If you sit down and be quiet while the adults talk, you can. This is my daughter, Matilda, and Matilda, this is... Oh, I only know your first names. I'm Mrs. Lutz, and this is my sister, Mrs. Smith. Did you bring the cake? Matilda asked them as she sat on the spare chair. We did. I baked it, Eddie told her. And I made the frosting. Elsa May added. I like the frosting the best. Matilda stared into Eddie's face and then looked at Elsa May. Kate saw her looking at them and feared the worst, guessing what she was about to say. 
Matilda, take your cake and eat it in the living room. By myself? Nay, she's perfectly okay here, said Elsa May. It only took a couple more seconds for Matilda to ask the question. How old are you, Mrs. Smith? Kate held her breath and didn't know what to say. Even though she told Matilda not to ask people their ages, it went in one ear and out the other. I'm very old, but not as old as Mrs. Lutz. Etty giggled and then took a sip of tea. Are you the oldest? Matilda asked Elsa May. That's right, the oldest and the wisest. I'm like a wise old owl. Matilda smiled, seeming satisfied, and stuck her fork into the chocolate frosting. I'm sorry about that, Kate said, relieved that the two ladies didn't seem to mind. She has to know everything. Matilda finished her mouthful and then looked at Elsa May. Are you like a hundred or more? Kate jumped up and took hold of Matilda's plate of cake. You can finish this in the living room, but no buts. After she'd taken her daughter out to the other room, she sat down with the ladies. I'm sorry about that. She just thinks she needs to know everything. No need to be sorry, Etty said. Elsa May nodded. I know some other people like that. Etty narrowed her eyes at her sister. Then she turned her attention to Kate. We just saw the bishop and Mary leaving, and they said you have a quilt to enter into the fair. No, I don't. I wanted to, but I only arrived yesterday and found out I was too late. Greta wouldn't take a late entry. She said something about it not being fair to the ladies who've been sewing for the fair for a whole year. And he's only talking about the fair because it's her way of boasting that she's going to be one of the judges. You're judging the quilt, said he? Nay, the cookies. Oh, that is exciting. You'll get to taste them all. I am looking forward to it. Where did you come from, Kate? Kate's heart beat faster. She had to remember to be vague each time she answered this question. I come from a small community in Wisconsin near Hillsboro. Ah, then you'd know Harold and Janet Palmer. They're friends of mine. I write to them all the time. Kate's mouth went dry. I'm not sure. I must admit my husband and I dropped out of the community for a while. We were only back in six months when he had the accident. We weren't fully accepted after we left and then came back, and that's why I felt it best to move on. We're very sorry, Elsa May said. Both Eddie and I have lost our husbands. When did they go missing? Matilda had appeared in the doorway. Eddie smiled at the young girl. My sister means that they both died. Oh, Matilda looked down at her plate of cake. Elsa May continued to speak to Kate. Yeah, we know what it's like, and with the little one it can't be easy. Kate shook her head. It hasn't been the best. There are a lot of children here your age, Matilda. You'll make friends in no time. Matilda took two steps into the room. I like my old friends. Mama said we had to leave because Kate flew to her feet. I really think you need to eat that in the living room while the adults talk in here. Yes, Mama. Matilda turned around and moved into the other room. Ah, she's so sweet, Eddie whispered to Kate. Sometimes, Kate answered, other times she's not the easiest child to manage. Gabriel said he's taking us all to the fair tomorrow. I'll have to be there early if you don't mind. Etty smiled at Kate. Elsa May shook her head. It's her way of bragging about being the cookie judge again. It's not, and I wouldn't brag. I'm honored that they chose me. I've never judged anything before, and I do like cookies. This cake is delicious, 
said Kate. Are your cookies this good too, Eddie? Is that why they chose you to be a judge? It's not for me to say. She's a good cook, Elsa May admitted. That's why they asked her. But there's more than one judge. There are three. Eddie narrowed her eyes at Elsa May. I'm happy to be one of the three. That way, three opinions are had, and three are better than one. Who's judging the quilts? Ah, the quilts are always judged by our local councilman, Martin Cruz. A man? Yes. Why's that? Eddie and Elsa May looked at one another. We're not sure, Elsa May said. It's always been that way, Eddie added. I thought they would have been judged by someone who's an experienced quilter, unless he quilts. No, he doesn't, Elsa May said. Hmm, I don't mean to be critical from the moment I arrive, but surely there should be two or three judges who are quilters and have sewed them and been around them for years. I mean, just one person judging the quilts, knowing nothing about them, seems wrong. Don't you think? That's right, Elsa May said. I agree, it does seem odd now you mention it. And it doesn't seem fair. His taste would come into account. What if he likes bright colors and dismisses all the muted quilts? I say there should be two or three people because surely one person would have their own preferences and other judges would balance things out. I think Greta would have given him some pointers, Eddie said. And after judging for years, he should know what to look for. Or does she tell him what to choose? Kate asked. I wouldn't think so, Eddie said. All the same, if the same person judges them all the time, won't the ladies start sewing the types of quilts he's fond of? They'll work out his taste. Eddie nodded. That makes sense. I guess it's Greta who's made that decision to make him the judge, because she's the organizer. You do make some good points. I'm sorry, it's not my place to say anything, being a newcomer. Yes, you should speak your opinion and not hold back. It's certainly a good point, but most of the ladies who could be judges have entered their quilts in the fair. However this town and community did things, Kate knew she wouldn't be the one to change things. She had to keep under the radar and do her best to blend in. Kate smiled at the ladies. Perhaps that's why they've got him to be a judge then. Eddie stared at Kate. She appeared to be in her early forties, old for a typical Amish mother of a ten-year-old, and to have only one child was also a little unusual, with most families having between six and up to twelve or more children. Eddie had heard Kate's husband had died within the past year. Gabriel said he's taking all of us to the fair tomorrow. We'll need to be early if that's okay. Yeah, Eddie, you've already told her you need to be there early because you're one of the cookie judges. Kate said, We'll be ready early tomorrow morning, Eddie. Matilda always wakes at first light. We should go, Elsa May. It's getting late. After they said their final goodbyes, Eddie and Elsa May walked back to the house, wondering if Kate knew there had been a murder in the house. Had Gabriel told her? Surely he had. Chapter 2 Kate seems nice, Elsa May commented as they walked back into their house. The house next door feels so different now that Kate and young Matilda are there. It made me almost forget those neighbors we had before. Yeah, I was just thinking the same. She'll only be there temporarily. What we need when they move out is some nice folks who'll look after the garden and care for the place. Kate's got her hands full with Matilda. That girl's just got a lively mind. I do think what Kate said about Martin Cruz judging the quilts is correct. Doesn't he help organize the fairs as well? He does it all, apparently.
The next morning, Eddie and Elsa May traveled to the fair in the back of Gabriel's buggy with young Matilda between them. Elsa May had insisted Kate sit in the front with Gabriel. We'll show you around the area, Kate. No need. Mary insisted on doing that on Monday, and she's going to teach me Pennsylvania Dutch since I'm not familiar with it. She said I'd need to learn that. I mean, you can all teach me, I suppose. I know a few words, but that's it. It won't take too long, Gabriel said. Elsa May leaned forward. What caused you to move here, Kate? Mama wants to open a quilting store, Matilda answered before her mother had a chance. Kate turned around and glared at her daughter. I believe I was asked the question, Matilda. Sorry, Mama. What Matilda said is true. I do hope to open a small quilting store here, and it would have helped if I took first prize in the show, but Greta wouldn't take a late entry. We do have a lot of that kind of store here, Gabriel told her. We could always do with more, Elsa May said. Greta said she can't keep up with the demand. That's the rent, Elsa May. She said she can't keep up with the rent. Elsa May stared at her sister. Are you sure? Quite sure. I knew she couldn't keep up with something. Etty continued. That's why she had to change her consignment amount from 25% to 35%. She said she had to do it to survive. Gabriel laughed. Sounds drastic. Well, for her to keep her store open, she might have had to do it, Elsa May commented. Kate turned around to face the sisters once more. Are the rents in town high? No higher than anywhere else, I wouldn't think, Elsa May answered. Etty said, I haven't seen your quilts, Kate, but I have to tell you that Leonora Schroeder always wins the quilt competitions. She's won every one of them for the past 15 years straight. I can't wait to see her sewing then. That'll let me know what I'll be up against for the next fair. When they arrived, Matilda could barely sit still. Eddie had to hurry out of the buggy before Matilda just scrambled over the top of her. Eddie was smoothing down her dress when she looked up and spotted Leonora. She told Kate, that's Leonora over there going into the green tent. Everyone looked at Leonora. I'll be back around two, Gabriel told them. Dinka, Elsa May said, we'll be here waiting so you don't have to come find us. As Gabriel drove away, they walked through the gates and into the fairgrounds. Would you mind looking after Matilda while I go to the ladies' room? Of course, we'll look at the exhibits while you're gone, Elsa May said. The ones that are open, that is. Okay, I'll come and find you. When Kate walked away, Greta O'Toole, the organizer, came running over. Yoo-hoo, Eddie! Eddie knew she was coming to tell her where she needed to be. Greta looked very conservative in her white lace-up tennis shoes she always wore and a blue floral dress. Eddie was amazed at how her hair always stayed in place, neatly curling up above her shoulders, while near her face she had one distinct white streak that stood out among the gray. It was clear from the look on Greta's face that she was panicked and the day had hardly begun. Hello, Greta, Eddie was just about to ask how she was doing, but she didn't get a chance. Meet me in the blue tent in five minutes. The other cookie judges are there already. She put her hand on her chest to catch her breath and scurried away. Eddie looked back at Greta to ask which color tent she'd just mentioned, but she saw her talking to a lady with blonde hair and didn't want to interrupt. You go, Eddie. Matilda and I will be fine. Oh, there's ice cream. Can I have some, Mrs. Lutz? Matilda asked. Elsa May chuckled. I don't see why not. I'll find you later, Eddie, after you finish eating the cookies. I mean, judging the cookies. Cookies? Matilda asked, looking between the two women. They're not for eating, Eddie told her. Don't listen to Mrs. Lutz. Matilda's freckled nose screwed up. What are they for if you don't eat them? They're for judging, Eddie said. 
When Etty looked back around, she didn't see Greta anywhere, and the blonde woman was gone. Elsa May took hold of Matilda's hand. Let's get you that ice cream. Etty stood there for a moment and watched them walk away, thinking how funny it was that the very old and the very young got on so well together, even though there was a full generation in between them. Then Etty remembered she had to be somewhere. The cookie tent. What was the color of the cookie tent where Greta told her to go? She looked around and saw at least ten tents. People were busy posting signs outside the tents, and none of them was labeled as the cookie tent. There were three tents with no signs. Eddie ruled out the red tent right away, being sure Greta had said either green or blue. Both of those colors had been mentioned in the past few minutes. She decided to go to the one farthest away and work her way back. When she stepped into the green tent, she caught a glimpse of someone scurrying out of the tent on the opposite side. This was the wrong tent, clearly. There were no cookies. Eddie looked around at all the magnificent quilts everywhere. Some were hanging, and others were spread out on trestle tables. Quilts had always been a source of fascination for her, probably because her mother and her grandmother before her had been keen quilters. She and all her sisters had been involved with family quilting projects. But nowadays, Eddie preferred needlework. Quilting took up so much time and space. Space was something she didn't have in the small house she and Elsa May shared. And as for time, it didn't take that long to finish one of her needleworked samplers. The quilt tent, Eddie murmured as she looked at each of the pieces. Eddie guessed there were upwards of forty of them. When Eddie saw a fine star-patterned quilt, she was transported back to days gone by when she'd been in her grandmother's house. A quilt similar to this one had been on her bed for as far back as Eddie could remember. She ran her fingertips over the dark greens and then the navy blues. A bright blue and pink quilt that looked like a painting of a house quickly took her attention. It was exquisite, and nothing like any quilt she'd ever seen. To be sure it was actually a quilt, she had to inspect it closer. She took a step, tripped over something, and landed heavily on her stomach. Even though she'd been quick enough to put her hands out to break her fall, the wind had been knocked clear out of her. It took her a while to regain her breath. Lying on the floor, she hoped she hadn't broken anything. She wiggled her toes and was pleased she felt the move. Her hands felt scraped, but she was very glad to realize she hadn't injured her wrists. Once she sat up, she looked back to see what she'd tripped over. A white tennis shoe was sticking out from a quilt that reached the floor. On her hands and knees, she crawled over and lifted up the quilt. Two white tennis shoes. And they were on someone's feet. Eddie's heart pumped with adrenaline. Looking past the shoes, she saw legs and then a floral dress, a blue floral dress. This was a good. She lifted the quilt even higher to see it was Greta. Dead. Chapter 3 Help! Etty tried to yell, but it came out as a croak. She needed to attract someone with a cell phone who could call for help but first she needed to get some air into her lungs. She moved away and managed to push herself to her knees. Help! She called out with all her strength. Then someone burst into the tent. Are you okay? It was a man. Immediately, she recognized him as local counselor Martin Cruz. He was always at these kinds of events. She stared down at her grazed hands. I think I'm okay, but there's someone under the table who's not. Martin moved forward, reached down, and lifted up the bottom of the quilt. When he saw Greta lying there, his face turned white. Then he looked back at Eddie, as though asking for an explanation. I just found her here, Eddie said. Is she? We need to call for the paramedics. Do you have a cell phone? Without replying, he straightened up and took his cell phone out of his pocket and pressed 911. 
She looked under the table, and when she looked back at him, she saw him with one hand on his cell phone, and with the other hand, he was pushing something into his pocket. When their eyes met, he quickly looked away. I'm waiting for the operator. Reluctantly, Eddie crawled under the table to get a better look at Greta. If there was any chance the woman was still alive, Eddie didn't want to waste time. Knowing every second was crucial, Eddie pressed two fingers against Greta's neck and waited to feel a pulse. Nothing. Then she held her hand in front of Greta's face to see if she could feel any breath coming from her mouth or nose. Still nothing. Then Eddie saw the marks around Greta's throat. She'd been strangled. This was a murder. While the counselor talked to the operator, Eddie couldn't think of a reason the woman would have been murdered. She was a kind-hearted Englisher who ran a quilting store and organized local charity events. Eddie crawled out from under the table. They're coming, Martin told Eddie, holding the phone a distance from his ear. Police and the paramedics. She's been murdered. His jaw dropped open, and then he said to the operator, Yes, I'm still here. It looks like she's been murdered. Eddie left him there in the tent. Not wanting young Matilda to learn that someone had been killed, she walked around trying to find her and Kate. Minutes later, she saw Elsa May coming out of a tent, followed by Kate and Matilda. Where were you, Eddie? Everyone's been looking for you, Elsa May said. Eddie tried to catch her breath. I went to the wrong tent. Eddie looked down at Matilda to see her eating cookies. Was this the cookie tent? Elsa May continued. That's too bad because they couldn't find you and I had no choice but to fill in for you as a judge. As much as Eddie was annoyed, she couldn't worry about cookies or judging right now. There were bigger things to be concerned about. She pulled Elsa May aside and told her what had happened. Elsa May then ushered Kate and Matilda to the other side of the fairground. Eddie headed back to the quilt tent to see if she could do anything to help. By now, a crowd had gathered, and the counselor was still on the phone pacing up and down while ordering everyone to stay back and keep out of the tent. Not wanting to draw attention to herself, Eddie slipped around the back of the tent and walked in the back entrance. She was surprised to see someone in the tent. It was an Amish woman, Leonora Schroeder, and she was stuffing a quilt into a bag. Chapter 4 Eddie stepped forward. Leonora, what are you doing? I don't want my quilt to be taken. I won't be able to sell it. Stop. You can't touch anything. It'll all be evidence now. The counselor walked back in and frowned at each of them. No one can touch anything. That's what they said. Leonora smiled at him until he left, and then her face hardened when she looked back at Eddie. This is my quilt. No one can tell me what to do with something that's mine. Eddie walked closer to her, not understanding why she seemed totally unconcerned about what had happened. You do realize that Greta has not died from natural causes, don't you? She stopped what she was doing. I am sorry about that, but it's got nothing to do with me or my quilt. Eddie stared at Leonora, still shoving the quilt into her bag, trying to think of something to make her stop. The police won't like it. What they don't know won't hurt them. Me and my quilt have nothing to do with anything. They'll be here any minute. Martin stuck his head inside the tent. They're here. When he was gone, Eddie turned back to Leonora and did her best to sound more urgent. You need to leave the quilt. It might have evidence this is now a crime scene. By now, Leonora had her quilt secured in her bag. She grabbed it with both hands and slipped out the back of the tent without even looking at Eddie again. Right at that moment, Detective Kelly walked in. Eddie turned around and the two of them locked eyes. Mrs. Smith, well, well, I might have known. 
Etty gulped. I was only here at the fair to judge the cookies. You were the one who found her? Yes, she's under the table. She's, well, she was Greta O'Toole. Kelly pulled on a pair of gloves, then crouched down and lifted up the edge of the quilt. After he looked at Greta, he twisted to look up at Eddie. What were you doing when you found her? Looking for the cookie tent. I came into this one by mistake, and I was walking to the end to take a closer look at a most unusual quilt that had caught my eye. She looked around for it and saw it was gone. The beautiful quilt had to have been Leonora's. Right now, I'm just after the short version of the story. Thank you, Mrs. Smith. I tripped over her. Her legs were sticking out a little ways, and I didn't know until I was flat on my face on the ground. You okay? He frowned, appearing concerned. Just sore hands. She held her palms up to show him. He didn't say anything, just nodded, and then took another quick look at Greta. What do you know about the deceased? She likes to wear white tennis shoes and always wears floral dresses, and Kelly twisted around and stared up at her, frowning. Any enemies? Where's her family? That kind of thing. Oh, I don't know about her family. She has a store in town. Etty nervously pulled on the neckline of her dress. It was a hot day for the middle of spring, and Kelly always made her nervous. He always asked questions and then got annoyed by her answers. Wait, she does have family. I remember now because Elsa May and I, and a few of our friends, attended her husband's funeral some years back. She has two nieces, and that's all. One is quite famous and lives in Hollywood. The other one lives around the area here. An officer poked his head in the tent. Detective Kelly, the coroner's here. Good, Kelly straightened up. Has anything been touched? He asked Eddie. She pulled her mouth to one side, wondering what to say about Leonora running off with her quilt. Come on, Mrs. Smith, you've got to know better than that. Not me. I didn't touch anything. It was... I just had to see if she was alive. You touched the body? I just felt for a pulse. I needed to know if she was still breathing. Surely he couldn't be mad at her for that. Just as he opened his mouth to speak, the coroner walked in, and along with him, more officers. You'll need to move away from the tent, Kelly told her. But don't go anywhere. We'll need to talk. Wait outside and don't talk to anyone else. Have the paramedics clean up your hands first. Eddie had one of the paramedics wash her scraped hands with antiseptic wipes, and then she waited outside with Martin Cruz. Martin's cell phone rang. He answered it, turned his back, and walked a short distance away, and that annoyed Eddie. She'd overheard that he'd also been told not to speak with anyone, and it sounded to Eddie like he was on the phone with someone from the press. Eddie walked up to Martin while he was still on the phone and pretended not to notice he was otherwise occupied. This is a terrible thing, isn't it? He frowned at her and held the phone away from himself. What was that? he asked. A dreadful thing. Excuse me, I'm on the phone. Martin Cruz went back to talking, taking a few steps away from her. When she followed him, he ended his call and turned back to face her. I'm sorry. Yes, it is a dreadful thing to happen. He smoothed down the few strands of hair he had left on the top of his head. I can't believe it's happened here at our fair. Eddie shook her head. It's dreadful. Then more police cars pulled up. What's happening now? Eddie asked him as more officers spread out across the fairground. They said they're going to shut down the fair and take everyone's name. Can they do that? Eddie asked. I guess so. Something like this has never happened before. I need to ask you something, Mr. Cruz. He frowned and shoved his hands in his pockets. What's that? In the tent, I saw you putting something into your pocket. Do you mind telling me what it was? He threw his head back and snorted. I don't know what you're talking about. 
I saw you, and you know that I saw you. He pulled out his pockets until they were turned inside out. Nothing there, see? Satisfied? Only my phone, which is all I generally carry with me. Then he stuffed his pockets back. Eddie didn't know why he was lying, but she knew she wasn't mistaken. Two officers walked forward and called them over. One of them took Eddie to sit in a chair behind one of the tents. Detective Kelly will be with you soon, she was told. While the officer waited with her, Eddie looked back at the tent and saw the yellow Do Not Cross crime scene tape being wrapped around the perimeter of the tent. When Detective Kelly finally walked out of the tent, he headed toward Martin Cruz, who wasn't too far away. Mr. Cruz, you were the one who called it in? I was. This way, please. Detective Kelly took Martin into one of the smaller tents to question. Fifteen minutes later, Martin Cruz left, and Kelly poked his head out of the tent and called Eddie over. Have a seat, he said when she walked into the small tent, full of food supplies for one of the food vendors. She sat down and looked around, placing her sore hands gently in her lap. Here we are again. Yes. Mrs. Smith, what's to stop me thinking you killed her? Eddie pointed to herself. Me? I didn't. Would you tell me if you did? I didn't. I mean, I wouldn't. Wouldn't do it. Still, I have to treat you as I would anyone else. I can't let the fact that we know each other affect my process. I'll need you to come down to the station and make an official statement. But for now, tell me everything you know from the moment you walked into the tent this morning. Surely he couldn't be serious about thinking she might have done it. No, he couldn't be. He was trying to sound official for the young officer who was standing at the door. I tripped over her feet and looked under the table, and there she was. I called out for help, and Mr. Cruz came in and helped me up. It was he who called 911. He wrote the notes in his book. Wait a minute. I saw someone leaving the tent on the other side when I came in. He frowned. From a tent on the other side? No, the tent has two doorways. I came in one just as someone was going out through the other. Who? I don't know. What did they look like, man or woman? Eddie sighed. I don't know. I just saw the tent flap swaying in the back of someone as they moved through. Could the flap have been merely swaying in the breeze? No, Eddie shook her head. It was someone. If only I'd been a second or two earlier, I would have been able to tell you exactly what they looked like. I don't even know if it was a man or a woman. I just saw the back of someone moving through. Eddie repeated. An inch of his, or her, back. It seems likely that was a murderer you saw. According to the coroner, she's only just expired. It must have been seconds after she talked with me. Can you recall anything else? Anything at all? Eddie put a hand over her fast-beating heart. If she had been a few seconds earlier, she would have looked into the eyes of the killer. She even might have become his next victim. Mrs. Smith, I asked if you could recall anything else. No, I was supposed to be judging the cookies. I went into the blue tent, and I think I should have gone into the green. No, wait, it was the other way around. Eddie shook her head and looked down. Oh, I'm not sure now. It's all left my head completely. Take a minute. It's okay. Take a deep breath. Eddie filled her lungs with air, held it, and then breathed out slowly. Then she came over a little light-headed, so she waited a moment before she spoke again. We saw Greta when we arrived. She told me where I was supposed to be, and then she was gone. Did she seem upset? Just flustered. It is a big job organizing something like this. She does it every year. She was in a hurry, that's what I thought at the time. 
Where is her business located? In the row of shops right next to the farmer's market. He jotted that down in his book. Then, when he looked back up at her, something caught his eye. Eddie followed his gaze through the tent door to Elsa May and their neighbor. Ah, I knew Mrs. Lutz wouldn't be far away. She never is. Is that her granddaughter? That's our new neighbor and her daughter. They're staying in the house next door for a while until they find a permanent place. They've just moved here. I don't suppose Mrs. Lutz saw anything. No, she was looking after our neighbor's child. Where was the mother? She went to the bathroom. He uncrossed his legs and crossed them again the opposite way. Did you have a quilt entered in the contest? No, I haven't attempted to make a quilt for years. He nodded. All of the quilts and everything in the quilt tent will have to go into evidence. We'll pack it all up after the evidence technicians have been over it. I understand. I thought as much. And that was exactly what she had told Leonora. When you approached the tent, did you see anyone around, apart from the person slipping out the other entrance? Eddie dissected his question. He was talking about before she found Greta's body. No. How soon did Cruz appear? he asked. I called out, help, and he was there right away. How loud did you call out? Loud enough for him to hear. Must have been fairly loud for him to have heard you from outside the tent. He must have been very close by, wouldn't you say? Eddie nodded, still wondering whether she should tell him about Leonora taking her quilt. That's right, he must have been right outside. Tell me about... He looked down at his notes. Greta O'Toole's store. She sells Amish quilts and quilting items as well as fabrics. Most of the quilts, I believe, are on consignment from our ladies in the community. Interesting. I wonder why she does that. For money. It's her business. She earns money from the sale of the quilts. She also sells other bits and pieces, too. I can see from her clothing she wasn't an Amish woman. But does she have any other connections to your Amish community, other than selling the quilts? I don't think so. If she does, I don't know about them. Do you know anything about her family? Etty searched her mind. Only that she's a widow with no children. When her husband died years ago, some of our ladies from the community went to his funeral. Yes, you said that, and you told me you attended. Yes, I did. I remember being told that Greta's niece was a famous TV star. She didn't attend the funeral because she was too busy. I just remember people talking about her. They said she was in a soap opera. I recall that because it struck me as such a funny name. No one knew why the word soap was used at all. I believe the term goes back many years to before TV was around. The radio shows were called soap operas because they were often sponsored by soap companies. Eddie stared at Detective Kelly. Is that so? Kelly smiled. I'm a bit of a trivia buff. I do have a good memory and I retain odd pieces of information. Interesting. Now I know. Thank you for that. What was her name? Whose name? The soap opera star's name. Ah, that would be... I don't remember the name. I just remember the soap bit. Etty shook her head, hoping Kelly wasn't too disappointed. What about other family members? Her sister passed away. She was the one with the two daughters. That's all I can tell you. Thank you, Mrs. Smith. We are locating the nieces now so we can break the news. Eddie looked down at the ground, sad that the nieces would soon learn the tragic news. What a terrible way to go. It wouldn't have been the fastest death. It takes longer than you'd think to cut off someone's air supply completely enough for them to expire. Yes, I have heard that. 
It just doesn't make sense. I can't believe this has happened. Who would have wanted her dead? That, Mrs. Smith, is exactly what I aim to find out. I need you to come down to the station to make a formal statement. I will, first thing Monday morning. Tomorrow is our day of rest. Monday morning, then. Eddie shifted in her seat. The hard wooden chair was uncomfortable. Can I go now? Yes, and thank you. If you remember anything at all, be sure to let me know. Of course. Eddie left the detective, and the first thing she saw when she looked up was a pair of police officers taking hold of a young man. Just as she was about to turn back and ask Kelly if he had something to do with Greta's death, two officers walked into the tent where Kelly was. Not wanting to interrupt him, she walked toward a group of people that had gathered over at the other side of the fairgrounds. There she found Elsa May, Kate, and Matilda, waiting with Gabriel. You're back so soon, Gabriel. I thought you were coming back at two o'clock. I heard what happened and I came right back to make sure everyone was okay. We are fine, Eddie said. I'm glad you're here because you can take us back home. The fair hasn't even started, has it? Matilda asked. Is this all there is? I thought it would be better than this. Yes, it's over, her mother told her. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude, but this has not been the best fair I've been to. And why are the police here? The fair had to be shut down, Eddie told her. That's why it hasn't been a good one. Why? Because someone got sick, Kate told her. Why don't they go home? It doesn't make sense that we all have to go home just because one person's sick. Don't talk so much, Matilda, Kate said. Matilda folded her arms across her chest. I'm only asking. Come along, Matilda, her mother said, walking back to the buggy. Eddie felt sorry for Matilda. She'd worked herself up to expect a good day. They'll close it down today, but it could be open next weekend or the one after instead. Will it? It's possible. Soon they were in Gabriel's buggy, heading home. Chapter 5 Matilda had gone to sleep in the buggy, and Kate had to shake her awake. I'm sorry our day wasn't what we thought it was going to be, Kate, Elsa May said. Now, who would like to come in for a cup of tea? Elsa May looked around at everyone. Matilda didn't say anything and rested her head against her mother, looking very tired. No, thank you. I think Matilda and I will just have rest. Matilda didn't get much sleep last night. Why's that? Gabriel inquired. She's just not used to the new place. She's missing her old bedroom back home. I can understand that, Gabriel said. Kate said goodbye and walked Matilda into their house. Thank her for taking us to and from the fair, Gabriel. Eddie patted his shoulder once she was out of the buggy. You're welcome any time. Too bad about the woman being killed. I know, and I'm not looking forward to going over the whole thing again on Monday. What's that? Gabriel asked. Why would you have to? Ach, I should have explained. Detective Kelly needs an official statement from me. Do you need a ride there and back? I'll be fine, but Denka, I'll go by taxi because I'm not sure what time I'll get through. Very well. You know where to find me if you need me. Yeah, we do. He gave them a wave and moved his horse forward while Eddie and Elsa May walked into the house. As they moved through the doorway, Snowy rushed at them, wagging his tail. We should have stayed home with you, Snowy. Eddie collapsed into the couch. I just can't believe what happened today. I mean, there she was talking to us one minute, and the next, she's dead under a table. Elsa May sat in her usual chair. Me neither. I have so much to tell you. 
Did you see the man that was taken away by the police? They've made an arrest already? Looks like it, but I won't know any more until I go to the station Monday. Another thing I didn't have a chance to tell you was, while we were waiting for the police, Leonora came and took her quilt out of the tent. I told her the police needed that for evidence, and she didn't care. Elsa May leaned forward. What did Kelly say about that? Well... You did tell Detective Kelly, didn't you? Now Eddie felt even worse. If Elsa May was cross with her, and judging by her mouth now forming a thin line, she was. Nay, I didn't because I thought he would somehow blame me. Ah, oh, Eddie, I think you should tell Kelly everything you know. He'll be even more upset with you when he finds out you kept that from him. Eddie closed her eyes and thought for a moment. She could hear him now, telling her she should have stopped Leonora, or certainly should have told him about Leonora right away. It's worse now that I haven't told him today, isn't it? A whole lot worse. But I know why Leonora took it. Why is that? Her quilts are worth a lot of money. She always wins first prize. The other ladies might never get their quilts back from the police evidence room. Yes, Elsa May, good point. She was just being smart. She even said they'd take it. I didn't tell Kelly because I knew that Leonora wouldn't have had anything to do with Greta's death. I hope she didn't think that I thought that. All I wanted was for her to leave the quilt. I know that. I'm sure Leonora didn't think you thought she did it. I hope not. Nay, don't give it another thought. She was just looking out for herself without seeing the bigger picture. Who might have murdered the poor woman? No one at the fair could believe it. She was involved with many charities, and she was a kind woman. It's a great loss to everyone in a great many ways. No doubt. Eddie tapped her finger on her chin while she thought about the last time she saw Greta alive. When Kate left us to go to the bathroom, right when we arrived at the fair, she didn't ask her daughter if she wanted to go as well. Yes, I thought about that, too. That seemed a little odd, but she can't. No, surely you don't suspect Kate of killing the woman. No, but was Kate gone for long? Long enough for Matilda to eat an ice cream and then for us to find the cookie tent. We were looking for you. She found us just when I was in the middle of the cookie judging. Eddie's face soured. I can't believe they asked you to judge in my stead. You should have said no. We looked for you. Not hard enough. I was only a few tents away. Wasn't there a loudspeaker somewhere? They could have called me over the loudspeaker. Elsa May's blue eyes opened wide. Oh, Eddie, why would they call for you over a loudspeaker to tell you where to be? Greta had already told you where to be just two minutes earlier. Eddie frowned. Who chose you instead of me? The two other judges who were waiting for you, that's who. They were running according to a time schedule, so that's why they nominated me. I was there. That's the only reason. Yeah, I bet you were very sorry about that. Elsa May chuckled. I did get to sample all of the cookies. Don't talk about it. Again, Eddie's mind circled around everything that had happened that morning. I wonder who would have killed her. Another thing I must tell you is that when I walked into the tent, someone was disappearing out the other door. The killer? Very likely. Detective Kelly seemed to think so. You do get yourself into some dangerous situations. You could have gotten killed. When they had left home, She'd had no idea that going to the local fair would be so perilous. How did I know someone was going to be murdered in the quilting tent? I didn't even know what tent I was walking into. It's not my fault. 
and it's not my fault they made me the cookie judge. How were they? The cookies? Yeah. Elsa May's face lit up. There was a white chocolate and oatmeal cookie. It was the best I've ever tasted. It had just the right amount of crunch and melted in my mouth. Etty screwed up her nose. I don't know that I would have liked that one. Trust me, you would have. We'll never know. I'm sorry, all right. I know you felt honored when they asked you to judge the cookies, and it was a letdown when it didn't happen. Eddie wasn't listening to her older sister prattling on. Tell me, when Kate found you after the bathroom trip, did she seem upset? No more than she did at the start of the day. She seemed a little jumpy and on edge, but she seems like that all the time. That must be her personality. And she always seems so impatient with poor young Matilda. She's always snapping at her for one thing or another. You're right about that. But it can't be easy for her to have moved to a new place with a child. And to lose her husband at such a young age would be awful. Eddie put her fist to her mouth and bit into her knuckle as she thought about how awful life must be for Kate trying to make a home in a new place. Greta must have had an enemy, Elsa May said suddenly. Really? You should have been a detective, said Etty with a wink. Elsa May chuckled as she leaned down to fetch her knitting out of the bag that permanently waited by her chair. It's surprising to me. A woman who lives by herself, minds her own business, and has a store where she sells quilts. Who could possibly be upset with her? Everyone seemed to love her. No one has a bad thing to say about her. Elsa May popped her knitting glasses on. That's something for Kelly to figure out. As Elsa May clicked her knitting needles together, she said, I read something the other day. I'm not sure where. But apparently, everyone's keeping 13 secrets. Perhaps one of those secrets got her killed. Do you really believe everything you read? Come on now, 13 secrets? Not 12? Sometimes, or 14? Exactly 13? Elsa May looked over the top of her glasses. How many secrets are you keeping, Etty? None. I don't believe it. In all your years, you must have gathered some. If most people have 13, you must have 20, or maybe even 30. While Elsa May cackled at her own words, Etty rubbed her chin, wondering if she did have a secret she hadn't told anyone. There was that time when Snowy was a puppy and she accidentally left the door open and he ran down the road and they couldn't find him for hours. Elsa May had assumed the wind blew the door open, and Eddie didn't tell her any different. And then she recalled the time she had been doing the ironing and got to daydreaming. She had burned a hole in one of Elsa May's older aprons and tossed it out without ever confessing what she'd done. How many have you come up with so far? Frowning, Eddie said, Nothing to get me killed over, I hope. A secret that she had, and maybe she shared it with someone. No, wait! What if she knew someone else's secret? We never guess what it is, so there's no use talking about it. Why don't you heat us up some of that soup we had last night? Suggested Elsa May. Eddie pushed herself to her feet and headed to the kitchen. As you said, it's Kelly's problem, not ours. When she was nearly at the kitchen, Elsa May yelled out, By the time you get there Monday morning, he might already have the killer in custody. I hope so, but somehow I do hope it's not that young man. He looked too young to spend his life in prison. I'm hoping he isn't guilty. It's okay if it's someone older? Elsa May asked. Yeah. After Etty put the pot on the stove, and while she was waiting for it to get warm, 
she stood and looked through the kitchen window at the house next door. What did they know about Kate and why she'd moved? And how did Kate's husband die? And why hadn't the gossip mongers who normally supplied Eddie with information told her anything about Kate? Chapter 6 On Monday morning, Elsa May and Eddie sat side by side in front of Detective Kelly in a small interview room with only a table between him and them. Eddie tapped the toe of her black lace-up boot on the tiled floor. Kelly looked under the table. Please don't. Sorry, Eddie said. I do that when I'm nervous. There's nothing to be nervous about. You're just here to tell me exactly what happened on Saturday morning. Elsa May asked, What have you found out? Have you arrested anyone yet? He stared at her and cocked his head to one side. We have detained a suspect, a young man with a criminal record. One of our officers spotted him in the crowd at the fair. We've interviewed him extensively. Until we have solid evidence that he's our man, we are still following other leads. Such as, Elsa May asked. I can't tell you right at this moment. My men are working hard questioning people as we speak, and of course the forensic testing of the evidence is underway. His tongue traveled across his lips, and he picked up a cup of takeout coffee and took a mouthful. He made a face. Ugh, cold. He placed it back down on the table. We'll be recording this soon, Mrs. Smith. Tell me again what you were doing in the quilting tent. It was the wrong tent. It was not the cookie tent. Judging the cookies, that was what she was meant to be doing. She went into the wrong tent, Elsa May added. They had to choose me instead. Eddie wasn't happy about that. He stared at Elsa May, and his face took on a glazed expression. Choose you for what? To judge the cookies, of course. He shook his head. We're here to talk about the woman who was murdered, not the cookies. I'm just giving you the overall mood of what was going on at the time. We arrived with Kate and her daughter, who are temporarily living next door. The now deceased came running over and told Eddie she was needed in the cookie tent. An officer came into the room and flicked a switch on the video camera, which was set on a tripod in the corner of the room. Mrs. Smith, I do have to tell you that everything you say will be recorded. This is Detective Kelly, chief investigator for the case. Do you consent to this recording, Eddie Smith? Eddie nodded. I'll need you to speak so it'll be recorded. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. The officer gave a nod to say that it was recording. When the officer left the room, Detective Kelly again asked Mrs. Smith what she was doing at the quilting tent. She repeated everything that Elsa May had just said. Then he asked, How could you have got the tents confused? The quilting tent was the largest one there, and the cookie tent was the smallest. I went into all the tents before I left. I don't know, but there was a beautiful quilt, and I was going to take a closer look. It was blue and pink, and it featured a house, a river, and a garden. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I would have liked to have seen it, Elsa May said. You would have liked it. Kelly said, Mrs. Lutz, we are hearing from Mrs. Smith at the moment, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind at all. He raised his eyebrows and then looked back at Etty. Continue, please. The sky was blue, different shades of blue, and his lips turned down at the corners. Are we still talking about the quilt here? Yes. You told me to carry on. Only tell me about the quilt if it directly relates to anything we need to know about the deceased and who might have killed her. Anyway, if you don't want me to keep telling you about the quilt, I won't. Wait a minute. He eyed her skeptically. I don't recall a quilt such as the one you're describing. I was there when the forensic team packed each of the quilts. Eddie gave Elsa May a sideways glance, wondering what to say. I told you you should have told him, Elsa May whispered. He leaned across the table with a stern look on his face. Told me what? Eddie took a deep breath, 
knowing Kelly would be more than a little annoyed. I wasn't going to tell you this because I didn't think it would matter. I know she wouldn't have killed Greta. She's not a killer. Who? Leonora. She wins all the quilting competitions. Then Eddie said quickly. She took her quilt away. You're telling me that someone took a quilt out of the tent? That's what she's telling you, Elsa May said. Exactly when did she take it away? Eddie sputtered nervously. The quilt, her quilt, the one that she'd entered into the competition. It would have won first prize for sure. When did she do this? He asked, more loudly this time. The counselor was still on the phone to 911. She must have heard what happened, and she came to the tent and took it away. I told her to leave it, but she wouldn't listen to me. Elsa May nodded. It's true, she did. Eddie did say that. I know, because she told me. Kelly frowned at Elsa May. Were you there, too? You know I wasn't there, but Eddie told me about it. You should have stopped her anyway. You could have, Mrs. Smith. Have you seen the size of Leonora? Elsa May asked. Eddie wouldn't have been able to stop her physically, and talking didn't help, as she just told you. Kelly picked up his pen. I got her first name as Leonora. Last name? Leonora Schroeder. He scribbled the name down in his notepad. And where can I find this Leonora Schroeder? Eddie crouched down in her seat, wishing she could rewind back to yesterday. She would have gone into the right tent. She would have judged those cookies, and then someone else would be sitting where she was right now. Well, Mrs. Smith? She's one of our ladies. Did you know that? She's Amish? He asked. That's right, Elsa May said. Surely you don't think that someone from our community could be a killer, do you? My job is to find leads and follow them through. It's the court that decides who the guilty parties are. Give him her address then, Eddie. Eddie gave him Leonora's address. Now, from here, you'd go to South Street and then take the first left. I don't know the name of that street, but if you follow that until you get to the... No need for directions. We do have GPS these days. It wasn't so hard, was it? He asked, scowling down at his notes. Elsa May let out a loud sigh. It'll probably be wasted time talking with her. I don't think she would know anything about who killed Greta. Kelly stared at Elsa May, gave a firm nod, and then stood. Come with me, Mrs. Lutz. He walked to the door, and Elsa May followed. Then he opened the door and turned around. Please wait in the waiting room until Mrs. Smith is finished. Oh, I won't say any more if you want me to keep quiet. All you have to do is say the word. The only words I want to say are waiting room, he pointed out the door. Elsa May did as she was told and walked out of the room, looking down at the floor. Chapter 7 Kelly returned to his chair with a deep sigh. Is that all right with you, Mrs. Smith? I know you requested she be here. Shall I have her come back? It's okay. I don't need her here. Now that she got the Leonora business off her chest, she was fine. Good. We shall continue. I don't think there's anything else I can tell you. That's all I know. Have you heard of anyone being upset with Greta O'Toole? All I know is that a lot of ladies in the community are upset because Greta increased the consignment percentage for the quilts she sells. Now she keeps 35%, when it used to only be 25 You see, she sells them and keeps a percentage. I am familiar with the concept of consigning goods, Mrs. Smith. Oh, of course you would be. Is there anything else you can think of? No, except... He leaned forward. Except? There was one other thing that bothered me. Martin Cruz put something in his pocket. I saw him. He narrowed his eyes. When was this? When he came into the tent after I called out for help. 
While he called 911, I was seeing if Greta had a heartbeat, if she was still breathing, and when I told him she was murdered, I poked my head out from under the table and saw him placing something in his pocket. Kelly drew his eyebrows together. Small or large? Small enough to easily fit in his pants pocket. Why are you only telling me this now? When we were waiting to be interviewed, I asked him what he put in his pocket, and he denied it. Said I could check his pockets if I didn't believe him. Then he pulled his pockets out, and there was nothing there. He rubbed his chin. You should have told me this on Saturday. He would have denied it. My words against his. I'm seen as just a silly old fool, and he's a respected member of the council. Are you sure of what you saw? Yes, my eyesight is perfect. I don't even need glasses for needlework, and I can read newspaper print. I eat a lot of carrots. But you didn't see what it was he placed in his pocket? No, it happened too quickly. He breathed out heavily. Anything else? Anything at all? Eddie shook her head. Please speak for the recording. No, there is nothing else, nothing that I can think of. I'll just get a transcript of your statement, and I'll have you read it through and sign it, if you agree with it. Okay. When Etty nodded, he left the room. Etty sat drumming her fingertips on the table. With the video camera in the corner of the room, she couldn't even reach over and take a look at his notes he'd left in the folder. Fifteen minutes later, he came back into the room. Sorry for keeping you so long. We had trouble with the printer. It's quite all right. He passed the statement over, and she read through it. Yes, it looks about right. About right? I'm sorry. I chose my words poorly. That's right. It is right and true. That's what happened, and they are my own words. Good. Then make your mark down at the bottom. She scribbled her signature at the bottom of the page and then passed it over to him. I do hope you can find who did this to her. Do you think it was a man or a woman? We haven't got the full report back from the coroner yet, but from what I saw initially, it's obvious she was strangled. It takes quite a bit of strength to strangle someone. As I told you before, it's not as easy as people think. There wasn't a lot of time between the time I saw her and the time I found her under the table. She must have gone right to the tent after she'd talked to me, and someone was waiting for her. Or followed her in, Kelly added. And we have to figure out why. And who, Etty added. But who would tell us why, because the how is pretty well established. When she saw Kelly looking irritated, she asked, Am I free to go now? Yes, tell your sister I'm sorry, but she just wouldn't keep quiet. I know. I have that problem at home quite a bit. Unfortunately, I don't have a waiting room where I can send her. Kelly stood, trying unsuccessfully to stifle a laugh. He reached the door and opened it for her. I have been wanting to ask you something, Mrs. Smith. She looked up at him, holding her breath. What had she done now? I want you to talk to all the Amish ladies who have their quilts on consignment at her store. Someone might know something, and I know from experience they'll talk to you much easier than they'll talk with me. It's a long shot, so I'd rather you ask the initial questions and let me know if you think anyone knows anything. How will I know who they are? Do you have a list? He smiled at her. I'm sure you have your ways of finding out. Just do what you would normally do to find things out. It would be much easier with a list. I'm working on it, but until then, just do things how you usually do. Did you contact the next of kin? I did. It's only the two nieces, like you said. One lives in town, the other lives in L.A. The one who lives locally is opening her aunt's store today, surprisingly. Perhaps that's where you should start. Start with what? Start making your inquiries. Eddie shook her head. I don't think it would be the right time. Not right after her aunt has died.
Keep in mind I am letting you off the tampering with evidence charge. But I had to see if she was still breathing. He shook his head. I'm not talking about that. I'm referring to you withholding information, impeding an investigation, and I'm sure I can think up a few other things that could see you winding up in jail. Wouldn't look good for your Amish community, would it? Detective Kelly, I think you've known me long enough to know that I'll help if you ask nicely. Besides, jail would be a nice break from my sister. He chuckled. You're right, it would. Before you go, I have something to show you. He left the door and went back to the table and opened a folder. Then he placed four photographs in front of her. Do you recognize any of these men? Eddie took a careful look at each one in turn. No, I don't think I've seen any of them before. Who are they? Take another look. Do you recognize any of them from the fair? No, I've never seen any of them before. Kelly reached over and gathered them together and placed them back in the folder. Was one of them the young man you're questioning? Eddie asked. Might be. Would you do some asking around within your community, Mrs. Smith? Yes, I will since you asked nicely, but only to prove to you that no one in my community had anything to do with Greta O'Toole's murder. She walked through the door without waiting for him to say anything else. Mrs. Smith? She stopped, still in the hallway, and turned around. Yes? He walked over to her. I'll need you to keep an open mind. Perhaps Mrs. O'Toole withheld the consigner's money or didn't pay someone the right amount. Enemies can readily be made in business. It all comes down to money. That doesn't seem very likely. And besides, didn't you just tell me it takes strength to strangle someone? Sounds like a man did it. And besides that, why would someone kill her over a small amount of money? It's not as though quilts are sold for thousands of dollars. Mrs. Smith, to you and I, something might seem inconsequential. But when the ego becomes involved, things get blown out of proportion. I've been involved with people killed over parking disputes. Someone thinks someone stole their parking spot and a fight breaks out and boom, someone's dead. You would know. Exactly. So do what you can and let me know if you find out anything. Thank you, Detective. You said you heard Greta's daughter is opening the store today. No, sorry, not her daughter, because she doesn't have a daughter. Is it her niece opening the store today? Correct. And one more thing, Mrs. Smith. Please never keep information from me again, even if you think it doesn't matter. I won't. And I will. Eddie left him standing there looking confused and hurried away to find her sister. Eddie was anxious to speak with Greta's niece at the quilt store. Chapter 8 Elsa May sat in the waiting area wearing a long face and reading the newspaper. She looked up at Eddie. What took you so long? Nothing. I made the statement. The statement must have taken longer than the actual events that you were retelling. Elsa May tossed the paper back onto the table beside her and pushed herself to her feet. What happened to poor old Greta is on the front page of the paper. I knew it would be. Eddie glanced down at the paper and saw a photo of Greta. Are you ready? I am. How rude was Detective Kelly just now? Very, Eddie agreed as they walked out of the police station. Mostly, she agreed with her sister to avoid arguments. Life was easier that way. Once they were outside on the pavement, Eddie said, I've told Kelly I'd find out for him what ladies had quilts on consignment at Greta's store. Why? I don't know. He wants us to see if they know anything or if they were upset with her. He's got some idea that maybe someone might not have been paid properly and they got angry and killed her. When are we supposed to do that? Detective Kelly said one of Greta's nieces is opening the store today. Today? Is that right? Yeah, that's what he said. Unless he's made a mistake. 
If you want me to go with you, I will. But I can't do it when I'm so hungry, Etty. Elsa May held her hand over her stomach. We just had breakfast at home. That was hours ago. It's nearly lunchtime. Is it? Yeah. Why don't we have lunch at the cafe up the road? It's close enough for me, Elsa May grinned. Let's do it. The two sisters walked up the road arm in arm. I still haven't forgiven you for judging the cookies. What did you want me to do, refuse? Of course. Then come looking for me. You would have bumped into the killer and saved Detective Kelly and me a lot of bother. And probably got myself killed in the process. I didn't think of that. But no one could have known that would happen. Instead, you took my job, allowed me to be put in danger, and then you ended up getting thrown out of the interview room by Detective Kelly. Eddie contained a giggle. He didn't throw me out. He did. You wouldn't stop talking. I was giving a statement, and you couldn't keep quiet. It was my statement, not yours. And that's why he did what he did. Oh, Eddie, Kelly is temperamental. We both know that. And as for the judging, I was just trying to help you out when no one could find you. You thought you were helping me by stealing my cookie judging job? Elsa May nodded. Yeah, exactly. I was doing what a big sister does. Just for that, you can pay for the lunch. I had intended to. Good. Then you're not disappointed. And I'm suddenly very hungry. When they walked into the cafe, Eddie breathed in the aroma of cake and freshly brewed coffee. They were two of her favorite scents. While Elsa May stared at the array of cakes in the glass display cabinet, Eddie resisted the temptation and flipped through the menu, trying to make a sensible lunch choice. I'm going to have a small cup of coffee and a large slice of lemon cake. Look at the frosting, Eddie. Eddie stared at the frosting on the lemon cake. So, for lunch, you're having a plate of white frosting? Elsa May chuckled. Nearly, but it's lemon frosting, and it does come with a small slice of cake attached. It's not a proper lunch. We can have a decent lunch when we get home, but right now I'm having cake. You do whatever you want. Eddie closed the menu. If you're having cake, so will I. After they placed their order, they made their way to a table by the window at the back. A man on the other side of the room stood, and Eddie recognized him. It was the councilman, Mr. Cruz. He barely looked at her, gave a nod, and kept walking. Eddie realized he mustn't have recognized her, and that had to be why he hadn't stopped to talk. It's Eddie Smith from Saturday. By this time, he'd moved out the door. She walked outside after him. Mr. Cruz, it's me, Eddie Smith. He stopped and turned around. Oh, yes. Sorry, I didn't see it was you. How are you doing after what happened on Saturday? Eddie asked. I'm fine, excuse me. I'm late for an appointment. He gave another quick nod and hurried away. Eddie walked back into the cafe and sat down in front of Elsa May. Well, that was embarrassing, Eddie. Did you have to run after him like that? No, I wasn't running. I haven't run since 1965. Elsa May chortled. Okay, you were shuffling after him. He didn't recognize me, that was it. He said he was late for an appointment. Elsa May shook her head. That's not so. He was. He said that. Anyway, you always think the worst. Elsa May nodded toward the table he'd just left. Eddie looked over and saw a full plate of food and a barely sipped from cup of coffee. I don't know what you did to him, but the man left his lunch and his coffee to get away from you. Eddie's fingertips flew to her mouth. He must have found out. Found out what? Eddie slumped in the chair. I didn't know it was important, so I didn't say anything to you, and I've only just told Detective Kelly. Elsa May leaned forward. What is it? 
In the quilting tent, just after I found poor Greta wasn't breathing, I looked back at him, and I saw him slipping something into his pocket. I don't know what it was, but it was something. Kelly might have called him and asked him about it. I hope Kelly didn't say it was me who said it, but he must have known anyway because there was no one else in the tent at the time. Elsa May nodded. That could be it. Of course, Kelly would ask him what it was. This is a murder investigation. If he's removed anything, he'll be in big trouble. Did you ask him at the time what he put in his pocket? Not at the time, but I did later when we were outside, and he pulled his pockets inside out to show me nothing was there. He would have had time to remove whatever it was, though. That is odd. He came into the tent quickly when I called out after I found Greta. I thought that it was a coincidence he was so close by, but now... He might have been close because he'd just strangled the woman in cold blood. I hope not. Would he come back into the tent if he'd just murdered Greta? Elsa May shook her head. Probably not. But I'd love to know what he put into his pocket. Yeah, me too. At the time, I felt I should ask him, but I didn't want to sound like I was accusing him of something. Then it kept bothering me, and I had to ask him. Now I feel bad for not asking him at the time. He couldn't have said it was nothing then, because I saw him put something in his pocket. Don't be so hard on yourself. I would have done the very same thing as you, Etty. The waitress set their food down in front of them. Then she turned to the table where the counselor had been sitting. She looked around, puzzled, and then cleared everything from the table onto her tray. He certainly looked like he was in a hurry, Elsa May whispered as she readied her cake fork. I know. Eddie looked down at the cake and knew it was going to taste delicious. There were tiny pieces of lemon zest on the frosting to give it that extra lemon tang. It looks too good to eat. Eat it, or I'll eat it as soon as I'm finished with this. Eddie picked up her cake fork, broke off a piece, and placed it into her mouth. The cake was moist, with just the correct amount of sweetness, and the frosting melted in her mouth. She could barely keep herself from moaning with pleasure. When Eddie had finished her mouthful, she said, If that was a cookie, it would have won first prize at the fair. Sadly, nothing won because the fair was shut down. I wonder if they'll hold it again soon. Have a do-over. Who would organize it? Elsa May shook her head. I don't know. Someone will step into her shoes. While I was banned to the waiting room just now, I did hear two officers talking at the front counter. They didn't know I could hear them. What did they say? They're close to arresting a young man for Greta's murder. Seems he has a criminal record and used to mow her lawns and do odd jobs. What was his motive? I'm not sure. That's all I heard. Good work. Elsa May smiled. His name is Raymond Quail Waite goes by the nickname of Mondo. Monday? Mondo, Elsa May repeated. Your hearing is getting worse than mine. It was you mumbling with cake in your mouth. I can hear perfectly well when you speak properly. Mondo. I will remember that now because of Monday. Elsa May picked up her last bite of cake and popped it into her mouth. Then when she looked at Eddie's plate... Etty quickly spooned the last of her cake into her mouth before Elsa May got any ideas. Where to now? Elsa May dabbed at the sides of her mouth with a paper napkin. Greta's quilt store. If you ask me, it's odd that her niece would open it the very day after Greta died. Why not close the store out of respect? It is odd. Very odd. We'll soon find out, Etty. Chapter 9 Eddie and Elsa May looked in the window of Greta's quilts. They hadn't been in the store for years. Out of the three quilting stores in town, this was the busiest and in the most prominent location. Here we are. Now what's the plan? 
Elsa May asked her sister. Eddie didn't have a plan. She had vague memories of meeting one of Greta's nieces years ago, but she didn't even remember her name. We'll just talk with her and say we're sorry, and somehow we'll have to gather those names that we need. Yeah, but how? We need a plan. I don't have one. We'll just see what happens. Okay, you go in the door first. Eddie put her foot on the step to walk into the store and came face to face with their temporary neighbor, Kate, who was walking out the door. Matilda was beside her, holding her mother's hand. Eddie was surprised to see them. Kate, hello, and what brings you here? I have quilts to sell. I was just talking to the lady about that. I didn't know this was the store that the poor lady... She looked down at her daughter, not wanting to say more. Yes, this is... was Greta's store. They're not taking any new consignments until they know what's happening with the store. And I can understand that. That's too bad. There are two others in town. Have you tried them? That's where we're headed right now. She was kind enough to give me the addresses. Good. I better be on my way. I've got a lot to do. She hurried past them. Goodbye, Eddie called after her. Matilda turned around. Goodbye, Mrs. Lutz and Mrs. Smith. Eddie and Elsa May waved at Matilda until her mother pulled on her arm and she turned to face the front. As the sisters walked into the store, Eddie whispered to Elsa May, I'm still surprised it's open today. Me too. Behind the counter, Eddie saw a young woman who appeared to be in her early forties. Her hair was cut short, in line with her chin, and she had the same piercing green eyes as Greta. It had to be the niece. Elsa May walked up to her. Hello, would you be Greta's niece? That's right, I'm Valerie George. We're very sorry to hear about your aunt. Thank you. Did you know her well? Yes, she was a very good friend of ours, Elsa May said. Eddie stared at Elsa May, wondering why she would make such an exaggeration. They hadn't known her that well at all. Then she said to Valerie, I'm Eddie Smith, and this is Elsa May Lutz. Valerie offered her hand. Pleased to meet you. It was a huge shock. I've only just left my job, so it was good timing that I could step in here until we figure out what to do with the place. I can't believe she went the way she did. She teared up and plucked a tissue from a nearby box. I'm sorry, she said as she wiped her tears with the corner of the tissue. Eddie shook her head. No need to be sorry. Everyone's shocked and saddened by the loss. Thank you. I was considering closing today, but I know my aunt would have wanted the shop to keep going. That's the only reason I'm here for her. Eddie felt bad for having thought the store should be closed. What Valerie said made sense if she was doing it out of respect for Greta. Everyone had different ways of thinking and doing things. Valerie looked around. I'll keep the shop if I can. She smiled at them and then asked, Do you ladies have quilts on consignment here? Before Eddie could say no, Elsa May moved in front of her. That's right, but I don't see mine here anywhere. Oh, Valerie looked around at the quilts on display. It might be in the back. Sometimes when my aunt has had them on the floor for a while and they don't sell, she gives them a rest in the back room, and then after a while introduces them again. I have worked here on and off over the years ever since I was in high school, and I'm familiar with her routine. That might be right. It has been here for a while, Elsa May agreed. But I would feel better knowing that it was definitely still here and hasn't been sold. Greta would have informed you right away if it had been sold. I'll take a look in the book. She moved behind the counter, crouched down, and pulled out a dark green hard-covered book. After she placed it on the counter, she flipped it open. This is where Aunt Greta kept her records. Everything's in here. She looked up at Elsa May. Was it Elsa May Klutz? Eddie covered her mouth, but too late to contain the giggle. Elsa May's jaw dropped open. It's Lutz. Elsa May Lutz. Oh, I'm so sorry. The woman kept her head down and continued looking in the book 
flipping over pages. I don't see your name here at all. When did you leave it? I'm not sure. A few months ago. Is it possible your aunt kept another book? Eddie asked. Valerie pressed her lips together as her eyebrows lowered. I don't think so. She only had the one. No, I am sure there is another book, Elsa May said in her usual booming voice. Every time I came in, she got the book from the back room. Perhaps you should look out in the back room there. Valerie pushed up the bottom of her hair. I don't think so, but I'll take a look anyway. She closed the green book and put it back under the counter. As soon as she was gone, Elsa May grabbed the book and stuffed it down her apron. What are you doing? Eddie hissed. There's no other way. Tell her an emergency came up and we'll come back later. Elsa May hurried out of the shop, leaving Eddie standing there in shock. When Valerie came back out, she said, No, there was nothing. She looked around for Elsa May. My sister had to leave suddenly. Oh. Stomach problems, Eddie explained. I see. I hope she'll be all right. Eddie's heart pounded. This wasn't how she'd envisioned getting the information. I'll check on her, and we'll have to come back later to see about that quilt. Yes, do that, and in the meantime, I'll double-check the book. Eddie leaned forward and whispered, I wouldn't bother. Then she tapped her head. She has been losing her mind lately. She might not have had a quilt here at all. Oh, then you don't think she has one here? Eddie raised both hands in the air. Honestly, I don't. To keep her happy, I'll have to come back with her as soon as she... as soon as she feels better. Good idea. Thanks for letting me know. I'll play along the best I can. Would you? Valerie smiled. Yes, of course. Thank you. That's good of you. No problem. Eddie hurried out of the store and found Elsa May two doors up, sitting on a bus seat, looking through the book. Elsa May, what were you thinking, leaving me there with your made-up stories? Sometimes you go too far. I didn't know what to say. I was standing there like an idiot. I got the book. Eddie sat next to her. Yeah, I know, but did Chapter 10 once they were in the library, Elsa May handed the book to Eddie. Eddie then walked over to the lady sitting behind the counter. Hello, could you copy something for me? The librarian offered up a bright smile. Certainly, what is it you like copied? Eddie handed over the book. This. The librarian took hold of it and flipped through the book. All the pages? The smile left the librarian's face as she stared up at Eddie, adjusting her glasses. Yes, all of them. Eddie saw from her badge her name was Carol. All of them, Carol, please. Anything that has writing on it. Carol counted the pages and then told her the cost. After Eddie nodded, Carol said, Have a seat, it might take a while. Please hurry, Elsa May said. Eddie swung around to see that her sister was right behind her. Carol rose to her feet. I'll be as fast as I can. They then sat down on the row of chairs at the front of the library. Eddie whispered out of the side of her mouth. That librarian seemed unsure. Almost like she knew what we were up to. You're too suspicious of everyone. Just relax. I don't know what Kelly was thinking. I know none of our ladies killed Greta over a price discrepancy. Elsa May shook her head. He has to rule these things out so he can go on to the next thing, Eddie said. You know what he's like, always doing things by the book. I think he's giving us something to do to keep us out of the way. Eddie didn't like the sound of that. Do you think so? I do. He's on to something, and he's probably about to arrest that young man. He showed me photos, but I didn't recognize anyone. It's too early for Kelly to be on to anything. He hasn't even got the forensic testing back. 
it always takes several days and often several weeks. Not always. He's getting us to do what he doesn't want to do. It's not that. We can find out things he can't. You're never happy, are you, Elsa May? Of course I am. Nay, you're not, Eddie pointed a finger at her. You're looking for something wrong all the time. I can't help what I see. It doesn't mean I'm looking for it. You're enjoying this, aren't you? Eddie asked. Nay, I'm not enjoying borrowing books and hoping the woman doesn't notice it missing before we get it back there. But I know you. You won't be able to sit still until this thing is all said and done and figured out. I don't think that is so. Eddie crossed her legs at her ankles. Yeah, it is. I'm just worried about how I'm going to get the book back to her. I'll distract her, and then you slip it onto the desk or under the counter. I hope she doesn't notice it's gone. Relax, Eddie said. Worrying will do no good. That's why we must get it back to her quickly, or she will notice. Elsa May held her head. I hope she doesn't call the police. Ha ha, don't even say it. I'm in enough trouble with Detective Kelly. We should have just asked her for the names. It was fifteen minutes later when Carol, the librarian, came out with the green book and a large stack of copy paper. She set it on top of the counter and Eddie walked over, hoping Carol wouldn't ask any questions. After Eddie paid the money, Carol said, Would you like me to find a bag for you to put all that paper in? No, thank you, Eddie said. Noticing Carol still looked concerned. She gathered up the pages and the green book, and then she and Elsa May headed outside. As they walked back to the quilt shop, Elsa May said, What are we going to do with this? We need a bag. You should have said yes. Not with the way Carol was looking at us. Just hide it down the front of your apron. A little bit of extra padding won't make a difference. Elsa May stared at her with one eyebrow raised. Someone has to eat the food you leave so it doesn't go to waste. Eddie smiled. Thinking it had gone to waste, all right. Elsa May's waste. She wasn't brave enough to say it, though. Just do it. No one will notice. With Eddie standing in front of her, Elsa May wedged the green book and the pages inside her apron. How does that look? Can you see anything? Elsa May patted her tummy. Eddie turned around to look. Fine, just fine. Okay, let's go. Just make sure they don't fall out. Chapter 11 When they got back to the quilting shop, Eddie went in first. Now the shop had two different pairs of customers, and Eddie walked through the door and was tremendously relieved when Valerie turned and smiled at her. She hadn't discovered the missing book. Then she stayed at the back of the room while Elsa May walked in. Elsa May was still hiding the green book under her apron when she walked to the counter. Eddie stood between Elsa May and Valerie, who still had her back turned serving customers. When the customers left, Valerie turned around and Eddie immediately tried to keep her occupied. She took Valerie by the arm and led her over to the window. I'm so cold I need to stand near the doorway in the sun. It is a little chillier today. Yes, it is. I saw this quilt once and it was blue and pink and it was of a house. Have you ever seen one like that? Not that I recall. It sounds very pretty. It was the nicest one I've ever seen. I'm fairly certain the woman who always wins first prize for her quilts at the fairs made it. Do you know the woman I mean? I do. Her name escapes me right now, but my aunt often talked about her, and Aunt Greta even gave me one of the ladies' quilts as a gift. Eddie smiled. There's nothing nicer than having a lovingly made quilt on your bed. Eddie hoped Elsa May had finished putting the book back by now. She wasn't brave enough to look behind her in case Valerie followed her gaze. 
Well, I must confess that I don't use it. It's too brightly colored. I prefer everything coffee-colored or at least muted. I have that one stored in the top of my cupboard. I'm saving it up to give to my daughter. It'll be something she can have from her great-aunt Greta. That's lovely. How old is your daughter? I don't have one yet. Maybe someday. Etty nodded and then heard a noise. She turned around to see that Elsa May had dropped all of the pages on the floor. Botheration, Elsa May said as she crouched down to gather them all up. Valerie walked forward to help her, but Eddie grabbed hold of her arm. No, Valerie, just leave her be. She's done this before and doesn't like anyone to help her. Anyone but me. Eddie tapped the side of her head to make Valerie think Elsa May was a bit crazy. Oh, Valerie looked over at Elsa May, concerned. Eddie whispered, I'll help her with those papers, and then we'll leave you in peace. I'm only sorry I allowed her out of the house today, but still, I can't keep her locked up. I thought you said she lived somewhere, in a home? Ah, no, I don't think I said that. So far, she lives with me in my home. Eddie shuffled forward to help her sister pick up the last of the papers. Valerie looked on. Mrs. Letts, how's your stomach? Elsa May stopped and looked down at her midsection. It's still there. That's good. I hope you're feeling better now. Elsa May eyed Etty suspiciously and then turned back to Valerie. I'm fine. Try some hot peppermint tea with a touch of lemon. I always have that when I'm feeling off in the tummy. Thanks. I'll try to remember that. We should go, Etty. We've got that appointment. Oh, you're going to the doctor? Valerie pushed her blonde hair back from her face. That's a good idea. It always pays to be safe. Elsa May stared at Valerie and blinked a couple of times. Yes, it does. Then they said goodbye to Valerie and hurried out of the shop. As soon as they were away from the shop, Elsa May pulled on her sister's arm. What did you tell her? Did you successfully place the book back where it was supposed to be? Yeah, I did, and she won't be any the wiser. Now what did you tell her about me? Elsa May clutched the papers to her chest. I had to make some excuse for you running off like that and leaving me there. I thought as much, Elsa May grunted. Let's sit down and organize these pages. That was a close call. I mean, if she'd seen what we had, it would have been dreadful. I know. They sat on the bus seat and straightened out the pages. As soon as they got home, Eddie put the kettle on to heat. Then she and Elsa May sat in the kitchen with a pot of tea and the copied pages from Greta's book spread out around them. There seem to be more people here than we were told. I know. We'll just work through them. Eddie, there are 15 names here that I recognize as being from our community, five that are not. We can't talk to 20 different people. Then we'll just do what we can do. Don't you want to find out who murdered the woman? Of course I do, but I have to think about you and your health. I can't drag you around everywhere. Why? Because of my sore stomach? Eddie giggled. We'll start tomorrow if you feel up to it. I think we should. Crying coming from next door interrupted them. They stared at each other. Oh, dear. That's got to be Matilda. I wonder what's wrong with her. Should we investigate? Eddie asked. Nay, she's probably just being difficult. You know how young girls can be sometimes. I do. Especially around the preteen years. She's only ten. That's what I said. Etty nodded as she normally did to keep her sister happy. When the crying continued, however, they grew concerned. I think we should go over, but we won't say we're there because of the crying. Elsa May agreed. We'll have to have some kind of an excuse. What about the cake you made the day before the fair? Yes, maybe, but we took her a chocolate cake the day before yesterday. Yeah, that's right, and she'd still have some of that left. Cookies? asked Elsa May. Yeah, cookies. Tea and cookies and cake. 
I think we just take the cookies. Or should we ask them back here for tea and cookies? Or milk and cookies? Hetty wondered. It's easier for us to take cookies over there. If she's got the child there, she might not be able to leave the hoss. I was thinking she would bring Matilda here. Elsa May shook her head. Nay. They got some cookies out of the jar and placed them on a plate, and then together they walked next door and knocked on the front door. The crying and howling were still going on. Had the child been harmed? Chapter 12 Kate opened the door, looking severely stressed. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you here to complain about the noise? What noise? Elsa May asked, blinking her blue eyes rapidly. We brought cookies, Eddie said, moving the plate toward her. Yes, we won't come in. I thought you might be able to use the cookies, and Matilda might appreciate them. That's lovely of you. Kate took the cookies from Eddie. I'm sorry about all the noise. Matilda is upset because she wants to go home. I said no because we've come here to make a new start, and that's what we'll do. If we were to return home, that would be going backward, and I never like to go backward in my life. I always like to move forward. Me too. Elsa May stepped forward and said, would it help, do you think, if I had a talk with her? I am a great-grandmother. Oh, would you? I'd be ever so grateful. Of course. Eddie was surprised. That wasn't part of the plan. Why did Elsa May think she was so good with children? It took no particular skill to be a great-grandmother. Kate said, I'll put the cookies in the kitchen and take you to her room. No need, Elsa May said. I'll follow the sounds. Before Kate could say anything further, Elsa May was at the bedroom door, turning the door handle. Then the crying came to an abrupt halt. Eddie couldn't resist the temptation to listen at the door. Elsa May was fake crying. Boo hoo hoo, wah wah wah. That's why Matilda had stopped crying, because she probably wasn't used to seeing an adult do so. What is Elsa May doing? Eddie put her ear to the door and heard Matilda giggling. What are you doing, Mrs. Lutz? asked Matilda. I've come to share your misery. I had some friends when I was five that I don't talk to now. That was a long time ago. Not that long ago. Maybe it will be the same for you. New friends will replace the old. Eddie moved away from the door, satisfied her sister was doing a good job of being compassionate and understanding. For once, Eddie joined Kate in the living room. I hope she can calm her down and make her see sense. Would you like some coffee, Eddie? I'd love some. Eddie and Kate sat down to their coffee, cookies, and slices from the chocolate cake the sisters had brought over a couple days earlier. The crying hadn't started up again. Eddie remembered that they'd seen Kate in town earlier that day. Did you find somewhere that would sell your quilts? I found two places, but I'm not sure which shop to leave them at. The future of the store where I saw you, Greta's quilt shop, is uncertain. Yes, I wonder what will happen to it. Have the police found the person who killed Greta yet? Not yet. Do they know why someone wanted to hurt her? Eddie shook her head and took a sip of the hot coffee. If they do know, they haven't told me. Gabriel said you know the detective quite well. A little. We've asked questions for him before when people in the community didn't want to talk to him. Are you sure you don't know Harold and Janet Palmer? They've been there for years. I don't recall them. There are two communities. They must be in the other one. Perhaps that's it. Janet and I exchange letters. We're quite close. I wouldn't bother asking her if she knows me. If I don't know them, they won't know me. Would you like cream in your coffee? 
I just remembered I have some. Nay, Dinka. It seems Else May has managed to calm Matilda down. It sounds like it. I'm very embarrassed. I've tried my best with her, but she's continually pushing the limits with me. Some children are like that. I have one who's nearly 60, and she's still the same. She left the community many years ago. Eddie was talking about one of the two daughters who had left the community. One never contacted her, and when the other one did, it was only because she was in trouble. That's what I'm afraid of. I don't want Matilda to leave. We've only got each other. You have no other family? Kate shook her head. I was a rare only child, and it's funny because now it's the same for Matilda. What about her father's kinfolk? No, they'd be around somewhere, but he grew away from them. They haven't bothered with us, so I won't bother with them. Eddie thought that sounded strange, but didn't want to ask anything further. She popped a cookie into her mouth. Yes, a new start is why we're here. Eddie swallowed her mouthful. How long ago did your husband die? A little over a year ago. It still pains me to think about it. She took up a paper napkin and dabbed at her eyes. Kate looked so sad that Eddie didn't want to ask how he died. It takes a while to get over it. I mean, you never exactly do, but the pain lessens over time. You learn to live on your own. You learn to be on your own. It must help that you live with your sister. It does, but I lived alone for many years until both Elsa May and I sold our farms and bought the house next door. Like anything, living with my sister has its good parts and bad. Good days and bad days. Days I'd give anything to live alone, and days I'm grateful to share the house and our final days with one another. How did your family feel about you selling, if you don't mind me asking? Selling? Etty stared at her. You said you both sold your farms. Ah, yes, they didn't mind. By then, they all had their own places. They both turned to see Elsa May coming out of the bedroom alone. How is Matilda? her mother asked. She's fine. She'll be out in a minute. Elsa May sat down with them. What did you say to her? Kate asked. We just had a little talk. She was upset about losing her friends, and I told her she could write letters to them, and she could make new friends here. What did she say about new friends? Elsa May smiled. I just explained that new people were friends she hadn't met yet. And that worked? It seemed to. Kate said, Would you like hot tea or coffee? I'd like a cup of hot tea, Danka. After she poured the tea and gave it to Elsa May, she sat down with them. I wonder what's going to happen with the quilt store now that the owner's not around anymore. I think the niece said she would like to keep it going. Oh, Eddie saw that Kate didn't look too happy about that. Why do you ask? I was hoping to open a store one day. I don't like to take advantage of anyone's demise, but it might have been a good start for me if I could have bought the store. If it came at the right price, that is. Elsa May slurped her tea. You could always talk to the niece and say you're interested. She said she wants to keep it but she might have been saying that because she was upset about her aunt. Kate nodded. I will say something to her after a suitable time passes. Don't leave it too long, Eddie said. People can change their minds quickly. As soon as Eddie and Elsa May left, Kate walked into Matilda's room. She hadn't come out the whole time the visitors were there. What did you tell Mrs. Lutz? Nothing, Mama. 
Matilda was sitting on her bed holding a doll, the same one she'd had since she was two. Kate sat down beside her. I won't be mad if you told her something you shouldn't. She just said I should make friends to make you happy. I said I would try. That's all. Then she told me about her dog. He's called Snowy, and he's white and fluffy and very friendly. She said I might be able to go for a walk with her and the dog one time. Could I? We'll see. Matilda slumped further into the bed. That means no. It doesn't mean no. It means we'll see. It depends. On what? Whatever happens. Now come out and eat some cookies. They brought some for you. Chapter 13 After dinner that night, Etty and Elsa May sat down to look again at the pages they'd had copied at the library. Where do we start, Etty? Elsa May asked as she flipped through the pages. We'll make a list of all our quilt ladies and cross off everybody as we go. Elsa May shook her head. It's going to be a long list. Perhaps we should prioritize. Makes sense. Either way, it's going to take us forever. I just wish there was an easier way to go about this. There is an easier way. You just let Detective Kelly figure it all out. We're not on his payroll. Eddie giggled. What are you laughing at? Elsa May scowled at her. I'm just imagining you saying that to Kelly. Elsa May's face relaxed into a smile. I wouldn't be brave enough. Not if he's going to continually be in a mood like he was in the other day. You were sent to the naughty corner. Only it wasn't the naughty corner. It was the naughty waiting room. Elsa May ignored her comment. I don't see that we're going to be able to get around to more than three people a day, and we'll need to ask somebody to drive us. Gabriel, he might do it. Why don't we start off at the bishop's house? Elsa May asked. Talk to Mary and see what she knows? Yeah, and once we talk to her, we might be having to figure out who we can put first on our list of priorities. It looks like we should both have an early night, and then we can get started in the morning. But wait, we have to see if Gabriel can drive us. Call him. His new place has a telephone shanty right outside his house. Me call him? Eddie asked. I was thinking you should do it. You do it while you're walking the dog. Ah, Eddie. I do dislike it when you call him the dog. Use his name, would you? Eddie nodded. I'm sorry. I'll try not to do it again. You do it while you're walking snowy. That's what you say each time, and yet you keep doing it. Would you like me to walk snowy? From his dog bed in the corner of the room, Snowy immediately lifted up his head and looked at the two of them. Yes, if you wouldn't mind, and I'll make a start on the dinner. Very well. Eddie pushed herself to her feet and then took the collar and leash off the hook by the door. When she turned around, Snowy was sitting in front of her, ready and waiting. She chuckled. You know what's going on, don't you, boy? I mean, Snowy. She leaned down and fastened his collar. Together, they walked out of the house. Chapter 14 Selena's out of town, or she could have driven us. Eddie grinned at Gabriel's comment as she and Elsa May climbed into his buggy. You always find a way to bring Selena into the conversation. He threw his head back and laughed. I didn't notice myself doing that. I feel protective of her. Things might be different between us right now if her mother hadn't run away with her when she was two. I mean, if we were both raised here. Who knows what might have happened? Indeed, Elsa May said. Still, she might join our community one day. 
he moved his horse forward. Selena doesn't know anyone from around here yet. I just hope she stays on. Yeah, me too. It was dreadful, that scarecrow business that happened when she was staying at your house. Gabriel laughed. You haven't had good fortune with houses. One had a murder and the other a close one. He glanced behind at Elsa May. Good fortune has no part in it. The house next door to you was a good price. It's already come in use with Kate staying there. It is very generous of you to allow her to stay there. Tell me, has Kate heard that someone was murdered there? I told her and she was fine with it. She just doesn't want her doctor to know about it. You're right about one thing, Gabriel. This whole thing would be a lot quicker and a lot easier if we had Selena here to drive us in her car. I know. What do you hope to find out today? On the drive to the bishop's house, they filled Gabriel in on what they were doing. Do you want me to stay in the buggy? asked Gabriel when they arrived at Bishop Paul and Mary's house. If you don't mind, Elsa May replied. I would prefer it, he said, smiling. We'll be as quick as we can be. Eddie patted him on his shoulder. Take all the time you need. I have no plans for the day apart from this. Eddie and Elsa May climbed out of the buggy and headed towards the front door. After they knocked, it took a while for the door to be answered. Slowly, the door opened a crack. When Mary saw who it was, she opened the door wider. Come in, please. I'm glad you've come. When Eddie stepped in through the front door, she saw Mary's eyes were red-rimmed. Whatever is the matter, Mary? asked Elsa May. Nothing. I'm just sad over Greta. I used to go into her shop every time I was in town, and that was nearly every other day. I had so many errands to run for Paul, going to the post office and this and that, and we used to have a nice chat. Now I won't be able to do that anymore. I've lost a friend. She wasn't one of us, but still, she was a friend. A bishop's wife is in a different situation. One generally doesn't have many personal friends. Why don't you sit down and talk to Eddie while I make you a nice cup of hot tea? Oh, I'd like that. Thank you, Elsa May. When Eddie was sitting down next to Mary, she took the opportunity to ask her first question. I'm pleased that you know Greta so well because I've been thinking a lot about her. Do you have any idea who might have wanted to harm her? Nay, not at all. She was such a nice woman, and she did so much for the community, for the broader community I'm talking about, and not just our Amish community. She was always helping with the fundraisers, always so good with everything. The counselor will be very upset, too. Martin Cruz? Yeah. He was there with me. He was the one who called 911. Was he a friend of hers? That's right. Eddie was confused about that. She knew that they knew one another, but he didn't seem like he'd lost a good friend. He hadn't even tried to revive her, wouldn't go near her, and it was left up to Eddie to see if she was still alive. How well did they know each other, apart from organizing the yearly fairs together? I often saw him at her quilt store. That is interesting. Someone said she mentioned having difficulties with paying the rent. Yes, she said that to me too, because the rent had risen when she signed the new lease. But she also said the general costs of doing business had risen. It must have been difficult for her, being alone with no husband and no immediate family. That's right. I heard she has two nieces, and one is keeping her shop open. We met her. She's a very nice woman called Valerie. Yeah, I know Valerie, too. 
I know her quite well. She was often at the store when I stopped by. Did you ever hear of Greta having a falling out with anybody? Maybe over the price of quilts, or because of her withholding money from someone? Ach, nay, Etty, everyone loved her. Etty pulled her mouth to one side. Well, not everybody. When Mary sniffled into her handkerchief, Etty regretted her last remark. But it was true. She moved closer and put her arm around Mary. There, there, it'll be okay. Where was Elsa May with that tea? I asked Valerie about the funeral, and she said that they haven't released the body yet. Why would that be, Eddie? They have to do the autopsy. It shouldn't be too much longer. Valerie is worried that her sister might be unable to attend the funeral because of her work on the TV show. Elsa May arrived with the tea items on a large tray and set them down on the table. A nice cup of hot tea will make you feel better. She sat down with them and passed around a plate of sugar cookies. Everyone refused them, so Elsa May set the plate down. Can't have them going to waste, Elsa May said as she reached for one. After waiting for a couple of minutes, Eddie reached for the pot and poured the tea for all of them. I'm so pleased you both stopped by today. Paul had to go out, and I didn't want to be alone. But other people need Paul, too. It's not nice to be alone when things like this happen, Elsa May said. You're always welcome to come to our place if you ever need anyone to talk with, Eddie added. Denka, how did you get here today? You don't have a buggy, do you? Nay, we had Gabriel Yoder bring us here today. He drives us to the meeting sometimes, too. Did he leave you? Nay, he's sitting in the buggy. He doesn't want to come in. He thinks it's women's talk. Eddie, would you take him out some tea and cookies? Of course I will. He probably doesn't want to be around us ladies, talking with no other men around. Eddie chuckled as she poured tea into a large mug to take out for him. She placed two cookies on a plate and walked outside to deliver them. Gabriel jumped out of the buggy when he saw her coming. Is this for me? Yeah, Mary insisted I bring something out to you. I told her not to bother, Eddie giggled. I'm pleased she did. Be sure you don't let it ruin your appetite, because we might stop somewhere nice for lunch today. Don't worry about that. Nothing ever ruins my appetite. Eddie hurried back, hoping she hadn't missed anything. When she sat down with the other two women, they were talking about Leonora and her quilts. She entered the most beautiful quilt in the fair. Eddie described it to them. It sounds like no quilt I've ever seen, Mary said before she sipped her tea. Eddie looked over at Elsa May, and they both knew what the other was thinking. They had to go to Leonora's house next. Why had she been in such a hurry to remove her quilt? Was it simply for the reasons she gave? Or was there an entirely different reason? Where to now? Gabriel asked when the sisters climbed back into his buggy. Leonora Schroeder's house. I thought you'd say that. And why is that? Elsa May asked as the horse and buggy moved forward. Because everyone says she's the best quilter in the community. So if you have any questions, she would be the right one to go to. You do know that we're asking questions about a murder, don't you? And not asking questions on quilting? Yeah. As they drove, a thought occurred to Eddie. Elsa May, surely they would have searched Greta's house for clues. What if they missed something? They couldn't have found anything because Kelly hasn't mentioned anything. You're right, Eddie, unless he didn't tell us. Gabriel held up a hand. I can tell where this is leading. I am not driving you to Greta's house for you to go snooping, absolutely not. 
For one, it could land us into a lot of trouble. For two, it's just not right. You barely knew the woman. We didn't ask you to do anything of the kind, Eddie said. You were going to, though, weren't you? Just continue on to Leonora's place, Gabriel. Think, Elsa May said. Eddie looked out the window and up at the blue sky. She had to find out what a search of Greta's house had revealed. Surely there would have been clues aplenty there. If they couldn't go to Greta's house, they had to talk with Kelly and hope he'd tell them what he'd found. Chapter 15 Tell me again why you're going to Leonora's. She took the quilt away instead of leaving it, right? Gabriel asked. Yeah, she should have left it there. The place was a crime scene. Nothing should have been touched, much less taken from the tent. Detective Kelly blames me for not stopping her, but how could I? I'd have had to attempt to physically restrain her, and it was pretty clear she'd have resisted. I don't see what you could have done, Eddie. She was more anxious than anyone to get her quilt back. I don't think she's lacking in money, so it wasn't that. It was a lovely quilt, the best I've seen. Elsa May sighed. Yeah, Eddie, we know. You've said that ten times already today. The sky, the water, the cottage. Everyone was quiet the rest of the way to Leonora's place. If Elsa May was going to complain every time Eddie opened her mouth, she wouldn't say anything. Gabriel was concentrating on driving, and after a while, Elsa May dozed off. When Gabriel stopped the buggy, Elsa May woke. Are we there yet? Yeah, Eddie said. Denka, Gabriel. Come on, Elsa May. Eddie got out of the buggy and waited for Elsa May. Together, they walked the short distance to Leonora's house. I hope she's home and this isn't a wasted trip. Do you think we'll get the truth out of her? asked Elsa May. What if we pretend that we know something? But we don't know anything, and we don't know what we don't know. It troubled Eddie that she understood what Elsa May had just said. Leave it up to me. Follow my lead. I'll do my best. They knocked on the door and then heard heavy footsteps. The door opened to reveal a grim-faced Leonora. It's you, she said, glaring at Eddie. And me, Elsa May said. Leonora looked at Elsa May. Hello. Can we come in? Of course. She stepped back and opened the door. Tea or coffee? Nay, we're fine, Dinka. Eddie said. When they sat down on the couch, Leonora started. I suppose you know they took the quilt, if that's what you're worried about. The police have already been here. Eddie looked over at Elsa May and looked back at Leonora. Wait, they have? Yeah, and thank you very much for telling them I removed my quilt. Do you know how many hours it took me to make it? How many hours, not just in the quilting process itself, but the time I spent experimenting to get that effect of the sky and the ripples in the water? I would imagine that it would have taken quite a while, Elsa May said. I heard all about it, the sky, the water, the cottage. Etty narrowed her eyes at her sister. It took me several months to finish, and I'm very disappointed. I'm very disappointed, too, said Eddie. Very disappointed that you took the quilt out of the tent in the first place without listening to me. Elsa May put a hand on Eddie's arm and then said to Leonora, What did the police say when they took it? Leonora looked directly at Eddie. They said she told them I took the quilt away. And she also told them exactly which quilt it was. Only because it was the nicest one I've ever seen. I did tell you they'd need it. 
But I guess it's not much use to them now since you took it away from the crime scene. They have it now, so what does it matter? The damage has been done. I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to ask you to leave. I can't even look at you right now, Eddie. You're throwing us out? Leonora pointed to the door as her answer. Slowly, Elsa May nodded. Hmm. It's not the first time that's happened to me this week. Eddie and Elsa May got up and walked out of the house. The door was shut very firmly and loudly behind them. Well, that was embarrassing. Elsa May hung her head as she walked to the waiting buggy. Yeah, it was. That was fast, Gabriel said when they climbed back into the buggy. We only had a question or two, Eddie replied. Gabriel smiled at them. Where to now? Elsa May, what do you think about us visiting Detective Kelly? He didn't even tell us he got the quilt from Leonora. Of course he would have got the quilt, Eddie. And he would have talked to the counselor, too. He is going to act on what you tell him. I know, but I just didn't think he'd take her quilt. Where to now? said Gabriel, stopping the buggy as he was about to turn onto the road. I need to know left or right. Go right. We'll visit Barbara before we go back to Kelly. Maybe Kelly will be more likely to tell us something if we have something to tell him. Yeah, I saw her on the list, but she's not top of the list. We should go there now, because she always knows the latest gossip. Eddie and Elsa May spent half an hour at Barbara's place, talking about nothing in particular, and by the time Eddie got back into the buggy, she knew there was something she had to do. I think I'm getting the bug, Eddie said, as Gabriel drove the horse and buggy onward. Elsa May moved her body away. Don't give it to me. Not that kind of bug. The quilting bug. What if we made a quilt together? Och, Eddie, we've talked about this before. Our small kitchen table is the only table we have in the house, and it's not large enough for cutting things out on. Not something large like a quilt. We can do anything if we try. I think it's big enough. A quilt doesn't start off as a quilt. It starts out with small pieces of fabric, and we've got enough room to cut out those. It's a lot of work. Of course, and it wouldn't be fancy like the one Leonora made. She's been at it for years. But we could do it together, you and I. And after we make it? I suppose it goes on your bed, hmm? Well, we could make two. Elsa May shook her head. I thought as much. What about it? I have enough knitting to do for my charities. And if you were a proper Christian woman, you would help me instead of staring out the window watching passerby. Eddie pinched her lips together. I am a proper Christian woman, Elsa May. It's just that you're... Am I going the right way? Gabriel asked. Eddie said, I think we should stop what we're doing and rethink everything. So, do you want to make a quilt or should we visit Detective Kelly first? Elsa May asked with sarcasm. Nay, I'm not talking about that. We should make sure we're not wasting our time and Gabriel's time. I don't mind. I don't mind at all. What are you suggesting? Elsa May stared at her sister. We should visit the detective and see if we're wasting our time. He might have caught the killer by now. Would you mind taking us to the police station, Gabriel? Sure can. First, we'll take you to lunch, Gabriel. Then you can leave us and we'll find our own way home after our police visit. I don't mind waiting. Nay, we never know how long we're going to have to wait to see Detective Kelly. He could be out somewhere doing investigations. Okay, if you're sure. We are, the two sisters chorused. Chapter 16
As soon as they arrived at the police station, Kelly came out of his office to greet them. Soon they were sitting in front of the detective, wondering why he was looking smug. I found out quite a few pieces of interesting news. From the evidence? Eddie asked him. Yes, from the coroner. I found out that not only was the victim strangled, she might also have been poisoned. Might have, Elsa May asked. Doesn't it take weeks for toxicology reports to come back? Asked Eddie. It does, but the coroner saw strong suggestions of poison. That's strange. I saw her moments before and she looked all right. How long would it take her to be poisoned? It depends. There are slow-acting poisons. She might not have had the desired reaction, so the killer finished off the job. If she did have poison in her system, she would have been easier to strangle. She showed no signs of resistance, and perhaps that's why. There were no defensive wounds, no skin under her fingernails, and so forth. She did seem a little agitated, but she certainly didn't look like she'd been poisoned. She might have had enough of the drug in her system to make her drowsy and unable to put up a fight. He looked from one sister to the other. Do you know what this means? It could have been a woman. A woman might have killed her, Eddie said. I wasn't thinking that. It points to our main suspect. He would have had access to her home to administer the poison. Perhaps she offered him a drink after he mowed her lawn, and perhaps that took place in the kitchen where he was able to slip the poison into her food or a drink. So you think it was the young man and not a woman? Elsa May asked. At first, we thought it might have been a man because of the strength it takes to choke someone enough to kill them. With the drugs in her system, though, it does open it up to being a woman who's the perpetrator. He then stared at Eddie. Is that what you wanted to hear? Eddie frowned at him. Why would that be something I'd want to hear? Does it fit with the person you have in mind? I'm thinking you suspect that a woman has done it. I don't have anyone in my mind who might have done it. Is that true? He asked. Yes, it is. Well, that's just made our job twice as hard. Eddie said, what if two people wanted her dead? If one poisoned her and the other strangled her with no idea about the poison? He stared at her. That is also possible. But before we go down that avenue, we'll wait for the toxicology report. I heard you took Leonora's quilt, Eddie said, getting to the point of why they were there. We do have her quilt, but it's useless now since it's been away from the crime scene. I did have forensics go over it anyway. Oh, I hope you didn't say that I said she took the quilt. Elsa May dug her in the ribs. He did. Leonora said that they said you told them. That's right. I guess she did. Now Eddie felt foolish. Kelly smiled. Even if I'd said nothing, she would have guessed you'd said something since you were the only one who saw her taking the quilt. Elsa May said, that's why she was upset with you, Eddie. She's the one who should feel awful for tampering with evidence. I'd be well within my rights to arrest her. And you, Mrs. Smith, if you hadn't told me. Eddie stared at Kelly, tempted to say that he wouldn't have known anything about it if she hadn't told him. Under the circumstances, she didn't want to upset him any further. He put up a finger for her to be quiet and then picked up the phone and pressed some buttons. Baldwin, bring me that quilt we picked up today, would you? Then he hung up the receiver of the phone. I did notice something funny with the quilt. Let's see if you notice the same thing. A minute later, an officer brought the plastic-wrapped quilt to them and walked out. Eddie immediately recognized it as the best quilt she'd ever seen. Now she found herself wishing she'd never laid eyes upon it. He stood and unwrapped the plastic and then spread out the quilt. Oh, Eddie, it is wunderbar. I know, it's beautiful. I have to admit it is rather stunning and very cleverly done, Detective Kelly commented as he picked up a corner. I was going to see if you noticed, but for the sake of time, I'll tell you. In this area, I noticed that the cottons are slightly different colors. 
They've done all the forensic testing on it, so you can touch it. Do you call it cotton or thread? Either one is fine, Elsa May answered. Around here, it's mostly called thread. The wife likes these quilts. She'd love one like this. But I know they're not cheap. Eddie picked it up and peered at it. What he said was right. Not only was the thread a different color, there were rough stitches in one section, and Eddie couldn't figure out why. It's different from the other stitches. I have one of the evidence technicians pay close attention to this one since the owner was so intent on taking it. Do you have scissors? Eddie asked. What are you going to do? He asked. Just snip these couple of stitches. He passed her scissors, and then she carefully slipped the blade through and cut all the stitches that looked like they'd been hastily sewn. It opened to reveal a pocket. Leonora had made a section where she could conceal something. What was Leonora up to? What do you see? he asked. It's odd that she'd sew those stitches so badly since the quilt is so beautiful. She must have been in a hurry to finish it for the fair. She must have been. And she must have run out of that color thread. Why did you cut it just now? Kelly asked her. Just to see if I could tell why they were sewn like that, almost as an afterthought. So you think she was in a hurry and had run out of the other thread? She wasn't ready to tell him what she'd found, and since he wasn't looking too closely, she wasn't going to tell him. That's a guess. You'd have to ask her, I suppose, if she'll talk. She didn't have much to tell us about anything. Didn't see anyone or hear anything, Kelly said. That's probably because she didn't know anything and didn't see anyone. An officer knocked on the door and then poked his head in. Now Mondo's under arrest, he won't talk, says he wants a lawyer. Kelly looked annoyed and waved him away. Not now. The officer apologized and closed the door. Eddie stared at Kelly. Mondo, isn't he the young man from the fair that you brought in for questioning? Who was that? Kelly asked. Eddie's talking about the young man with a criminal record that was at the fair. You call him Mondo, but that's not his real name. Eddie sat back in her chair. Elsa may have been right. Kelly was trying to keep them busy with nonsense to keep them out of his way. Kelly loosened his tie. What do you know about him? Eddie leaned forward. You wouldn't have arrested him without evidence to make a strong case. Why are we talking to quilters? Are we wasting our time? Why even bother us with quilts if you've arrested someone? Are you throwing up a snow screen to us? It's a smoke screen, Eddie, Elsa May said. He looked down and his eyebrows knitted together. No one is wasting anyone's time. In our search of Greta's house, we came across checks she'd written to Mondo. I didn't know this when I asked you to ask your quilting ladies questions. He mowed her lawns, though, didn't he? asked Elsa May. His jaw dropped open. How did you know that? When I was in the waiting room the other day, I happened to overhear a few things. Elsa May grinned, clearly pleased with herself. This wasn't money for groundskeeping. We're talking checks that amounted to a lot of money. One was for five hundred, another for two thousand dollars, another for five thousand. Elsa May gasped. No wonder she had money problems if she was paying that much to get her lawns mowed. She wouldn't have been. The detective is saying that something's not right. Very true, Mrs. Smith. Now he's not saying a thing. Sounds to me like he was bribing her or blackmailing her over something. Since she was a woman living on her own, there's also the possibility of bullying or threatening involved. Why didn't you tell us this when we first came in? Eddie knew full well he had never intended to tell them. Him throwing Elsa May out had been beneficial. Yes, we were wasting our time when Eddie could be quilting. 
Eddie ignored her sister's strange comment and waited for Kelly's reply. She knew that when Kelly had made arrests in the past, he usually had blinders on to other possible suspects. And the biggest piece of news of all, Eddie and Elsa May leaned forward, is that he's got prior convictions. He picked up a pen and tapped the end of it on his desk. We already know that, Elsa May said. Prior convictions for something similar? Eddie asked. No, but he's trouble. No one gets that kind of money from lawn mowing. So do you still want us to do what we're doing? Yes. Eddie huffed. Why? I need to rule out each of the suspects. I don't want to miss even the smallest clue. We'll look foolish if we take an innocent man to trial. He might have been blackmailing her, but did he kill her? He placed his hands on the desk and interlaced his fingers. I don't know, Elsa May said. Eddie dug her in the ribs. Is there anything else we should know? He leaned back. That's it. Eddie looked at the folders on his desk, and under one folder, she saw a green hard-covered book that looked exactly like the one from Greta's quilt store. We should go, Elsa May. Even though Leonora was upset with them, Eddie had to find out why she had sewn a secret pocket into her quilt. Chapter 17 Elsa May asked an officer at the front desk of the police station to call a taxi for them. While they were waiting for it out front, Eddie told Elsa May about the green book she'd spied on Detective Kelly's desk and about the pocket she'd seen in the quilt. What could the pocket possibly be for? Elsa May asked. I don't know, but something fairly small. She had something hidden in there, and she didn't want the police to see what it was. That's obvious. You should have seen her frantically shoving the thing in the bag. I didn't think it would fit, but she made it fit. Yeah, but let's just say she had something hidden in there and didn't want anyone to find it. It would have been perfectly safe from detection if she'd left it, wouldn't it? They wouldn't be cutting up the quilts to see what was inside them. It depends on what she had hidden, doesn't it? Hopefully we'll soon find out. That is, if she even speaks to us. Eddie's lips twitched upward. I've got a feeling she'll talk when we tell her what we know. Kelly didn't see it, or if he did, he didn't think too much about it. Or was he throwing it out there so you could take the evidence and run with it, Eddie? Eddie breathed out heavily. That's a point. With Kelly, it's hard to know. Twenty minutes later, they knocked on Leonora's door and she opened it. Her expression revealed she was more than a little annoyed. So Eddie spoke before Leonora could order them off her property. I found out something interesting about your quilt. Leonora's eyes grew wide. I've no idea what you mean, and I haven't forgiven you, Eddie. The more I think about it, the more upset I get. How could you tell the police that I took my quilt? If you hadn't opened your mouth, they would have never known it was there in the first place. They would have had a list. Greta would have had all the entries listed, Elsa May said. Leonora looked at Elsa May and made no comment. Then she said to Eddie, It was mine, and I had every right to not have it taken. Do you know how long that took me to sew? Do you know how much money that owes me? I could have sold it for a lot of money. Now I'll probably never get any money for it, and that's if they ever return it. They were still in the doorway, and she hadn't invited them in, but neither had Leonora slammed the door in their faces. Did you hear what Eddie said? She found out something about your quilt? There's nothing to find out. Yeah, there was. You were hiding something in it. Leonora fiddled with the neckline of her dress. What are you talking about? I happen to know there was a pocket cleverly sewn in the corner of the quilt. 
a pocket someone wouldn't have seen unless they knew where it was. What did you hide there? Nothing. I suppose you told the police? I don't know what it was, so I couldn't have told them anything. I was hoping you'd tell me before they figured it out and brought you in for more questioning. How do you know? Who told you? Leonora's gold-flecked, light-brown eyes flashed with anger. I can't say. No, that's not right. It concerns nobody but me. Was it drugs? Elsa May asked. Nay, it certainly was not. Stolen money? Nay, what do you both think of me? I've never been so insulted in all my born days. Leonora moved to close the door until Elsa May held up her hand, signaling her to stop. It had to be something you didn't want people to see. By the sound of it, something you shouldn't have had. Elsa May's lower jaw jutted out. Leonora's chin tilted upward just as stubbornly. I'm not saying anything. Etty took a step away and then turned back. We could help you. Help you before the police figure out what you've done. I think you should both leave. I don't think the bishop would be happy with either of you. Do you really want to bring the bishop in on this? Nay, only because it's nonsense and I wouldn't want to waste his time. Goodbye. We're sorry to bother you then. Come along, Etty. Elsa May turned, and as she did so, pulled Etty by the elbow. Eddie had no choice but to turn and follow. Eddie cringed when they were on the porch stairs and the door slammed shut behind them. Eddie and Elsa May walked back to their waiting taxi and headed home. Chapter 18 Later that night, Eddie was still quite bothered by the whole thing. What do you think, Elsa May? Elsa May looked up from her knitting and adjusted her glasses. What do I think about what in particular? What do you think about a person who would sew something in a quilt? It's very odd. I can't think of why someone would possibly do something like that. Me either. It just doesn't add up. Eddie drummed her fingertips on her chin. Unless there's another reason for the pocket in the quilt. It wasn't really a pocket if the thing was sewn up. Elsa May looked over the top of her glasses. For such a good seamstress, it would have been deliberate. No one can accidentally sew a pocket. Yeah, you're right. As always. Etty grimaced. Leonora had a section call it a pocket, in her quilt where she may or may not have hidden something. The councilman picked up something and put it in his pocket. Elsa May raised her eyebrows and slowly lowered her knitting into her lap once more. That's right, Eddie. Do you think the two incidents were related? It's possible, yeah. I don't know why I didn't see it before. Is that why she was so frantic to get her quilt out of there? She had left something there that he picked up. But wait. What, Eddie? Had she deliberately left something for him? Specifically him, I mean? Or did he simply happen to see it and put it in his pocket? Did he look guilty when you saw him do it? Eddie looked up at the ceiling and thought back to the moment when their eyes met. He looked very guilty. I wouldn't think he'd be the type to steal something, being an upstanding member of the council and all. She must have left something for him. Maybe, unless we're barking up the wrong tree. Etty rubbed her neck. For now, let's just assume that we're right. If she was involved in the murder and her quill played a part, wouldn't she have destroyed the quilt? Elsa May asked. How would she have explained its disappearance, knowing I saw the quilt and her taking it? Simple. She could have made up any number of things. She could even have said someone stole it. 
flimsy excuse, and the police wouldn't have believed it. The real question is, do the counselor and Leonora know one another? They must. She wins the quilts competition every year, and he judges them every year. I've got it. She bribes him for first prize. Eddie pressed her lips together. Do you think she'd need to? Her quilts are always the best. What if she wants to keep it that way? She could have left money, and you could have seen him putting the cash that she'd left into his pocket. Elsa May moved onto the edge of her seat. Got it. Greta wrote checks to the boy, and he gave them to the counselor. Eddie shook her head. What are you talking about? We're not talking about Greta right now. And if Greta had written checks to give to the counselor, why would have they have been made out to cash? I hadn't thought of that. What we need to do is find out how well they knew one another. The young man and the counselor? No, forget the young man for the moment and forget Greta. At the moment, I've got to figure out this thing about Martin Cruz. He's the counselor and Leonora. No need to shout, Eddie. Sorry. Her sister sometimes brought out the worst in her. Elsa May settled back in her chair and recommenced knitting. The secretive smile on her face let Eddie know she might have enjoyed annoying her. After a few moments of silence, Elsa May said, Finding out anything now might be difficult. I don't think Leonora will talk to us any time soon because she's annoyed with you for telling the police that she took the quilt out of the tent. And you've scared Martin Cruz away. I know. Let me think about it. I'll let the ideas marinate overnight. Tomorrow, we'll need to go into town. Again? Yeah. What for? I want to get some quilt-making things and some fabric. Elsa May stopped knitting and her mouth turned down at the corners. You're really serious about this? Yeah, I told you I was. It's not going to be something you do for a few days and lose interest, is it? Like the French knitting and the crochet? Eddie's mind drifted to the French knitting she'd done as a child of about eight or ten. How could Elsa May possibly recall that? And how could she possibly hold it against her that she wasn't still French knitting after all these years? I'd forgotten all about French knitting. That was the spool with the nails, and the knitting came out through the hole in the middle like a cord, wasn't it? That's correct. I'll finish the quilt. I'm excited about it. I guess it'll take me a long time to make. But if I do a little every day, I'll get there eventually. You've got your knitting, and quilting might be my thing. Okay, we'll see. Elsa May went back to her one pearl, one plane. Was I supposed to do it for the rest of my life? Elsa May stopped clicking her needles together. What's that? French knitting. Nay, it's just one example of many. You do tend to start things and not finish them. And don't ask me to name each and every one of them. I just try things, and if I don't like them, why would I keep doing them? All right, Eddie. Eddie clenched her jaw. All right, what? All right. Forget I said it. Nay, I won't. French knitting is for children. Why would I do a child's thing for the rest of my life just to keep you happy? You wouldn't do anything to keep me happy. Good. Eddie knew this conversation wasn't going anywhere. Just as long as you know I do finish what I start. I know you do, Eddie except for the French knitting. Eddie closed her eyes and put both hands over them. Sometimes her sister was impossible. Chapter 19 Eddie and Elsa May had just finished breakfast when a knock sounded on their door. 
Eddie left Elsa May in the kitchen to start the washing up while she answered the door. When she opened the door, she saw Gabriel's smiling face. Big eights, Eddie. Hello, Gabriel. I'm fine. How are you? Good. I've come to tell you something I just found out. Ach, gut. Come in. I'm always interested to hear new things. I won't stay, Denka. I just found out when the funeral is. The funeral of Greta O'Toole. Oh, when is it? The day after tomorrow. I thought you might like to know. Thank you for letting us know. Could you take us? His mouth fell open. Are you going? Yeah, that is if it's not too far. It's not far. Just in town, I believe. I can find out exactly where. Sure, I'll take you. Thank you. Are you sure you won't come in? The water's already boiled for a cup of coffee. Nay, I won't. I have a repair to tend to next door. Okay, I won't keep you. After she closed the door, she went back into the kitchen and picked up a dish towel. Who was that? Gabriel. He found out Greta's funeral is the day after tomorrow. They must have released the body already. That's right. He's going to take us there. To Greta's funeral? Are we going? Eddie nodded. We are. I'm not sure why you're so surprised. I'm not. I just asked. Eddie was excited to begin her sewing project. It brought back memories of them watching their mother cut out the fabric for quilts, and then she'd give all the children their sewing tasks. It took many months, but at the end of their many evenings of family sewing, they had a handsome quilt with many happy memories attached. They walked into Greta's quilt store, and the first person they saw was Valerie, Greta's niece. Eddie was more than a little concerned when the smile left Valerie's face when she saw them. She walked over to Elsa May. Did you take... never mind... This is not the time or the place, but I do have a friend, Carol, who was working in the library the day you came in. It's good to have friends, especially in the library, Elsa May smiled. Eddie stepped forward. It was no time for playing dumb. They had to apologize for what they'd done. You know Carol? Valerie nodded. I know her very well. It's a small world, isn't it? Elsa May asked. We know Carol, and you know Carol. When Valerie still looked upset, Eddie added, My sister hasn't been the same for quite some years. I do sincerely apologize if she did something inappropriate. She looked between both of them. I don't know what you're up to, but I don't like it. I've got a good mind to report you both to the police. But since I got the book back and nothing was stolen, I'll let it slide. I'm sorry, but I'll have to ask you both to leave. Eddie was saddened. She could understand her wanting Elsa May to leave, but why her, too? But I want to start sewing a quilt, and you have everything here that I'll need. Please purchase your goods at another store. Elsa May said, You'll be turning away a paying customer. If you don't leave, I'll... We're going, Elsa May said. Eddie and Elsa May walked out of the store as quickly as they could. Elsa May sighed once they were well away from the doorway. She was so nice when we met her the other day. I don't blame her for being like that. We did take the book out of her shop. Perhaps it would have been better to go about it another way. We can't just take things without asking. We have no right to do that. There very well could have been a better way. But we had no time to think of it, said Elsa May. I wonder if Valerie's up to something. Eddie stopped walking and looked back at the store. Elsa May stopped when she noticed Eddie had. What makes you say that? Because she's not going to report us to the police. Why? Because she might be hiding something. Elsa May drew her eyebrows together. She's taking pity on us. Nothing was stolen or harmed in any way, just like she said. The book was taken and brought back. 
and she probably wouldn't like to report a couple of old ladies to the police. As well as that, I'm sure Kelly had her book there on his desk, and she didn't mention a word about it. Eddie bit her lip. Maybe we shouldn't have come. That might have been best. Come along, Eddie. We'll buy our goods at the competitor store. We'll have to. We won't get any service from her. They made their way to the nearest quilt store, which was six blocks away. We'll need to get quite a few things, Eddie said as she stepped through the open double doors of Anne Marie's quilting store. Okay, as long as you finish what you start, Elsa May whispered into her ear. Before Eddie could remind her sister that she wasn't eight years old anymore, a sales assistant was upon them. Good morning, ladies. How can I help you on this bright and sunny day? Eddie stood there staring at the woman from the opposition quilt store, and memories from the day of Greta's murder flooded back. After Greta had told her to head to either the green or the blue tent, she had turned and seen Greta talking to this woman. Was she now face to face with Greta's killer? Chapter 20 Eddie stood staring at the blonde woman in the quilt store, a possible killer, when she got a dig in the ribs from her sister. She realized she'd been standing there gawking without saying a word. Eddie cleared her throat. I've decided to start on a quilt. I've got no idea what pattern I'm doing, but all I have is a pair of scissors and a sewing machine. The blonde clapped her hands together. Excellent. I'm Anne Marie, and I'll help you in any way I can. You'll need quite a few necessary tools. You're the owner of the store? Eddie asked. Yes, that's right. I'm Anne Marie of Anne Marie's Quilting Store. Did Anne Marie kill Greta to eliminate the opposition? pondered Eddie. Is the quilt business in town that competitive? While Eddie's thoughts raced at 100 miles per minute, Elsa May's prattles about nothing filled the silence. We don't sew much anymore. It's been a long time since we've even brought the sewing machine out from the cupboard by the kitchen door. Our daughters make our clothes for us, and nowadays our clothing hardly ever wears out. We've been wearing the same dresses for years. Do we have anything besides scissors, Elsa May? I dare say they'd be in the cupboard somewhere if we do. We probably gave them away years ago. I haven't seen them. We'll have to buy everything again. Perfect. Let's see now. Anne-Marie picked up a box and placed it on top of the counter. We have plenty of beautiful fabric for you to choose from, but what good is fabric if you don't have tools? Without waiting for a comment, she continued, The first thing you'll need is good fabric scissors. We have scissors, Eddie told her. I know you said that, but have you used them to cut anything besides fabric? Eddie looked at Elsa May. Yes, we use them for everything, Elsa May said. That's no good. You'll need these. She took a pair of orange-handled ones off the shelf. These are our best. Now don't go using them on paper or anything else, strictly for fabric only, and nothing but fabric. Eddie nodded when Anne-Marie stared at her, waiting for agreement. Now you'll also need some snips to cut those pesky tiny threads. Two different sized snips. We need snips as well as scissors? Elsa May asked. Yes, she popped them into the box. Pens? Who could do without pens? I suggest these ones. They're the finest quality. They have glass heads. Just as Etty and Elsa May were looking at them, she turned and placed them into the box. You can never have too many pens. If you have pens, what else do you need? She asked the question in a schoolteacher manner, wanting them to answer. Something to jab them into? asked Elsa May. Pin cushions. I always use two when I'm quilting, one by the ironing board and one by my sewing machine. Do you have an ironing board? she asked Eddie. Yes, and an iron, Elsa May answered. Two pin cushions, then? Anne Marie asked. 
I think I have a pincushion somewhere. Okay, just one then, and you can always come back for another later. She placed a pincushion in the box. Now you'll need to have a notebook. She picked one up. We have paper at home. And pens, Elsa May added. Sewing machine? We have one, Eddie said. And I won't get the fabric today either. I'll need to decide the pattern I'm following. You'll need needles. We have plenty of spare needles. That's good, because if you're sewing for hours, they'll go blunt. It's good to have spares. Spares of everything. I do. She picked up a hardcover book about the love of quilting and held it out to them. This one has patterns in it, and it's very good. It also shows you how to do many things that some people find tricky. We have many friends who can give us patterns. Good, good. A triangular ruler. She picked one up. That might come in handy, Eddie said, as that too went into the box. Good, because if you decide on triangles and do other things that are a little fancier, it'll help you. Soon you might start collecting rulers and snippers. Marking pencils, the ones that mark fabric, yes? I suppose so, Eddie said, giving Elsa May a sideways glance. Any minute, Elsa May was going to object to how much this was costing. Eddie didn't lack money because she'd been left an inheritance. But that didn't stop Elsa May from watching Eddie's money carefully, as well as her own. They'd both been raised not to be wasteful. A glue stick. Will I need one? Eddie asked as she watched it go into the box. Yes, you will. And this one's blue. It's kind of nice that it's blue because it doesn't show up on colored fabrics. Also, it doesn't dry out. She suggested half a dozen other things, and they all went into the box. Where do you stop? These are just a small selection of things, and soon you'll be like, I want that, and I want this. Elsa May chuckled. It's true, Amory said. There are thousands of wonderful, juicy quilting tools that'll make your mouth water. These'll get you started. Thank you, Eddie said. Would you like me to help you choose a pattern? No, that's okay. I'll think about it overnight and perhaps come back tomorrow. You're a good sales lady. I'm not trying to be. I'm just making sure you have all you need. I can see that. We didn't get a very good welcome at the other quilt store, Elsa May said in a quiet voice. Oh, poor Greta died. It was tragic. Now they can close the store down. Eddie wondered who they were. Her niece is hoping to take it over, Eddie told her. Mr. Cruz won't be happy about that. Eddie and Elsa May looked at one another. What has it got to do with him? Eddie asked. She looked around and then said, Just between you and me and the doorpost, the two of them were close. I often spotted them together. Yes, they organized the yearly fairs, Elsa May commented. No, it was more than that. He was trying to get her to move her store elsewhere. She had a lease, a long one, but there was talk that someone was wanting to knock down those shops and redevelop. Shops downstairs, apartments above. How did Greta feel about it? As far as I know, she was more than happy to take the payoff. Payoff? Listen to me gossiping. That's all this is, gossip. I know too many people who tell me things all the time. I'll add these up. Anne Marie went through all the items, ringing them up on her cash register. After Eddie handed over the money, she said, Where had Greta planned to go once she moved out? Where would she have moved her business? I don't know. As Anne Marie passed over Eddie's goods, Eddie wondered how large the payoff was. Had Greta changed her mind and caused someone to get upset with her? Was that why she was killed? Do you have anything to put your projects in, like a patchwork bag? Anne Marie held up a large rectangular fabric bag. My sister has one like that she keeps her knitting in. Don't you deserve one, too? Eddie giggled. I'll start on the quilt and then see if I need one. I'll come back when I do. It lies flat when you're not using it. Thank you. I might see you again soon. 
I hope so. You'll need to come back to get the fabric. It was a pleasure meeting you both. Hetty made her way out of the store, followed closely by Elsa May. She's the lady I saw Greta talking with just before she was killed. Elsa May gasped. You saw Greta talking with someone after she left us? Yeah. That one? Etty nodded. I don't remember telling Kelly. In fact, I'm sure I haven't told him that part. What were you thinking, Etty? Her sister asked when they were well away from the store. I don't know. I wonder if... Remember how everyone who was at the fair had to give their names and addresses and so forth to the police before they were allowed to leave the fair? Yeah, I wonder if they got her name. Should we tell Kelly now? Not just yet. We'll keep that up our sleeves. I never met anyone who talked so much. She barely drew breath. She's a better saleswoman than I remember Greta being. No wonder Greta couldn't make the rent. Eddie groaned. Anne-Marie said someone wanted Greta's store to move, and there was a payoff for her doing so. That's right. So you're thinking that had something to do with Greta's murder? It's possible. Can we believe anything Anne-Marie said just now, Elsa May? I don't know, but wouldn't there be some record at the council or something if someone wants to knock down a building? No, not if they haven't purchased the building yet. We do know that she signed the lease just a few months back. That could have been a three, five, or even a ten-year lease. Someone wanted her to break it. No one's going to buy the building and then wait for her lease to run out. How do we find out if her story's true? And find out how close she was with the counselor? Were they in it together? Elsa May grabbed Etty's arm. Perhaps the shops adjacent to Greta's shop have had similar offers. Good idea. Let's ask while we're here. Can you walk back that far, back to the store? If you can, then I can. They walked back to Greta's store and walked into the hobby shop, toy store next door to it. Etty picked up a model airplane and whispered to Elsa May. What are we going to ask? I don't know, but think of something fast. Etty turned around to see a man approaching her. Can I help you, ladies? Yes, you can. I'd like to buy this. Etty selected a model airplane and handed it to him. He took it from her. Do you realize this has to be put together? Yes, it's not for me. It's for my sister. She nodded at Elsa May. He smiled at Elsa May, who didn't look too happy. Do you have glue? He asked Elsa May. Yes, we have all the accompanying things needed, Eddie said, not wanting to buy half the store like they had at Anne Marie's store. I'll wrap it for you. Thanks. They followed him to the counter, and while he popped it into a bag, Eddie said, I suppose you won't be here much longer. He looked up surprised. Why's that? The sale of the building here. He smiled. We'll see. They're not sure if they can get all owners to agree, and then some of us are on lengthy leases. Who's doing the buying? Elsa May asked. I'm not sure. Just some company. That'll be $89.59. Eddie drew in a sharp breath. She had thought it would be less than 20. She handed him the money. We heard that the counselor, Martin Cruz, has something to do with the sale. Really? I haven't heard that. I don't think he can be involved given his position with the council. I'd be surprised if he was involved. Eddie nodded. I might have heard wrong. He smiled at them and handed them their package. Have a nice day, do come again. Once they were out on the pavement, Elsa May said, Congratulations, you're now the proud owner of sewing implements you'll never use and a toy airplane that's not even put together. I'll give the plane to someone who will enjoy it, and I will use the sewing things. I am going to make that quilt. I know you'll make a start. And I'll finish it. I just have to decide what pattern to make. 
She looked over at Elsa May to see her looking doubtful. It'll only take me a day or two to decide. Chapter 21 On the day of Greta O'Toole's funeral, Gabriel collected Etty and Elsa May as well as their neighbors who were also attending the funeral. As before, when they traveled in Gabriel's buggy, Kate was in the front and Matilda was in the back seat between Etty and Elsa May. I hear one of the nieces is a movie star from Hollywood, Kate said. Yes, I've heard that too. A TV star from a soap opera, Etty told Kate. Gabriel asked, Not the one working at the quilt store? No, the star's name is Shan Hollows. It's Greta's sister's daughter, one of her sister's daughters. The other one is Valerie, who is keeping the quilt store open until certain decisions are made, Elsa May said. I didn't want Matilda to come, but I have no one to leave her with, and I feel I should go out of respect. The first funeral I went to, I was about her age, Elsa May said. I'll be okay, Mama. There's nothing to worry about. Just behave yourself and don't talk too much. I know. Don't misbehave and don't talk about the things that we're not supposed to talk about. Eddie noticed Kate gave an embarrassed smile. That's right. Only talk about polite things that people should talk about. I'll remember, said Matilda. We're here now, so we might as well enjoy it, Eddie said. Enjoy it, Eddie. It is a funeral. Elsa May's face soured. You know what I mean. We're here now. They stopped in their tracks when a shiny black car pulled up and photographers swarmed around it. Two large men kept the photographers at bay while the rear door of the vehicle was opened and out stepped a woman dressed head to toe in pink. Even her hair was a light shade of blush pink. Her pink dress hugged her slender form as she held her long hair aside while she moved quickly toward the chapel. Don't Englishers normally wear black to funerals? Elsa May whispered to Etty. I think when you're famous, you can wear anything you like. Once the fuss had died down and the photographers were kept out by the two men standing either side of the doorway, Etty and Elsa May slipped into the chapel. After the ushers handed them leaflets, they sat down with Gabriel, Matilda, and Kate. A minute later, Detective Kelly walked in and sat halfway down toward the front. Eddie looked around the room and wondered if the killer might be amongst them. It was then that she saw Anne Marie of Anne Marie's quilting store. She was wearing large black sunglasses and sat by herself in the back row. Eddie wondered if she should have told Kelly about having seen her talking with Greta right before she was killed. She'd meant to. Even though the lawn-mowing young man they'd arrested seemed to be guilty, Eddie had a gut feeling he wasn't. But if he wasn't, why had Greta written him all those checks? She had no idea she was going to die this suddenly, Elsa May whispered. I know, Eddie whispered back. When organ music piped around the room, everyone stood. A minister said a few words, and then a hymn was started. It was a song Eddie and Elsa May weren't familiar with, but still they tried to sing along by following the words on the leaflet in front of them. When the song finished, everyone sat down and the minister gave a short talk about life, and then he talked about Greta and what a marvelous woman she was with doing her charitable works. Eddie looked down at the leaflet and read Greta's year of birth and death. After she did some sums, she whispered to Elsa May, She was only 53. I know. I can read and do math. Look, the counselor's here in the second row. That's not surprising. He'd have to be here. Greta was killed at an event. He'd have to represent the council, and don't forget he did know Greta. I know. Eddie's eyes were glued to the counselor, and she saw he couldn't keep still and kept fidgeting in his seat. Eddie was even more surprised when Anne-Marie got up from her back row seat, 
walked forward, and sat down behind him. She tapped him on his shoulder, and the two exchanged smiles. Then the counselor got up to say some words. He seemed terribly sorrowful and mentioned what a loss it was to the broader community. He detailed her charitable works, and then he said that Valerie, her niece, was going to take over some of her duties. Once he was finished, Valerie spoke on behalf of Shand and herself. She thanked everyone for coming and directed everyone to attend the burial, which was at the graveyard at the end of the road. After that, everyone was invited back to her house. We going to that? Elsa May whispered to Eddie. Of course, if she doesn't kick us out. You have to be on your best behavior. And we'll have to keep our ears open. After another hymn was sung, the coffin was carried out and placed into a hearse. When it drove away, everyone walked down to the graveyard. Everyone, that was, except Anne-Marie. Eddie saw her hurrying to get into a white car. When it drove away, Eddie wondered if she hadn't been able to hire anyone to mind her store. Are you okay, Matilda? Elsa May asked. I'm fine. Mama wouldn't let me go to Dot's funeral, and I wanted to see what one was like. But surely you've been to funerals before, yeah? asked Eddie. No, Mama wouldn't let me. I thought there was plenty of time for funerals when she's older. Life is for the living, especially at her age. I always tell her we all have to die at some time, but we are blessed to be chosen by God and to know where we're going. Very true, Elsa May said. Mama told me the lady died at the fair. It would have been all right for me to know I'm nearly a grown-up. Yeah, you are. More grown-up than some older people I know, Elsa May said. That earned her a big smile from Matilda. When they arrived at the graveyard, they followed the crowd to the dugout grave. The coffin was sitting atop the grave ready to be lowered. When everyone was gathered around, the minister opened his Bible and read a verse from Leviticus. Shand and her sister were huddled together there, looking very upset. A tall man dressed in a black suit stood very close behind them. Who's that man? whispered Etty to Elsa May. I've got no idea. We'll have to ask around to find out. Etty hadn't expected Elsa May to ask right now, but she was gone for a minute and then came back and whispered, He's Shan's lawyer. What does she need one for? I don't know. Do you want me to ask? Nay, just stay still. We'll find out later. Etty looked around for Detective Kelly but he was nowhere to be seen. What will we do, Etty? We'll have to go home. I don't think Valerie will be happy about us going to her house. If we don't go, we might miss something, some clue or other. You're right, but do we really want to risk being asked to leave? It doesn't bother me. Okay, we'll go. I guess I can handle one more humiliation. If you insist. Eddie looked around for Kate, Gabriel, and Matilda. Everyone's going back to Valerie's house after the funeral, Kate. Will you and Matilda go too? Yes, I think so. It'll be a good way for me to meet the other quilters who aren't in our community. Good idea. As they walked back to Gabriel's buggy, Kate said, The niece had her lawyer here with her. I know. That's a little strange. What's a lawyer, Mama? Matilda asked. I'll tell you later. Adults are talking now. Yes, why would she need to bring her lawyer here? Asked Elsa May. It's odd, but that might be what rich and famous people do. When they climbed up into the buggy, Gabriel took hold of the reins. Maybe she's expecting some kind of trouble. Did your detective ever talk about what was in her will, Etty? asked Gabriel. I don't believe so. She only has the two nieces, so surely things would be left between them. Although she was a big charity worker, Elsa May said. Perhaps she left some to one of the charities she supported? 
Will they have food at this next place, Mama? Are you hungry again? No, only hungry for cookies. I'm not sure what they'll have, but don't be greedy. If they have cookies, don't take more than two, and that's one at a time. Yes, Mama. Chapter 22 As soon as Etty and Elsa May arrived at Valerie's house, Etty went straight up to Valerie. If they were going to be sent home, it was better that they found out at the start. It was the right thing to do to ask Valerie if she minded if they were there. Everyone had been invited, but Etty wasn't so sure if she'd meant them. Etty found Valerie in the living room near large glass doors that opened onto a colorful cottage garden. Being spring, it was in full bloom. She waited until Valerie stopped talking to the person she was speaking with, and then she stepped forward. Valerie, I know we got off on the wrong foot the other day, but I'm hoping that you don't mind my sister and me being here. We really do want to pay our respects to your dear aunt. I appreciate that. That is fine. I don't mind you being here since you knew my aunt. As you can see, many of your Amish friends are here also. That's right. I must say I don't know what your sister was thinking, taking my book to the library like that. And you must have been involved. We just... We just... Eddie could not think of a reasonable excuse. I'm sorry. Valerie looked in Elsa May's direction to see her standing with Kate. Is Kate a friend of yours? You know her? I do. She came to the store the other day. That's right. We saw her leaving. She's new to the community. She's just moved next door to my sister and me. Yes, yeah, she said she was new. She wanted to put her quilts in the store, but I did have to explain to her that I couldn't take on any more at the moment. That's quite understandable under the circumstances. Help yourself to a drink and something to eat. I do have to get around and speak with everyone. I will. Thank you. Eddie heaved a sigh of relief when Valerie walked away. Eddie felt better for apologizing for what they'd done. Elsa May came hurrying over. Guess what I heard? What? The counselor has decided to hold an event to give out the prizes that weren't awarded from the fair. That's good. I thought they might have to have a do-over. You don't look very pleased. He said there'll be fireworks and everything. I don't like fireworks, and neither do you. I do like them. It's just that Snowy doesn't. We'll be home well before that anyway. There will be stalls and rides for the kiddies. Kate is taking Matilda. At least now the people who won the various divisions in the cookie contest will be awarded their medals. Eddie pressed her lips together. She didn't need to be reminded that she'd missed out on being a cookie judge. And we have to go there to support the fair. The money raised is for a good cause. Okay, I'll go, but I don't think it's a good idea. I'm not staying for the fireworks. You just don't want to go because you won't be presenting the cookie prize. Who will be presenting it? Elsa May wrung her hands. They asked me to do it. Eddie's mouth dropped open. It's just not right. It should have been me. I knew you'd say that. You can do it. I don't mind. I don't mind at all. It's just that. Just that what? Just that you didn't judge them, so it might be a little weird that you present the prize. If they've asked you, then you should do it. Okay, then. As long as you're sure you don't mind. I don't mind at all, Eddie repeated, trying to hide her disappointment. Next time you might remember what color tent you're supposed to go into. That was a jibe Eddie didn't need. Let's just focus on the reason we're here. I had to apologize to Valerie. She's okay with us being here for Greta's sake, but I don't think we'll ever be welcome back at Greta's quilt store. 
Elsa May took a sip of her soda. Kelly was only there for the ceremony. I did want to ask him more about Mondo. I doubt he would have told you anything. He didn't even look over at us or acknowledge us. I also don't know why Kate had to come to the funeral and drag young Matilda along with her. The girl didn't even go to her father's funeral. So why go to someone else's? I thought that too, but didn't like to say anything. The first funeral she has attended is that of an Englisher. What should we do now, Etty? We should talk to people and see if we can find out more about Mondo, or the counselor, and... Etty tapped on her chin. That'll do it for now. Okay, I'll talk to the counselor. Before Etty could stop her, she was on her way. The only thing Etty could do was follow her. She didn't mean for her to talk to Martin Cruz, just ask people about him. Martin, Elsa May called across the room. He looked up and smiled. Yes? Hello, I have heard talk that you're somehow involved in the sale of a building, a proposed sale of the building where Greta had... Etty dug her sister in the ribs. Look at the asparagus rolls. Don't they look delicious? Excuse me, Etty, I'm talking. The counselor looked bothered. This is not the time or place to discuss matters of that kind. Come along, Elsa May. Let's try some of the delicious-looking mini pastry rolls. Looks like they're filled with sausage. Elsa May frowned at her sister as she was dragged away. What did you do that for? You were supposed to ask about him behind his back, not ask him anything outright. Now he knows we're on to something, and if he is the murderer, he'll cover his tracks better. Why didn't you say so? Etty felt a headache coming on. I didn't think I'd need to. What's wrong with you? I'm only trying to help you. Try less. Follow instructions better. Elsa May nodded. That's just the problem, you see. You need to be clearer. Yeah, I will be very clear next time. I'll tell you what. You ask around discreetly, about who helped Greta out around her place, did any odd jobs, lawn mowing, and the like. Hopefully someone will mention the young man who mowed her lawn. Got it? Got it. Elsa May looked back at the table, reached over, and grabbed a pastry roll. You're right, Etty, they do look delicious. She popped the entire mini roll into her mouth, dusted off her hands, and walked into the crowd. Etty leaned against the table, feeling exhausted. Are you okay, Etty? She turned around to see Kate. I'm fine. I'm just not as young as I used to be. Can I get you something? A soda would be nice. Sure. Come along, Matilda. Kate grabbed Matilda's hand, and they walked over to the drinks table. While they were gone, Etty thought more about Kate. She didn't want her to be a murderer. But she had a motive, albeit a flimsy one. What would happen to Matilda if Kate had killed Greta? Etty pushed that crazy thought out of her mind. So what if Janet didn't know her? If Kate had lied about where she was from, that didn't make her a killer, just a fibber. Kate and Matilda came back, and Etty was handed a soda. Mrs. Smith, they're going to have the fair again, have you heard? Yes, I have. That is exciting. Are you going? I am. Etty looked around to see who she could speak with. She spotted Elsa May talking with someone she didn't recognize and hoped she was getting information, not just talking about the weather. Then there were a group of people hovering around the famous Shand Hollows. Mrs. Smith, what are you looking at? Etty smiled and looked down at her. I'm just looking at my sister and hoping she's behaving herself. Matilda giggled. She's too old to misbehave. Not always, Matilda. Etty couldn't get away because Matilda and Kate kept talking with her. Her hopes lay with Elsa May. Finally, the two of them left her to move to a table to get another juice drink for Matilda at the same time as Elsa May made her way back to Etty. 
What did you find out? Etty held her breath, hoping it was something. The two of them were left a sizable trust fund. The two nieces? Yes, not only that, Shand owns the building. It seems she's the one who would benefit from the sale, and she was the one offering her aunt a payout to break the lease and move her shop elsewhere. Ah, good work. Denka. Etty looked over at Shand, who was enjoying all the attention. Then her gaze traveled to Martin Cruz. Martin must have known that Shand owned the building. He's trying to help her get the tenants to forgo their leases so she can sell the building for a higher sum. It seems like it. And was she giving him a payout to help her? Maybe, and he also might have been taking a payout from the buyer. I wonder then, Etty, if you saw him putting money in his pocket at the fair. Money that someone might have hidden in a pocket? Oh, you don't think that our old friend Leonora is involved, do you? Elsa May adjusted her prayer cup. Probably not. I don't think she would have the money to buy a building in town and further develop it. You're right about that, so forget what I said. I do agree with you about one thing, Elsa May. I do think Martin Cruz is corrupt. We just have to prove it. He's shifty. We'll have to talk with Shand. We can't possibly do that. She's surrounded by people all the time, not to mention the two bodyguards. They can't be with her all the time. We'll wait. It might not be today, but I will talk with her. The two sisters had to stop their conversation when Kate and Matilda walked back to them. Chapter 23 when Gabriel was driving them all home, Matilda asked her mother, What does famous mean? In what way? Kate asked. I'm always hearing people say someone is famous. What does that mean exactly? Elsa May said, You must be talking about Shand. That's right. Everyone is saying she's famous. It means that many people know her from all over the world. Why make all the fuss? Well, because so many people know her, she's in high demand to go to events. That's why everybody was excited about her coming back and going to the fireworks when we're having the redo of the fair. It's a shame she wasn't at the first fair. It would have boosted the numbers, said Etty. Yeah, she was there. I saw her. Etty nearly stopped breathing. You saw her? No, Matilda, she wasn't there. You must have just seen someone who looks like her because she wasn't there. I remember her, except one thing was different. What was that? asked Elsa May. The only thing was that she was wearing clothes like us. That can't be right said Elsa May. She wouldn't be wearing clothes like us because she's not Amish. It was her. I know what I saw. Okay, it doesn't matter. Don't carry on about it, Kate said. Remember what I told you about telling stories? It wasn't a lie, Mama. Her mother put her finger up to her mouth. Not another word. Yes, Mama. When they got back to their house, Eddie was still troubled by what she'd heard. Do you believe what Matilda says she saw, Elsa May? Elsa May scoffed. No, why would Shand have been at the fair? To poison her aunt. Exactly. And why do it herself and risk being seen? For reasons we haven't figured out yet. It doesn't make sense. With all her money, she could have paid someone to kill her aunt. Maybe she tried. Maybe she tried to pay Mondo, and he didn't do it right. You know what we need to do, Elsa May? I'll do anything except visit Detective Kelly again. That's just what I was about to suggest. 
We must go and see what he's found out before we work through our list of people. There's no point wasting our time before we're updated with what Kelly has done. Okay. Elsa May's eyebrows furrowed. I'm not happy about it. I might stay in the waiting room while you see him. Now what about that quilt? Have you already given up before you've even started? I'll start as soon as I can. When I get the fabric, I'll start. You haven't started a quilt. If you don't start something, you'll never finish it. Eddie huffed in frustration. Stop harping on at me. I'll make a decision on the pattern tonight, and I'll get the fabric tomorrow. We'll go back to Anne Marie's store. Good. Let's put my quilt aside for one minute. What do we know so far about who might have killed Greta? Who are our suspects? Eddie asked. Greta was strangled. Martin Cruz put something in his pocket and Leonora took her quilt out of the way. She could have been hiding something in the quilt. Shand Hollows might have been wearing Amish clothes at the fair. If she was doing that, she was doing it for a reason, to kill her aunt with her own hands. If you can believe a ten-year-old. I do, though, Ettie. The more I think about it, I do. I also overheard where Shand is staying. You said you wanted to talk to her. How did you find that out? Elsa May tugged at her ears. I listen with these. I'll ask her if she killed her aunt. That's silly. If she did, she's not going to tell you. That's why we need to be smart about this. We need to trap her into confessing. Eddie drummed her fingertips against her chin. How? Elsa May, something clever can't be thought up that quickly. We don't have much time if she's leaving soon. You're right. We'll have to go there now. Right now? Yeah, unless... You have something better to do? My knitting. At least I won't be arrested for staying at home knitting. You do know they can arrest you for harassing people nowadays, don't you? We've got to do something. If you don't go with me, I'll go alone. Elsa May rolled her eyes and muttered, I don't know how I'll ever get my knitting finished. Chapter 24 That evening, while they were riding in the taxi, Elsa May leaned over and asked, What is her name again? It's Shand Hollows, Elsa May. That's strange, because her sister's name is Valerie George. I would say it's a stage name. All actors and actresses have stage names. Elsa May shook her head. Not all of them would. You're right, not all. But it's not uncommon. Couldn't they have thought of something better than Shand Hollows? I've never heard of a first name of Shand. I don't know. It obviously worked because she's famous. Elsa May smiled. You're right about that. It's a unique name. We've moved past talking about the name. Exactly how do you plan to go about this? Eddie bit her lip. I don't know. Please don't do anything that will get you into trouble with the police. We have no proof that she did it. Of course I won't, and that's why we are here, hoping she'll confess. I don't know how you could say anything of the kind. It wouldn't be the first time. I've never been in trouble with the police that I can think of. You've gotten into trouble with Kelly plenty of times. You've probably blocked everything out. You only see what suits you. Eddie leaned over from the back seat of the taxi. Just let us out here, please. After Eddie paid the driver, they walked a few doors up to the bed and breakfast. In the closest parking spot to the door, a man was sitting in a car reading the paper. He looks like a bodyguard, 
Elsa May whispered. Yes, she probably has a few of those. I don't think he'll be suspicious of a couple of old ladies walking in. Eddie poked her sister in the ribs. Stop looking at him. Eddie pulled on Elsa May's sleeve, and soon they were inside the B&B. While Elsa May stayed near the doorway, Eddie went forward and saw a man walking out of a room. A miss, he said, trying to gain her attention. Eddie looked up at him. Yes? Miss Shand would like some more clean towels, please. Certainly, I'll get some right away for her. Thank you. Then he walked out of the front door. Eddie couldn't see Elsa May anywhere. Typical, if I need something done, I have to do it myself. Eddie looked everywhere for towels. When she didn't see any, she walked into a guest room, saw it was empty, and took out some towels. Then she realized she didn't know what room Shand was in. When she went back to the reception area with the towels under her arm, Elsa May was sitting behind the desk. Looking up at her, Elsa May said, She's in room nine. Where are all the staff, Elsa May? And where were you just now? Just hurry. There are two bodyguards outside. Hurry before they come back. Unless she's got another guard in her room. Etty looked up the hallway. Go on. If you're going to do it, now's the time. Off you go. I'll be waiting here and I'll whistle if I see anyone coming. Do you know how to whistle? I do. Go on. Elsa May made shooing motions with her hands. Eddie took a deep breath to still her nerves and then headed slowly to room number nine. She tapped on the door. Room service. Come in, said a female voice. Eddie walked in and saw the famous movie star, Shand Hollows, sitting on the couch. Here are your towels, ma'am. She took her head out of the magazine and looked up. Oh, it's you. You were at my aunt's funeral. That's right, I was. I didn't know you worked here. I knew Greta. Eddie put the towels down on the small table and then took two steps closer to her. You were at the fair, weren't you? Which fair was that? You were at the fair your aunt organized, and you were wearing Amish clothing. Shand laughed. I wasn't there, and I would never wear Amish clothes unless I had a paying role to do so. You were wearing Amish clothes so you could kill your aunt. Shand sprang to her feet. How dare you accuse me of such a thing? I would never lay a finger on my dear old aunt. Why would you come in here and accuse me of such a thing? She looked Etty up and down. I haven't seen you here before. Shand picked up her cell phone, and Etty took a step toward the door. I'm calling the police, said the actress. If you didn't kill her, why were you wearing a disguise at the fair? Etty asked. And I know more. I know about everything you benefited from by your aunt's death. Shand pressed numbers on her phone. Milton, where are you? Get back here now. She ended her call and tossed the phone on the couch. My bodyguard's coming back. You better go if you know what's good for you. Etty raised her eyebrows. We were just talking. There was no need to call anyone. Get out. Etty turned and hurried out the door. She ran slap bang into the hard chest of a six feet four inches solidly built bodyguard. Slowly, Etty looked up into his face. I was just bringing her towels, she said in a small voice that came out as more of a squeak. Call the police, Shand ordered him from within the room. Have her arrested. Chapter 25 That's not necessary. I'm going right now. There you are. Elsa May appeared behind the bodyguard. You wandered off again, dear. Elsa May looked at the bodyguard and said, I'm sorry my sister has lost her mind and she got out of the home where we keep her. I hope she hasn't caused any trouble, has she? The bodyguard looked doubtful at Elsa May's story. 
Please allow me to take her home. She didn't mean to cause trouble, and she's due for her medication right now. The medication and the walls of her sanctuary usually keep her contained. I will keep a better eye on her. The bodyguard looked over at Shand for approval. Shall I let her go? Yes, let her go. But if she escapes again, I will not hesitate to call the police. The bodyguard looked back and said to Elsa May, You better get her out of here. Elsa May took Eddie by the arm. Most definitely. Come along, dearie. Together they hurried out of the building. As they hurried up the street, Eddie said, Did you really have to say all those things about me? Yes, you heard them. They were going to call the police. Did you really want to have to explain to Kelly what you were doing there? I was only trying to help him. He asked for our help. Yes, but he never would have allowed you to go to her room impersonating a maid. What did you say to her to make her so upset? I just asked her why she was at the fair dressed as an Amish woman. What did she say? She said she didn't kill her aunt. Oh, Eddie, you accused her, didn't you? I might have, but I had to get her to talk. Elsa May looked over her shoulder and walked faster, dragging Eddie up the street. Let's find a payphone to get a taxi. I was right. We do need to get you home where you can't cause any more trouble. Chapter 26 Eddie was the first to wake the next morning. Humming the tune of the hymn they'd sung at Greta's funeral, she scrambled eggs while toasting the bread under the gas grill. When Elsa May came out of the bedroom with her head hung, Eddie knew immediately that something was wrong. What's the matter with you? Elsa May looked up at her, blinking her eyes. It's my eye. It's very sore. I think I have something in it. Give me a look. Eddie took the eggs off the stove, turned off the grill, and walked over to Elsa May. Open wide. Elsa May did as she was told. Look up and hold your eye wide open. Now look down. No, I can't see anything there. I can't see why it's so sore. It feels scratchy. It might be dry. You could have dry eyes. I have some drops if you want to try them. It couldn't hurt, I suppose. Eddie went to the bathroom. When they'd bought the house together, one of its attractions had been the two sets of cabinets in the bathroom, so she and Elsa May each had a space for personal items. Eddie returned to the kitchen with the eye drops. I'll put them in for you. Sit down. Elsa May sat in the chair and tipped her head back. Then Eddie splashed a large drop in her eye. Elsa May blinked a few times. Is that better? Elsa May opened and closed her eyes a few times. It's hard to tell. I'll put another one in. Hold still. Eddie leaned over her sister and repeated the process. All done. Then she screwed the lid on tight, placed the bottle on the table, and went back to making the breakfast. Maybe you had your eyes half open during the night, and that's why they feel like that now. Could be. Coffee? Yes, please. After they'd had breakfast, Elsa May's eye was still the same. Before we go to see Detective Kelly, how about we stop by the pharmacy and see what they think the problem is? Kelly? Yes, we talked last night about visiting him. Okay. I don't see what the people at the pharmacy can do if your drops didn't help. I'll just grab your bottle. Maybe a different brand will work better. While Eddie straightened her dress in preparation to go, Elsa May came back out of the kitchen holding up the bottle in the air. Did you see this? What's that? The use-by date on this bottle. It says it's five years and one month out of date. Impossible. I only got it a few months ago. Look here. Elsa May thrust the bottle into Eddie's hands. Eddie held it up to the light and looked at the date. Ah, that's an eight, not a three. 
so it is out of date, but only a little more than a year. I don't see it would matter. It's not like it's milk going off or anything. Oh, Eddie, don't you know anything? Things outlive their usefulness. Don't look at me when you say that, Eddie giggled, thinking Elsa May would laugh too. But apparently she wasn't in a joking mood. I'm sorry, I didn't know, otherwise I wouldn't have given it to you. But you would have known that you haven't used those drops in the last year, wouldn't you? I didn't think of it, and it didn't seem so long ago that I got them. And I didn't know things like that had a use-by date. I'm very sorry. Elsa May clenched her jaw and then shrugged a shoulder. It doesn't matter. It was a genuine mistake, so I can't hold that against you. Did the drops help even a little? No, it just feels scratchy still. I hope there's not something seriously wrong. What if I lose my eyesight? I won't be able to knit. What would I do with my time? Nay, I'm sure there's nothing wrong. There isn't anything in it, but it does look a bit red. Perhaps you scratched it during the night. Maybe. Are you ready to go? I am. Together they walked out the door and headed to the shanty that housed the telephone so they could call for a taxi. Chapter 27 From the pharmacy they headed to the police station. The pharmacist had sold Elsa May more drops for her eye and told her to go to the doctor if it didn't improve, and right away if it got worse. She still had no answer to what was wrong with it. They had to wait a while before they got to see Detective Kelly. Eddie, are you going to tell him yet about Anne-Marie? Do you think I should? Yeah, I do, especially if he thinks someone else did it. Eddie stared at Elsa May. You think she did it? I don't know, but you should tell him all the facts, and if you saw her talking to Greta after you were speaking with Greta, that makes Anne-Marie the last person to talk with her before she died. Unless, of course, Greta talked with her killer. Eddie's tummy squirmed at the thought. Then they were called into the office. He had two sandwiches in front of him and a large takeout coffee. Excuse me, but this is the only chance I have to eat. No rest for the wicked, he chuckled. This is my breakfast. Go right ahead. Don't mind us, Eddie said as they sat down in front of him. He stared at Elsa May. Are you winking at me? She's got something wrong with her eye. She's got drops in it now. If she starts crying, it's nothing to do with you, Eddie smiled. Kelly leaned forward. It's you who might be crying, Mrs. Smith. I had a call from a certain bodyguard regarding certain events of last evening. It seems you've escaped from your facility or your home. He made curly quotation marks with his fingers in the air when he said the word home. Did you tell Shand your name, Eddie? Elsa May glared at Eddie. No. With her sister opening her big mouth, Eddie couldn't deny she had been with Shand Hollows. I got a pretty good description of the two women that were there at her room. I can explain, said Eddie. Can you? Well, this'll be good. Go ahead. And by the way, you're lucky I'm the one who took that call. I was able to calm him down and assure him I'd keep you away from Ms. Hollows. Elsa May spoke before Eddie had a chance. You see, the woman who's temporarily living next door to us has a young daughter. She insists she saw Shand at the fair. Impossible. She has an alibi. Not only at the fair, but wearing Amish clothing, Eddie added. Kelly chuckled. And how old is this storyteller? About ten, but when we saw Shand at the funeral, she was convinced she'd seen her at the fair. Kelly took a bite of sandwich and washed it down with a mouthful of coffee. Just keep away from Shand Hollows, and that goes for the both of you. 
How are you doing with questioning all of your Amish ladies who had quilts at Greta's store? Kelly took another bite of what looked like a meat and pickles sandwich. There are too many of them, Eddie said. We are working our way through them. We've talked with many of them. And did you learn anything? Yes, we told you that we learned that Shand Hollows was seen at the fair wearing Amish clothing. Etty saw Kelly was growing annoyed with her sister. Elsa May shouldn't have said that to you. Apart from getting yourselves into trouble with influential people, do you have anything for me? Etty drew her lips together. What do you know about the building where Greta's quilt store is situated being sold and someone wanting to buy it? I don't know anything about it. We have heard that someone wants to buy that single row of shops, knock it to the ground, and build new shops plus apartments over the top. It wouldn't surprise me. There's a lot of development going on in the area. I'll have someone look into it. I have been told that it's Shand Hollows who currently owns the building. Yes, Elsa May said, and we heard she has inherited a sizable amount along with her sister. I am aware of the inheritance, but are you sure she owns the building? That's what we heard. He pushed aside the remainder of his sandwich and scribbled something in his notebook. While he was doing that, Elsa May said, while you're looking into it, would you mind asking Shand Hollows if she was at the fair? I'll do no such thing. You should have come directly to me with that information. I would have been able to assure you that I have her alibi along with her sisters. In an investigation like this, we always look at those closest to the deceased first. So, she has an alibi? Elsa May asked. She was on set at the time. Matilda must have been mistaken, Etty muttered. Well, how closely have you questioned Martin Cruz? Did you find out what he put into his pocket? Elsa May asked. Martin Cruz is not on my suspect list, but I can tell you I'm running out of time and patience. The young man who took those checks from Greta is our best suspect, and he was also at the fair. He can't offer a reasonable excuse as to why Greta gave him so much money. She gave him the checks, though, Eddie said. He ignored her comment. His lawyer will say just because he was taking her money and was at the scene of the crime doesn't mean he killed her. And he's right. I don't want this to be another case thrown out of court. We need to get our evidence lined up. All we need is solid proof, he turned to Eddie. Are you sure you didn't see the young man slipping out the door of the tent? I told you I only saw a quick glimpse of a figure. All we need is for you to have seen him and we can get him off the streets and make sure he doesn't kill again. I can't say I saw what I didn't see, Eddie said. Very well, just stay away from Shand Hollows. Will you promise me that? We won't promise anything, Elsa May said. But if we say we won't, that means we won't. He frowned at them. Say you won't? We won't, Eddie told him. Fine. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have many things to do. Can I have someone drive you home? Eddie still hadn't mentioned that she'd seen Anne-Marie talking to Greta. But with the mood he was in, she was sure he'd dismiss it as nothing. No, thanks. We'll find our own way. Eddie and Elsa May walked out of the police station. He didn't listen to a thing we said, Elsa May grumbled. I know. I was right about what I said before. He's trying to find evidence that Mondo's guilty. But what if he's not? He could be. We need to find out why Greta gave him that money. Yeah, but how are we going to do that? We can't talk to Valerie again. That door is firmly closed to us. Neither can we talk with Shand again, even if she wasn't constantly surrounded by people. Let's sit down and think for a moment. Etty sat down on the bus seat not far from the station, and Elsa May sat next to her. What do we know about Mondo? 
He's been in trouble before with the police. We know he was mowing her lawns for her and taking money from her. What else? Do we know anyone else who might know him? No, Eddie, but everyone has family. Well, most do. What if he has family who'll talk to us? Eddie grabbed hold of her sister's arm. That's it. Let's go through the phone book and see if we can locate some of his relatives. Not after Kelly's recent lecture. He only asked us to talk to our ladies to see what they know about Greta. Eddie grinned. We said we wouldn't talk with Shand again. He didn't specify anyone else we shouldn't speak with. What was Mondo's real name again? Please tell me you remember it. Quail Wait, and Raymond is his first name. I wonder why his nickname isn't Ramo. Why Mondo? Let's go. There can't be too many people by the name of Quail Wait in the area. Eddie got to her feet and then pulled on her sister's arm. We can find the phone book at the library. Library? Elsa May grimaced. I just hope Carol's not working there today. Elsa May got to her feet and they walked to the library, making a stop on the way when they came across Anne Marie's quilt store. I might as well get the fabric while I'm here. It'll save us coming back again, Elsa May agreed. Hello, ladies. Anne-Marie hollered from the other side of the shop. You're back again. Yes, we are. Eddie is back to get fabric. Excellent. Anne-Marie clapped her hands together as she walked over to the wall of fabric rolls. Point out the ones you like and I'll bring them to you for a closer look. I like that one there, the pink one. Certainly. Anne-Marie reached on her tiptoes and pulled down the roll and spread it on the counter. Pink? Oh, Eddie, I don't think you should have a pink quilt at your age. Eddie stared at Elsa May, wondering what she had against pink. It won't all be pink. Anyway, who will see it? I will, and any guests we have to the house. Nay, not pink. It's my quilt, though. You can choose the color when you're making your quilt, okay? Elsa May rubbed her head. Careful of your eye, Etty told her. It's better now. Ah, good. She turned back to Anne Marie. I've decided I'm going to make a pink and blue Jacob's Ladder quilt. Slowly, Elsa May nodded. That might be all right since you have blue with it, and hopefully it'll be deep pinks rather than that lolly pink associated with younger folk. I'm pleased you approve said Etty with only a tiny trace of sarcasm in her voice. Wonderful. Are you decided on that design, or can I show you some other options? Anne-Marie asked. Yes, Jacob's Ladder. Etty gave a sharp nod. Pinks and blues. I'll give you a closer look at some fabric choices that I think will do wonderfully with your design. Anne-Marie proceeded to pull down more fabric rolls and place them on the counter. Together, they worked out which fabric was best to go where and how much of each would be needed for the size that he wanted. When they were done, Anne-Marie said, I do suggest a rotary cutter and a cutting base. You didn't get those the other day. She picked up the cutting base to show them, and Elsa May said, Looks like a mere bit of plastic. Anne-Marie wasn't concerned about Elsa May's disapproval. It'll make life so much easier. No, thank you, said Etty. I have the fabric scissors I bought from you, and I'll work directly on the kitchen table. That'll work just fine. Well, see how you do with it, and you can always come back and get them. If we come back, it won't be to get those two things. When I was young, we made quilts just fine without all of the fancy gadgets that are here today. Elsa May's face soured. That's true, you can do without, but it makes life so much easier. Etty stood there and watched Anne Marie fold the fabric and place it into a bag. This lot will be enough to get you started. Anything else? Anne Marie asked. That'll do for today, thank you. 
Once the prices were rung up, Eddie handed over the money. Elsa May folded her arms across her chest. Have you heard what's happening with Greta's quilt store? As far as I know, it's closing down. There seems to be a breakdown in communication with Greta's nieces. One wants to keep the store, and the other wants it shut down. She leaned forward. Don't say, I said. We won't say a thing. Come along, Eddie. I'm coming. Eddie smiled at Anne Marie as she collected the heavy bag. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I'll look forward to seeing you again. Together, Eddie and Elsa May walked out of the store. I didn't know it'd be so heavy. Well, you're carrying nearly half a quilt. What did you expect? I didn't think. Now we'll have to carry it to the library. We'll have to take it in turns. Elsa May looked down at the bag. You carry one handle, and I'll carry the other. Good idea. They walked like that all the way to the library. Chapter 28 When they got to the library, the first person they saw was Carol behind the counter. Too late, she's seen us, Elsa May whispered to Eddie. Eddie looked around, hoping to see a phone book somewhere so they wouldn't have to ask. Of course, there wasn't one. Where would we look to find a phone book? You'll have to ask her, they lowered the bag to the floor. Why is it always me who has to do these things? It was your idea to look for Mondo's relatives. Eddie pressed her lips together and couldn't think of a reply. Okay, but I'm not happy about it. Eddie walked forward, and Carol stared at her as she approached. What can I do for you? Carol asked when Eddie reached the counter. We're looking for a local phone book. Where might I be able to find one? Without saying a word, Carol reached under the counter and produced a phone book. With a hesitant hand, she placed it on top of the counter and pushed it toward Eddie. Ah, thank you. And can I just take it over to a table? Yes, but it must stay in the library. Of course. Eddie took hold of it and walked to the nearest spare table. Elsa May sat down with her and took the phone book from her. Then she proceeded to unfold her glasses that had been hooked over the top of her dress. When she had popped them on her nose, she flipped through the book. I hope we can find a relative of Mondo's, Eddie whispered. We shall soon see. Hmm, here we are, the same last name. Elsa May tapped on the book. Eddie stared where Elsa May placed her finger. There was only one name. Do you think that's one of Raymond's relatives? Either call him Raymond or Mondo. Eddie didn't know why Elsa May was choosing to be so precise at this time. She took the easiest course of action. I'll call him Mondo. Ask Carol for a pen and paper so we can write down the name and phone number. Ah, oh, nay, Eddie. We can't call someone about something like this. Since there's only one person in the phone book by that name, we should stop by. I've seen Edgeworth Street somewhere, and I don't think it's far from here. We'll get a taxi and have it take us there. Are you sure? Yeah. Let's go. They both stood, and Eddie closed the phone book in readiness to take it back. Elsa May stood and took hold of one corner of Eddie's shopping. Come on, I can't do this by myself. Eddie grabbed the other handle while she pushed her sister's chair back under the table with her foot. I hope we can find out about Mondo. Who? Elsa May frowned at her as they walked to the door. I said I'd call him Mondo and not his other name. Nay, Eddie, you said you'd call him Raymond. Eddie sighed. She knew precisely what she had said. Wait a moment, a lady called out. Eddie and Elsa May had just walked out the double doors of the library when they heard the voice. They turned to see Carol running after them. I'll need that phone book back. She held out her hands. 
Eddie looked down to see she still had it tucked under her arm. Oh, I didn't see it there. I'm so sorry. She placed it into Carol's outstretched hands. Carol grabbed the phone book, held it to herself, and walked back into the library. Eddie walked after her. Carol, I was bringing it back, but then I forgot. Maybe in the back of my head, I thought it was part of my quilt supplies. Carol just kept walking, ignoring her. Oh, dear, you've upset someone else, Eddie. Looks like we're taking it in turns. The sisters had a taxi drive them to the address that Elsa May had memorized. The house was a modest cottage, and the gardens were neatly kept. Don't stop directly outside, Elsa May said to the driver. Move forward a couple of houses. He slowly moved the car forward. I hope we get some answers. Can you wait for us? Elsa May asked the driver. I'll wait all day, but I'll have to keep the meter running. Of course, we realize that. Elsa May opened the door and had one leg out when Eddie spied a familiar car. She pulled her sister back inside the taxi. What are you doing, Eddie? Are you trying to break my leg? Elsa May rubbed her leg where it had banged on the door. Quick, close the door and stay low. Elsa May did as she was told. What is it? she hissed. It's Kelly. They both peeped over the top of the back seat. His car had just pulled up a few houses behind them. They watched as Kelly got out of the driver's side of the car and a plain-clothed officer got out of the passenger side. They walked toward the house. One minute quicker and we would have run into him, Elsa May said. Just as well you were lagging behind, Eddie. That's ruined our plans now. Should we wait and knock on the door when they leave? Eddie shook her head. Kelly will notice that the taxi's still here when he comes out. Let's just go. We must have been on the right track. It must be Mondo's relatives in that house, or Mondo could live there himself. Elsa May sat up straight. Drive on, please, she said to the driver. Eddie sat upright and fastened her seatbelt. Where to? asked the driver. Elsa May gave him their home address. Chapter 29 Eddie spread out her fabric on their small kitchen table, the only table in their house. Elsa May sat down in the corner watching her. Don't forget how important cutting out is. Measure twice, cut once. Maybe you should have got one of those cutting bases and a rotary cutter. Scissors will do just fine, and I don't see why I need a cutting base. The table's old. It won't matter if it gets a couple more scratches. It'll just give it more character. Cutting the shape seems like a simple thing, but it's not that easy. It is the first step in creating a good quilt, because if the shapes don't match up, you'll be in all kinds of trouble. You're not telling me anything I don't know. And I think we bought enough tools from Anne Marie. We've contributed nicely to her retirement fund. Elsa May giggled. You did want to take up quilting. I'm very nervous about cutting this, Elsa May. Careful. Stop waving the scissors about in the air. They're very sharp. One wrong cut and I'll be wasting the fabric. And it wasn't cheap. Just do it, Eddie. It'll be fine. Eddie traced the shape with her marking pen. Now all she had to do was cut straight lines. With her scissors poised to make the first cut, her fingers began to tremble. She looked across at her sister. You do it. Nay, you said you were going to do it. So you will start it and you will finish it. I thought we were doing this together. And then we'll do your quilt together. Elsa May grunted. I know why you want me to do it. Because if I make an error, you can blame me. But if you make a mistake, who can you blame? You won't like to have to blame yourself because you never admit to your mistakes. That's right, I don't. 
I'm a dreadful person like that sometimes. So could you? Elsa May rose to her feet. I suppose I could do some of the cutting out for you. Thank you, Elsa May, and I'll watch you. I thought you might. Just don't make me nervous and don't breathe on me. Sit over there so you're not breathing down my neck. I'll try not to, but I have to stand to see what you're doing. Eddie handed her the scissors. Once everything was cut out, Eddie cleared everything off the table and placed it at the side of the room. It wasn't ideal to keep the fabric near food, but in their small house there wasn't anywhere else. It's still early. How about I make you a hot cup of tea? Etty suggested to her sister. Dinka, that'd be nice. While Etty was making the tea, she thought about Leonora and the counselor. They both had something to hide. She was sure of it. She handed Elsa May her cup of tea and went back to the kitchen to get her own. Then she sat down on the couch and sipped it. We got a lot done tonight. Are you going to keep working on it tomorrow? I was thinking we should talk to Leonora again. She's not happy with us either. Maybe the people who aren't happy with us are the ones who are hiding things? Elsa May sipped her tea. What are you going to ask her? I'm simply going to tell her that I know for a fact she was hiding something in her quilt, and she should tell us before we take our information to the police. Do you still think Martin Cruz is involved? I do. He has to be because... I know, because you saw him put something in his pocket? That's right. Exactly. And he did look guilty about it. Chapter 30 When Leonora opened her door, Etty spoke fast while Elsa May stood behind her. Before you throw us out again, I need to know the truth. I've been doing something wrong, and I feel bad. What's that, Etty? I've been withholding information from the police. It's time I told them what I know about your quilt and the pocket you'd sewn into it. Leonora looked down. You're right. I did have something hidden in the quilt, but I was too embarrassed to say. Please don't tell anyone. What was it? Eddie asked. Leonora slipped her hands into her apron. You will keep this to yourself, won't you? Yes, I will. It was a note to Mr. Cruz. A note about what? asked Elsa May as she stepped out from behind Eddie. A note because we have no other way of communicating. After each note, I tell him where I'll leave the next one, and so it goes. He's been collecting my notes all over town for years. For once, Eddie was speechless. It sounded so odd that it had to be the truth. Can we sit? asked Elsa May, fanning herself with her hand. The heat's getting to me. Sure. She showed them to her living room. Leonora sat on a chair while the sisters sat in a couch opposite her. Elsa May rearranged the cushions behind her. And that's why he was near the tent, because he knew about the note? Did he? Yeah. I told him I put the note in the left corner of my quilt, knowing he'd look on the list and know which one was mine. Eddie was troubled about that. If he had a list and knew whose quilt belonged to whom, he wasn't an impartial judge. But that was the least of their problems. Now, all those are the reasons I told you for taking the quilt. They're all true. I didn't want anything to go wrong, and I needed to sell that quilt. Elsa May leaned forward. Are you having financial difficulties? The quilts are the only way that I get an income, and this one took me the same amount of time as three or four average quilts. So it would cost someone four times as much as the average quilt? I wouldn't be able to get that much for it, but I might be able to get double what I would for my normal quilts. I can see why, Elsa May said. It's a work of art. Most quilts are works of art, Elsa May. This one was outstanding. Eddie told me about it at length. It was special. 
Do you see why I was in such a hurry to take it away, Eddie? Yes, you have more than one reason. So how did the counselor get the note? Did you take it out and leave it somewhere for him? He didn't get the note. I had to take my quilt when I heard what happened to Greta. When I got home, the note was gone. It must have fallen out somewhere. I quickly stitched the opening of the pocket when I got home so no one would ever know. Eddie asked. So you didn't have the opening stitched up when it was at the fair? I had one stitch holding it together. Elsa May stared disapprovingly at Leonora. What is going on between you and the counselor? Nothing. We've passed notes back and forth for years. He leaves notes and places for me, too. He's single, and I'm single, so what's the harm? Elsa May's mouth turned down at the corners. That's not nothing. You had a romantic entanglement with him. He's not a member of our community, Eddie said. I know, and I feel ashamed. I was lonely, and God hasn't looked on me with compassion. Writing notes to Martin added a pinch of spice to my life, if you know what I mean. An apple pie is nice. But with a little pinch of cinnamon and a little nutmeg, it does add an extra zing. You wanted zing? Elsa May looked down her nose at her. Yeah, that's what I was missing. Without that, my life would have been the same every day. This has given me something else to think about. I knew nothing was ever going to come of it, but it was nice to dream about what could be, what might have been, and what could have been under different circumstances. Eddie offered a sympathetic smile, while Elsa May sat there as stiff as a post. Her silence made the biggest statement of what she thought of Leonora's words. Ugh, I've just made a big fool of myself. A giant fool of myself. Nay, you haven't, Eddie said. It explains quite a lot. It explains why you were so quick to get the quilt away and also why Martin Cruz was so close to the tent. Close enough to hear me call out. There's something I don't understand. What's that? Martin barely looked at you when the two of you were in the tent with me. He was calling 911, and you were stuffing the quilt into the bag. Oh, Eddie, I've left out one important piece of information. And what is that? You see, he never knew what I looked like, or who I was. Elsa May screwed up her face in puzzlement. What do you mean? It was all by notes and letters. I'm sure he thought I was some young, attractive woman instead of the old woman that I am. I admitted that I was Amish, but that's all he knew about me. I met him many years ago at one of these fairs, and then I wrote to him. I might have given him the impression I was a lot younger than I was. She closed her eyes tightly and pressed her lips together. So you never met? Ever? Only on the pages of our notes. The prizes for my winning quilts were always given to me by someone else. He was only the judge. So he had your address? Elsa May asked. Oh, no, it was more fun than that. I'd write a note and then tell him where to find the next note. Eddie held her head, trying to figure out how what she was saying could work. It gives me a headache to think about. Why couldn't he tell you the note was in a certain place and then hide somewhere and see who you were? Wait, he'd have to leave a note to tell you where he was leaving a note. Okay, well, I still haven't told you the whole thing. Elsa May settled back. This'll be good. We have a rock in the park where we leave our messages, and then we leave other notes about town. If we lose track of each other's notes, we always have the park. Elsa May turned to Eddie. Perhaps it's better if we don't think about it too much, Eddie. It does explain the pocket in the quilt and what Martin Cruz quickly placed into his pocket. Wait, he has my note? I don't know for certain. I saw him put something in his pocket, but I don't know what it was. Eddie wasn't entirely convinced by her story. Is everything you say true, Leonora? It is. It's all true, and I'm a silly old woman. Elsa May said, there's nothing silly in wanting happiness. It's something we all want. 
but next time go for the everlasting happiness, not the temporary happiness that this world has to offer. Leonora looked down. You're right, Elsa May. I know you're right. Eddie stood. We should go now. Denka for being so honest, Leonora. I know it wasn't easy to share all that with us just now. It does feel better to get it off my chest. Chapter 31 What are we doing today, Mama? Matilda asked. We are going back to the quilt store. What for? To see if they have an update of what's happening with it. I really need to sell some of my quilts, and it seems that's where everyone goes to buy their quilts. Is Mr. Yoder taking us there? No, we can't rely on Gabriel, I mean Mr. Yoder, to take us everywhere we want to go. We'll get a taxi into town and get one back. Will we get our own horse and buggy soon? When we get a house, we will. It won't be long. Are you sure you've got enough money for a house, Mama? Kate looked at her daughter, upset that Matilda had to worry about things like that. No child should have to worry about adult problems. Quite sure. Now finish your breakfast. She would never tell her daughter how much money she had, and everyone in the new community assumed she had next to nothing. But she'd sold a substantial farm, and her husband had been very good with saving money. She was sure they had enough for a house, one with a stable and enough pasture for a horse, and then money enough to open a little store somewhere. They didn't need much. She'd told Gabriel she had plenty enough money to pay the going amount of rent, and he had flatly refused to charge her. She sat down with her daughter and picked up a piece of toast and took a bite. Will we be able to have a pet, too? Perhaps. A cat and a dog? We'll see. You always say that, and then I get nothing. That's not so. Let's just save the idea of pets until we get a place of our own, shall we? What do we have to wait for? Can I ask Mr. Yoder if we can have one here? Certainly not. Pets are a large responsibility, and I'm not going to keep an animal in a place that's not ours. Kate had the taxi bring them right to the quilt store. As she was paying the driver, she saw the councilman, Martin Cruz, walking out looking pleased with himself. When she walked into the store with Matilda, they saw a different scene, Valerie looking close to tears. Kate couldn't ignore it. She had to ask, Valerie, what's wrong? Someone wants to buy the building and buy me out of my lease, but Aunt Greta had another four and a half years left on the lease. Greta didn't own the shop? No, she leased it. My sister bought the building a few years ago. She said she was buying it so my aunt would always have her store here. Shand always gets her own way. Your sister, the movie star? Valerie nodded, wiping a tear out of her eye. Don't you have a legal lease? My aunt did, but now she's dead and my sister's lawyer said the lease is no longer valid. She said she's selling it to a developer. I don't have a lawyer of my own to find out whether that's true or not. I can't continue on here. Who is it who wants to buy the building from your sister? I don't know. She didn't say. Pardon me for asking. Was the business left to both of you? It was, and Shand claims our aunt was going to take a large sum of money to shut the store down to allow Shand to sell. She said the buyer was only interested if the building wasn't tied up with leases. I'm hungry, Mama. Katie looked down at her daughter. Matilda, why don't you have a look at the brightly colored cartons over there? We'll figure out a snack for you as soon as I finish talking with Miss Valerie. Yes, Mama. When she was gone, Kate said, Isn't there anything you can do? Even if I had the money to buy her out of her share of the business, she wouldn't accept it, because she doesn't want it to be here. She was never close to Aunt Greta. I wanted to keep this place open because it's my aunt's legacy, and she had no children of her own to leave it to. I'm sure I would have enjoyed it. I've enjoyed each moment of these past days here. Why is she so insistent upon selling? The people are offering a lot of money. 
Sometimes it's best to just go along with things that you can't fight back about. Maybe you could move the store elsewhere. Would your sister consider paying you a fee to break the lease? Perhaps enough money for you to relocate the store elsewhere? Thank you, I know what you're saying, and if it wasn't so important, I could have that attitude. But my aunt's gone, and this is her life's work. To think of it closing or moving, it wouldn't be the same. There will be nothing left of my aunt. Surely you'll have lovely memories of her. Yes, but that's not the same. This is her business that she built from the ground up. Valerie swallowed hard. Perhaps you're right, and I could relocate, but everyone is used to coming here. Oh, dear, I'm sorry. You didn't come here to listen to my problems. What can I help you with? I had come to ask you about the quilts again. The quilts that I have to sell, but it doesn't sound like you'll be taking any more in at the moment. No, I won't. I won't until this whole thing is sorted out. Are you pleased you moved? Yes, I am. I think this place will suit us nicely. What's that you're reading, Auntie? Elsa May moved to peer over her sister's shoulder. It's a letter. I can see that, but who's it from? Janet. How is she? Elsa May moved to her chair and started knitting. Eddie couldn't believe what she was reading. When she came to the end of the letter, she looked up at Elsa May. It's from Janet. Yeah, you said. She's fine. Good, Elsa May said. What's bothering you? Eddie folded the letter in two and laid it on her lap. Janet doesn't know a Kate Roberts who has a doctor. Matilda Roberts. They must be from the other community Kate was telling you about. She said she didn't know them, so why do you look so hot and bothered? Elsa May, there is no other community in that area. I was already sure of it, but Kate's comment made me doubt myself. But now this letter confirms it. She waved the letter in the air. She doesn't know a Kate or Matilda Roberts, but she does know of a Kate Lapp and she has a daughter, Matilda Lapp. So what? After Kate's husband died, she probably went back to her maiden name. There's nothing wrong with that. Nay, there's nothing wrong with that. But it appears her husband was murdered, and there was, there is, something wrong with that. Elsa May dropped her knitting into her lap, wide-eyed with shock. Etty continued. There was... There was suspicion by some people that Kate did it. Chapter 32 Elsa May sat there with her mouth opening and closing like a fish. Finally, she said, Eddie, it's just gossip. People have too much time on their hands. Kate's not a killer. She's a murder. What else did Janet say in her letter? It seems Kate's husband was poisoned. That's what the police said. Elsa May rubbed her chin. Poisoned? That's right. What was the poison? Eddie sighed. I don't know. Janet didn't say. We should sort this out right now. Eddie started to push herself to her feet. Then she sat back down. If she's the murderer... And if she knows that we know it, she might kill us. I hardly believe she's a killer. She only just arrived in town. Yeah, but think about it. Where was she when Greta was killed? With me. Nay, she went to the bathroom. I remember it. She left Matilda with you. I thought at the time it was strange she didn't ask Matilda if she wanted to go too. Why would she want Greta dead? Eddie flung her hands into the air. Greta wouldn't let her enter a quilt. She said it was too late to put a quilt into the competition. That's hardly reason enough. Eddie shook her head. How do we know that the second kill isn't easier than the first? If she's done it once, she might not need a good reason to do it a second time. 
Elsa May placed her knitting back in the bag by her feet. There would have to be a better reason than Greta refusing to put Kate's quilt into the competition. It wasn't only that. Remember what Kate said she wants to do here? Open a quilt shop, Elsa May answered. Yeah, and how many are there in town already? Three. We saw her on the Monday just after Greta had been murdered on Saturday, and she was coming out of Greta's store. We saw her coming out as we were going in, remember? What if she was there to make Valerie an offer for the business? A very low offer. Probably thought she could snap it up for nothing. Eddie clicked her fingers in the air. Valerie didn't mention anything. We didn't ask. Or perhaps she was there to find out if they were closing down. Ah, yes, that would be ideal for her. Close the doors and then she'd reopen in the very spot of the best quilt store in town and take over all Greta's customers. They were both silent for a minute. I don't believe she could be that ruthless. Criminals don't always seem like criminals. Sometimes it's the people you'd least suspect. Elsa May clicked her tongue. We can't even ask Valerie anything because she asked us to leave. I should never have taken that book out of the store. What's done is done. No use worrying about it now. What we can do is go to someone who seems to know everything that's going on, someone who has trouble keeping her mouth closed. Who? Detective Kelly? Eddie scowled at her sister. Don't you ever listen to anything I say? I said someone who has trouble keeping her mouth shut. Detective Kelly is a man. Oh, I didn't hear that part. My idea is to visit the woman from the other quilt store, Anne Marie. Good idea, Eddie. Um, do I have to go with you? Yeah, you do. If we find out that Kate has made an offer to buy Greta's store, that could be her motive for killing Greta. And you think Anne Marie will know? I do. She seems to know everything and be happy to share it. Eddie moved to the window and looked out at the house next door. She couldn't believe her eyes. Kate and Matilda were coming through their front gate. Had they been talking too loudly? Did Kate know they suspected her of killing Greta? And possibly her own husband, too? Chapter 33 Eddie felt she had to act fast when she saw Matilda and Kate on the way to their front door. Oh, no, Elsa May, they're coming. Who's coming? Kate and Matilda. Do you think they know that we know? You're acting like Kate did something wrong. But she couldn't have heard, could she? Eddie whispered. We don't know anything. You're jumping to conclusions. Yes, you're right. She couldn't possibly know that we know anything, or rather, suspect anything. She certainly wouldn't know that I got a letter back from Janet, or even that I wrote a letter to Janet. Exactly, so open the door and act like nothing is wrong. Yeah, yeah, good idea. Eddie walked to the door and opened it. Kate and Matilda, what a nice surprise. Come in. They both walked in, and then Kate handed her a tray of cookies. Matilda and I made these for you. How lovely, Elsa May said, as she walked over to take the tray from them. How about I make us some hot tea and perhaps some hot chocolate for you, Matilda? Yes, please. I love hot chocolate. I thought you might. My great-grandchildren all love hot chocolate. Sit down with Etty while I boil the water. Etty was shocked that her sister would leave her alone with Kate. She felt very uncomfortable as she sat down with Matilda and Kate. Well, what have you both been up to? We've been baking cookies, and we went visiting today, and I met a new friend. Ah, that's wonderful. I knew it wouldn't take you long to make new friends. Matilda spotted Snowy on his dog bed and slid off the couch to play with him. 
Yes, and that's changed her mood entirely. To thank Elsa May for her little talk with her, we decided to make you the cookies, and to thank you, too, as well. Eddie gulped. What have I done? You've been supportive and a good friend. Eddie smiled, and then they both watched Matilda play with Snowy until Elsa May came out with hot chocolate and a pot of hot tea. While the tea was steeping, Eddie offered Matilda a cookie. Matilda stretched out her hand to take one, but Kate said, No, you're not allowed to have more. You've had too many at home. But, Mama, you said I could have one. And you had more than one, she said to the ladies. I don't like her having too many cookies. It will spoil her appetite for dinner. What about you? Eddie asked as she held out the plate of cookies to Kate. No, I really don't care for cookies. I enjoyed making them, but I'm not a real cookie eater. Eddie placed the cookies back on the coffee table. Now quite convinced they were poisoned, since Kate hadn't taken one and wouldn't let Matilda have one. What about me, Eddie? Elsa May stared at the cookies. Then she reached forward to take one. All of a sudden, Eddie picked up the plate and whisked it away. You remember what the doctor said about you eating cookies? The doctor didn't say anything about cookies. No, but these fall into the kind of foods he was talking about, the same group of foods that you shouldn't touch. That was a long time ago, Eddie. Still, it pays to be careful. Eddie, one cookie wouldn't hurt, surely, Kate said. Kate's comment confirmed everything to Eddie. All the same, we might enjoy these later after our dinner, if that's all right with you, Kate. Of course, they're yours to do with what you will. I'll just put them in the kitchen out of harm's way for the moment. Eddie walked them into the kitchen and then came and sat back down with the others. I have heard you saying you have a friend now, Matilda. Tell us, who might that be? Elsa May sipped on her tea. It's the bishop's granddaughter, Catherine. Kate spoke for her daughter. Ah, that's right. Catherine's about your age, Matilda. And she would have a lot of friends as well, and those friends will become your friends. Eddie smiled at Matilda, who looked pleased with what Elsa May said. But her mother didn't look pleased, probably because they hadn't eaten any of the cookies. Snowy walked up to Matilda, who was now drinking the hot chocolate. He gave her leg a licking. Matilda giggled. He licked me. It tickles. I really like your puppy. He wants you to keep playing with him, Eddie said. He's not a puppy. He's a full-grown dog, said Elsa May. Oh, he's lovely. Matilda got back down on the floor and patted Snowy. We had a few animals that we had to leave behind. That's another thing that Matilda was upset about, but I think she'll be fine now. She can see that she can make friends here and still have her old ones back home. Do you miss your old home? Eddie asked, fishing for information. I do, but I think a new start was best for us. Yeah, a new start is always a good idea, Elsa May agreed. Eddie took a sip of tea, wondering what to say to make conversation. She couldn't ask the woman about her name change or about her husband's death. How is your quilt making coming along, Kate? I sew every day, whenever I can, really. Elsa May slurped her tea. Eddie started on a quilt. Did you, Eddie? Yeah, I was inspired by seeing all the beautiful quilts at the fair and visiting Greta's shop. Yes, she has a lovely shop. And you would like to have one like that one of these days, would you, Kate? Eddie studied Kate's face. She didn't look guilty in the slightest. How many more people had to die? Greta said no to her. Perhaps her husband had also said no? Yes, I'd like nothing more than to own a little store. I always find that whatever is meant to come to me will come to me. I did go back to Greta's store today because I have some quilts I need to sell. Valerie wasn't in a good state. What do you mean? asked Elsa May. She was in tears. Her sister wants to sell. She owns the building, did you know? 
Eddie scratched her neck. The movie star sister owns the building and was leasing it to her aunt? Shand is the one who raised the rent so high? That's right. Both Valerie and her sister own the business together. Valerie doesn't want to sell, but the movie star sister just wants the store gone and the lease dissolved so she can sell the building. I dare say she'll make a bundle of money. That's what it sounds like to me. Kate took a mouthful of tea. Ah, that explains why she lingered in town for so long, Elsa May said. Valerie doesn't see that she has any other option but to do what her sister wants. I told her she could always move the store. She doesn't have to close down completely. Since you also want to open a store, wouldn't it be better for you if Greta's store closed down completely? Elsa May smiled at Kate. One less quilt store would have to be good for you. Eddie laughed loudly. Don't listen to Elsa May. I think you're right what you said before, Kate. If something's meant to come to you, it will. But... Eddie placed her teacup down on the saucer in front of her. Do you also believe that things need a helping hand sometimes? Perhaps you're right. Perhaps they sometimes do need a helping hand. Other times things just fall into place all by themselves. It's very sad what happened to Greta, but I think the detective has already got his suspicions over who killed her. Eddie nodded while staring at Kate to see if she was scared. Kate's eyebrows rose. Is that right? What did he say? Oh, he'd never tell us anything, Eddie said. Although we did overhear a few things recently when he called me in to ask me some more questions. I didn't know that, Eddie. He had more questions for you? That's right. If they never find out who killed her, or if they do, it doesn't change the fact that she's gone. It doesn't mean that whoever has done it should get away with it, though, don't you think? Don't you think the person who has killed her should be punished on this earth as well as in the life after? Eddie peered into Kate's eyes, trying to see if she was an honest kind of person or not. I suppose so. I really haven't taken the time to give it any thought. Well, this whole thing is much too much to think about, Elsa May said. Kate looked down at her daughter. You mustn't kiss the dog, Matilda. She's so pretty, and she likes to be kissed on the head. Look. He's a boy dog, Elsa May told her. Ah, he's too pretty to be a boy. Matilda planted one more kiss on the top of Snowy's head, right between his ears. Snowy put his head down and almost looked as though he was smiling. When I say to stop doing something, I need you to stop doing it, Matilda. You're going home right now and going into your room. She looked up at her mother. Do I have to? You do. Kate looked over at Eddie and then Elsa May. I'm sorry about this, but I do need to punish her when she doesn't do what she's been told. I quite understand, said Elsa May. Eddie stood as soon as Kate did. Why don't you take some of those cookies with you? No, we have plenty at home. We did bake a lot. Eddie followed them to the door. I'll give you some to take home because they won't last, and Elsa May and I won't be able to eat them all. No, really, there's no need. You could maybe freeze a few. Kate grabbed her daughter's hand and quickly walked out the front door. Thank you for the tea. And thank you for the hot chocolate, echoed Matilda. Elsa May stood next to Eddie. That's quite all right. You're welcome. The elderly sisters stood at the door and watched them walk out the gate. Kate was walking so fast that Matilda could barely keep up with her. Kate knew they were on to her. Chapter 34 What do you make of that abrupt exit, Eddie? Eddie was pleased her sister also knew something wasn't right. It's obvious. The cookies were poisoned are poisoned. Oh, Eddie, you do have such an imagination. Eddie marched into the kitchen and looked at the cookies. She brought them out and put them down on the coffee table, not brave enough to touch them. They don't look poisoned to me, 
said Elsa May as she sat down in her chair. Of course they wouldn't look poison. You would never be able to tell they contain poison just by looking at them. She knows we're on to her. She might have overheard us, Eddie whispered. Maybe she can hear what we're saying. We heard Matilda crying, so maybe they can hear us. Elsa May reached for her knitting. Don't be silly. Crying carries louder than talking. Eddie stood with her hands on her hips. We should take those cookies away to be tested. Oh, Kelly would love that if we brought him some cookies and say we thought the woman next door was trying to kill us. And then we'll get the results back, that they contain sugar, flour, eggs, buttermilk, and water. But what if I'm right? I can't see that you are. Don't you think that there would be some question raised if people started dying, just like that, as soon as Kate came to town? So it's okay if one person dies when Kate comes to town? Or perhaps one plus her neighbors? If we die, they might put it down to old age, and who would bother to do an autopsy? If we both die on the same day, I'm sure Kelly would think that's not right. Her evil plan has backfired on her. What plan? To buy the store cheaply from Greta's relatives. She didn't figure on the whole thing about the movie star niece wanting to sell the building and close the doors of the store forever. It's all very far-fetched, Eddie. She wouldn't kill a woman hoping she could take over her store. Eddie bit into her knuckles. She's keeping something from us, I can tell. Something's not right. Elsa May finished off her row and placed her knitting back in her bag. Why don't you sit down and I'll make you a fresh cup of tea. I can see you didn't drink this one. She picked up Eddie's cup of cold tea and walked it into the kitchen. Eddie got up and followed her in. Elsa May, do you know how many times I've been right in these past years? I found the killers before Detective Kelly. How many times? I don't know. Quite a few times, I suppose. There is no suppose about it. When are you going to start trusting my judgment? Elsa May placed the tea kettle back onto the stove and lit the flame. What do you want to do then, Eddie? I told you already. I want to take the cookies to Detective Kelly and ask him to have them tested. He'll want to know why. We'll tell him, but we won't say who gave them to us. Elsa May blinked rapidly. We've never done anything like this before. Only because we never had to do anything like this before. Wait, I think we have done something like this before, and it involved cake. How do you even know he'll agree to it? He won't agree to anything if we don't ask him. Elsa May threw her hands up in the air. Do whatever you want. Have it your way, you usually do. Eddie grinned. When the tea was ready, they both carried their tea back out to the living room. As Eddie set her cup down on the coffee table, she saw an empty plate where the cookies had been. Elsa May, the cookies! Elsa May looked down at the plate and her jaw dropped. They locked eyes with one another and at the same time said, They're gone! Eddie held her throat and turned around to look at the door. It was closed. Was there someone still in the house? Chapter 35 With the news that the suspected poisoned cookies had disappeared, Elsa May's eyebrows nearly reached the top of her prayer cup. I didn't hear anyone come in. Then they heard what sounded like a hiccup. They looked under the coffee table to see Snowy, licking crumbs from his lips and looking guilty. Eddie screamed. Snowy, how could you? We'll have to take him to the vet and get his stomach pumped. For cookies? Nay, Eddie. Elsa May crouched down and stared at him. He looks fine to me. I think you've been overreacting. We'll just keep an eye on him. I'm sure he'll be all right. Elsa May moved to her chair, keeping her eyes glued to Snowy. Oh, what if we lose him? We can't risk it. 
You're wrong, Etty. In my heart, I know Kate isn't a killer and she didn't poison the cookies. Etty looked at Snowy, looking up at her with his big, dark eyes. He seemed okay, even better than okay. He was more lively now after the visit from Matilda. Just to make sure he was okay, Etty brought him into her room to sleep that night so she could keep an eye on him. She slept fully clothed in case they had to rush him to the vet if he showed one sign of being ill. In the morning, Elsa May shook Etty awake. Snowy still with us. She looked up to see Elsa May smiling. Well, I'm pleased about that, but he might not have been. But he is, so that means you were wrong about Kate trying to poison us. And if you were wrong about that, all right, okay, I was wrong about that. But that doesn't mean I'm wrong about Kate being the killer. I mean, she's still on my list of possibilities, and she's still hiding something. Oh, do you really think a woman with a young child would kill someone? Remember, she is one of our ladies. Etty pushed herself up on her elbows. She liked to wake up slowly, not like this with her sister hovering over her. But how do you know that for certain? We know nothing about her. What if she's not Amish at all? Elsa May fixed her hands onto her hips. You said yourself that your friends know her under a different name, so she is Amish. Yeah, but what if she's not the real Kate Lapp? I think you've got everything wrong. You really have no idea who killed Greta, do you, Etty? Nay, I don't. I never really said I did. We have to eliminate everybody one by one. If only we had gotten to talk to the person, that name we got out of the phone book. Etty sat up and stretched her hands over her head and yawned. We can go back there. Do you think we should? Nay, but that doesn't ever stop you from doing anything. You never listen to me. Are we going to visit Anne Marie today? Yeah, I've bought everything for my quilt, so now I'll buy everything for yours. Soon as I finish mine, I'll start on yours. And it would be good to see what she knows. As soon as she finished her quilt, as he thought, Elsa May would see that she had finished what she started and she'd have to apologize. All right, I'm not going to argue with you. Etty got out of bed, leaned down, and patted Snowy, who was still lying in his dog bed. I'm just glad that Snowy's still with us and Kate didn't try to poison us. Me too. Elsa May walked out of the room, and Snowy got up and followed her. Etty lay back down and pulled the covers over her head hoping to get a few minutes more sleep to make up for what she didn't get during the night. It didn't work. Elsa May making noises in the kitchen made sleeping in impossible. It didn't help that her bedroom and the kitchen shared a common wall. Chapter 36 Etty and Elsa May arrived at Anne-Marie's quilt store, and she was pleased to see them. Hello, ladies, you're back already. Yes, we are, Eddie said. Now Elsa May is excited to get started on her quilt. Well, I'll certainly be able to help you with that. Have you got your design worked out, Elsa May? Yes, I have. I'm going to do the Jacob's Ladder design quilt, too, same as my sister. Oh, I'm impressed. That's a lovely quilt and quite a challenging starter. Elsa May's eyebrows knit together. I have quilted before. I'm not a total beginner. And I'm going to have it mostly greens and blues, not pink. In fact, no pink anywhere at all. Certainly. I think we can achieve that. Let's see now. I'll print off a few finished designs from my computer, shall I? And then you can get some ideas of different colors and how they intermix. You can do that? Elsa May asked. Of course, with the computer I can do anything, except sew a quilt, of course, she laughed. Eddie stood next to Elsa May as she looked through fabric rolls for her quilt, after they'd seen some options on the computer. 
Anne-Marie, would you happen to know if anyone's made an offer on Greta's quilt shop yet? Anne-Marie stared at her and pushed her hair behind her ear. What have you heard? We've heard a whisper, Elsa May said. We heard that someone is fairly interested in buying it, and they made their intentions known quite early on. I haven't heard anything. I mean, why would I? We just thought that you seemed to know a lot about what happens around the town. Yes, in particular when it's in regard to quilts, Elsa May added. Anne-Marie said, I know nothing about this. I think everyone is still reeling about how awful the whole thing is. With Greta being murdered and all, I mean, any of us could be next now that they've let that man out of jail. He got bail, you know. Yes, you're right. Everyone's reeling from what happened, Elsa May said. We hadn't heard about that man getting out of jail. After they discussed patterns, Elsa May made her final choices of fabric for the front of the quilt. Eddie handed over the money once it was all tallied. Anne-Marie gave her the change as Elsa May lifted the heavy bag off the counter. Now you have your fabric, will you borrow all your sister's implements? Anne-Marie asked. I will. Anne-Marie turned to Eddie. Did you find you need a cutting board? No, we are fine with the scissors, just the fabric. I saw you, Anne-Marie. Elsa May rested the bag on the floor. Anne-Marie smiled. Saw me where? At the fair, right before Greta was killed. You must be mistaken, I wasn't there. I didn't go to the fair. I was here getting ready for the store to open. I'd come in here early, you see. It can't have been me. Eddie nodded. I must have been mistaken. Oh, I've forgotten to add these up. I'll have to start again. Eddie guessed Anne Marie was flustered because she'd been seen at the fair. Why was she lying about being there? wondered Eddie, as she showed her the receipt with everything already totaled up and paid for. When more customers walked in, the sisters left. When they were outside, Elsa May said, Well, you were mistaken, Eddie. I wasn't. I let her think that just to avoid a confrontation. I know it was her, and she knows I know it was her. The thing is, why is she lying about it? Okay, let me get this straight. The woman next door was trying to poison us, and now you're insisting Anne Marie was at the fair when she wasn't. From a distance, Eddie, all Englishers look the same. That's not so. Elsa May stopped walking. Who do you think killed her then? Anne Marie, Martin Cruz, Mondo, or poor young Kate from next door. It's even possible that it's someone else entirely. You left out Leonora. She could have hidden poison in that quilt. Maybe she was in on it with Martin Cruz. You're impossible, Eddie. Now help me with this bag. Eddie took hold of one of the handles. You were right what you said this morning that you should forget this nonsense of helping Kelly? Nay, that we should go back to that house where one of Mondo's relatives lives. Well, we don't know that for certain. Wait a minute. I don't recall saying that at all. Oh, are you sure? Quite sure. That's still where we should go next. Eddie dropped the handle of the bag and rushed out to the side of the road to wave to a passing taxi. When Eddie and Elsa May got into the back seat, they were surprised that they had gotten the same driver who'd taken them to that house the other day. I hope you still remember that address, Elsa May. I do. Elsa May rattled the address off for the driver. He didn't say anything about driving them there again. Perhaps he didn't remember them. When the taxi driver got to the address, he said, Two houses up, right? and then Eddie knew he remembered them. Thank you. That's right. And you'll wait for us? Sure. They both got out of the car, and Elsa May tugged on Eddie's sleeve. What will we say? We'll just ask them questions. Just as they were on the footpath outside the property, a young man walked out the door with a basketball in hand and a bag over his back. He began bouncing the basketball as soon as he reached the sidewalk between the house and the driveway. 
he suddenly looked up at them and took hold of his ball. Hello, Eddie said. Are you Raymond? Who's asking? We're friends of Greta. Did you used to mow her lawns? Do you have a lawn that needs mowing? Eddie pushed in front of Elsa May, in case she said that they did. The last thing they needed was more complications caused by half-truths. What we would like is to know some information. About what? We're just wondering what you were doing at the fair the other day. He scrunched up his face. What do you want to know that for? Because we know the police brought you in for questioning, but we don't think you did it. You're right about that, I didn't. How do you know that's what the police think? We've heard talk, that's all. We're trying to find out who did kill her. Would you know anything about that? He shook his head. Nah, I can't help you. You might be able to help us out. How? I told the police I was on the other side of the fairground when she was killed. I was getting a bagel. Yes, those bagels are delicious, Elsa May said. I should have got one while I was there. Now I'll have to wait until next year. Eddie glared at Elsa May. They were there to ask questions, not to talk about bagels. She was wasting time, and it looked like he was heading to a basketball game. I got arrested once, so now the cops never let me alone. I didn't even do it back then. Now they think I'm a criminal and keep taking me in for questioning all the time whenever anything happens. They won't let me forget it. I'm sorry to hear that, Eddie said. Do you know anyone who was upset with Greta or wanted her out of the way? She was worried one time when she had a visitor come to her house. It was that dude who's on the council. Councilor Martin Cruz? Yeah, that's the one. He visited her at her home? Elsa May asked. Yeah, that's right. Do you happen to know why? Nah, can I tell you anything about that? Sorry. But she didn't like him being there, I know that much. Interesting. Is that all? I've got people waiting for me. Yes, thank you, Eddie told him. I sure hope you can find the killer, because it ain't me. He got into the beat-up purple car in the driveway, and Eddie and Elsa May walked back to the taxi. Eddie said to Elsa May, I wonder if we should talk with Martin Cruz. Yeah, Eddie, good idea. Talk with him. What would you say? I'd ask him what he knows about the buyer for the building where Greta's store was. Maybe his visit was nothing about the store. Eddie bit her lip. You could be right about that. What's the time? Elsa May scrunched her shoulders. I'm not sure. Is it about the same time of day when we saw Martin Cruz at the coffee shop the other day? Possibly. Let's go. Where? Elsa May put her hand on the handle of the taxi's door. Most people, I've noticed, are creatures of habit. They like to stay in a fixed routine and do the same things at the same time. Perhaps Martin likes to go to the coffee shop every day at the same time. Yeah, you might be right. Or he could have only gone there the once. It's not far from the town hall where his office is. I think I have a better chance of being right than I have being wrong. Have a little faith. Elsa May opened the door and motioned for Eddie to get in first. I'll try. They arrived at the coffee shop to see Martin Cruz walking out. He looked up and spotted them and started walking quickly in the other direction. Mr. Cruz! Eddie hollered so loud that the counselor had no choice but to stop. Hello? Hello, remember me? Yes, I do. What do you know about someone wanting to buy the building where Greta's shop is located? Why are you asking? Do you know who wants to buy it? Elsa May asked. He carefully studied each of their faces. What's this about? We know about the notes, Eddie told him. She watched him closely. He'd swallowed hard his Adam's apple rising and falling, and then he nervously adjusted his tie. What notes? The secret love notes, Elsa May shot back. His cheeks turned bright red. That woman tricked me, and that's no business of yours. 
And it's certainly got nothing to do with the sale of a building. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm running late for an appointment. He'd taken two strides away from them when Elsa May asked, A meeting with the police? He spun around and closed the distance between them. No. Oh, they must be waiting at your office then, because we happen to know they have questions for you. Eddie stood in silence, listening to her sister's tall tales. If Kelly found out, he'd be furious. Question me about what exactly? Greta's murder. He glared at her and then frowned at Eddie. You were there. You know I didn't do it. The police have already asked me enough questions. That was before the new evidence, Elsa May shot back. Eddie gave a slight tug on Elsa May's sleeve, fearing she'd gone too far. I have nothing to hide. He turned and walked away. Elsa May faced Eddie. Why did you pull on me like that? We needed to maintain a united front. Kelly would be furious if he found out you said there was new evidence. There's always new evidence. If we go there now, he'd tell us he had news of something else. It wasn't a lie. As they walked away, Eddie said, What did he mean by Leonora tricking him? He said that? Yeah, when you were talking about the notes, he said, That woman tricked me. I should have asked. I was too busy trying to find out who wanted to buy the building. Sorry, Eddie. I should have let you speak. It's not too late. Come on. Eddie hurried up the street after the counselor. Yoo-hoo, Martin, it's Eddie. He walked faster, but he couldn't outwalk them. Finally, when he was just outside the town hall, he turned around to face them. What in tarnation do you two want from me? Eddie did her best to catch her breath. You said something. The woman tricked you. The woman with the notes. He scoffed. I thought she was a young and attractive woman. Then I find out she was an old lady. I think she's about the same age as you, wouldn't she be? Eddie asked. He put his hand over his tweed sports coat and gave a sly grin. Not meaning to be ageist, but she's not my personal taste. What made you think she was younger? Elsa May asked. Nothing really. I just had it in my mind. She must have said something to make me think that. Exactly what she said in those first few messages escapes me now. She said you were planning a life together. It was all just a game. It wasn't real. She knew, and I knew. You led her on. You even said you'd buy her a cottage by the river. To her, it was very real. Well, I can't help that, can I? Yes, you can. You gave her hope, sold her a dream, and now you've crushed her. There's no law against it. That's my personal life. I don't know why we're even talking about it. It's no one's business but my own. When you take on a position like being a counselor, people expect a certain level of decency from you. I am decent. Decent enough not to be tricked. I begged her to meet me, and she refused. Now I know why. The whole thing is preposterous. How could we have a life together when we've never met? Eddie wanted him to feel bad for leading the woman on when he had no intentions if she was past a certain age. She hoped you would meet. What's this all about, anyway? You had every opportunity to kill Greta. With Greta out of the way, it was easier for the person you were working with to get the quilt store. I wasn't with anyone, and I'd never kill anyone for anything. I happened to know that you were in cahoots with the people buying the building where she had her store. Counselors have been known to take bribes. Not me. Never. He pointed to the town hall. I'm about to go inside, and you better not follow me, or I'll have security throw you out on your ear. He turned and left. Oh, Eddie, the fabric. Eddie realized they no longer had the bag with their quilt fabric in it. We must have left it in the taxi. Don't worry, we'll call the taxi company. 
Please tell me the nearest phone's not at the library. I'm afraid so. They had only taken two steps when a car pulled up beside them. It was a taxi. Eddie lowered herself to see that it was their driver and he was lowering the window. You ladies missing something? Yes. Elsa May opened the door and grabbed hold of the bag. Thank you, Eddie said to the driver. Are you still on duty? Sure am. Good. Get in, Elsa May. We're going home. Once they were sitting at home, Elsa May was enjoying the breezy spring evening. Eddie abruptly got up off the couch and looked out the window. Elsa May, I can't go on like this. Oh, Eddie, you're not even that old. You've got plenty to live for. Eddie glared at her sister. I didn't mean I wanted to die. Oh, Elsa May looked over the top of her glasses. Can't go on. Can't move forward with who killed Greta until I know more about Greta. Elsa May went back to clicking her knitting needles together. We haven't even gone through all our ladies on the list. We need to talk with them all before you give up. After a loud sigh, she said, Just another example of you not finishing what you started. Eddie narrowed her eyes at her sister when she heard her mumble something about French knitting. I'm not giving up. We just need to do something else. We need to have a look in Greta's house. What? Yeah, what better way to learn about someone? Her death wasn't an accident. There might have even been two potential killers if they're right about poison in her system. How do you suppose we do that? Kelly's not going to allow us into her house. There might be someone else living there by now. Eddie walked to the door and opened it. Are you coming or not? What are you proposing? That we look around her house? The outside of it? Yeah, that too. Elsa May shook her head. I'll have to come along to keep you out of trouble. Just let me finish this row. It was getting dark when the taxi pulled up at Greta's house. Eddie was pleased that there were no lights on inside. Can you come back and collect us in half an hour or thereabouts? Should be able to. Eddie hoped that meant yes. There'll be a little something extra for you if you come back. He grinned. I'll be here. When the taxi drove off, Eddie and Elsa May wasted no time walking to the back of the house, so they had less chance of being seen by the neighbors. Are you sure this is the right place? Eddie whispered. Yeah, I saw the address on one of Kelly's reports when we were in his office. I hope you're right. Well, what do we do? All the windows and doors will be locked. Are we going to break a window? Nay, that's vandalism. Ah, and what we're doing is just trespassing, so that's okay. Be quiet now while I think. Eddie started picking rocks up in the garden by the back door. What are you doing? Looking for a hidden key. Most people have one outside somewhere just in case they lock themselves out. I figure she only had her niece here and wouldn't want to bother Valerie if she accidentally locked her key inside. We could be here all night looking for something that doesn't even exist. Just as Elsa May lowered herself onto the back doorstep, Eddie held up a key. Got it. Very clever. Now we've just got to hope it fits. Eddie walked past her sister and placed the key into the back door's lock. When she slowly turned it, they both heard a loud click. Eddie pushed the door open and they walked into the house. There was just enough daylight left to allow them to see. Let's spread out and see what we can find. What are we looking for? Anything that might tell us who killed her. Elsa May walked down the hallway. I feel bad about this, she said over her shoulder. We're doing it for a good reason. Less talking, more looking. Eddie came across some letters on the side table by the couch. She sat down to read them before they lost any more daylight. 
Ten minutes later, Elsa May walked out of the bedroom. Eddie, look what I've found. Eddie looked up to see Elsa May holding up a long, stick-like object. It's a back scratcher. She then proceeded to scratch her back. I've always wanted one of these. Ack, put it back. I think I know who killed Greta. Chapter 37 When the day of the makeup fair rolled around, Eddie had reserved a tent the same size as the quilt tent, and she'd set up the tables in exactly the same pattern as Greta had placed them. The only difference was that this tent had no quilts. Eddie had invited certain people to an exclusive event entitled The Reveal of Greta's Killer. What better place to hold it than in a tent at the same fairground? It was eight in the morning, and Eddie was surprised that everyone she'd invited was there, plus one extra. That was Shand Hollow's bodyguard. He was never far from her. Eddie had enough chairs for everyone to sit, and the bodyguard moved to stand by the doorway. Even Kate from next door was there, while the bishop's wife minded Matilda. Thank you all for coming. I suppose you're wondering why you're all here. Well, the invitation did tell us why we're here, said Anne-Marie from Anne-Marie's quilt store. Ah, yes, it did. Today, Greta's killer, or killers, will be revealed. Leonora, your quilts are so lovely and always win first prize. Thank you. But we know about your pockets sewn into the quilt. There was poison hidden inside, and then you had your friend finish off the job by strangling Greta, and that's why I saw him put something into his pocket. Perhaps the vial of poison that you'd forgotten to take with you? It's not so, Eddie. I would never do that. I hope you're not talking about me being the friend, Martin Cruz called out. Martin, you could have easily killed her. You had the opportunity, the access. But what about the motive? I had no reason to kill her. Ah, but you did want her gone. Someone you know wanted her gone, didn't they? Eddie paused and then stared at Mondo. Mondo, the police arrested you for Greta's murder. I told you I didn't do it. Greta wrote you out large checks. That was for my education. I was doing a course. I found out that was true. Greta was always willing to help people, and she thought she was giving you a helping hand. But you never used the money for the course that you claimed to be doing, did you? He looked down. No. Mrs. Smith, that makes perfect sense, Valerie said. Aunt Greta was always working for charities. We should have realized the money was for helping the young man make a better life for himself and break free from the chains that kept him in a life of crime. True, but why wouldn't he have told the police that? Perhaps there's more to Mondo's story of why he wanted Greta dead. Do you think everyone tells the truth all the time? Nay, I don't. But surely he must have told Kelly that story and the detective had it looked into and it can't have checked out. That's why this man is still under suspicion. Valerie pointed to the young man. Eddie ignored her comment and looked at her new neighbor. Kate, you've come to the community here under a veil of secrecy. I'm not even sure we know your real name. Are you even Amish? I am, born and raised. I reverted to my maiden name for myself and my daughter after my husband died. Kate, I'm only saying this because I'm sure you're the kind of woman who values honesty above all else. That's true, I do. Eddie took a step forward. But you haven't been honest, have you? Kate breathed out heavily. I haven't. Shall we be honest now? Eddie asked. Kate took a deep breath and put her hand over her chest. Okay, but I didn't kill anyone, if that's what you think, and if that's why I'm here. Your husband died from poisoning, and now you arrive here wanting to open a quilt store, and the owner of the best quilting store in town gets poisoned. Is that a coincidence? 
When Kate didn't say anything, Eddie stared at the person sitting next to her. Anne Marie. That's my name, she said brightly, sitting up straight. You're known for having a store, but you've never been able to attract the best sellers of Amish quilts, or the customers that Greta had. That's because of the location. Greta's was better for that kind of thing, because she was closer to the farmer's markets. Exactly. I'm glad you made that point. Shand, it's no secret you wanted your aunt out of your building and even offered her a large sum of money to relocate and break the lease. Maybe she said no and insisted on staying. She said she was happy to go as soon as she found a new shop. Well, maybe she was taking her time about it. I'm sure the buyer didn't want to wait. Either way, you benefited financially from your aunt's death with the trust fund she left you and your sister. Valerie turned around and stared at her sister. Valerie, as I just mentioned, you also gained from your aunt's death. It's true, but I didn't kill her. You had to get your aunt out of the way before your sister found out that you had bled your aunt dry. There's no money left, is there? What? Shand jumped to her feet. There is money in the trust fund. The trust wasn't a straightforward one, and besides that, Valerie was the trustee. I don't understand all these legal things, but what I said is true. Apparently, it was how the fund was set up in the first place. I needed the money, Shand. Aunt Greta gave the okay. You've got plenty. I invested in bad shares and they were going to take my house. But I didn't kill her. There's no money? Shand sat down. I'll get my lawyer. I was just doing a favor for everyone in town anyway by trying to sell those old shops. They needed upgrading. It's not worth killing someone for, if that's what you think. Well, who killed Greta? Elsa May asked, looking around, and then fixing her gaze on Eddie. So far, we've got Kate, who might have wanted her dead because she wanted her store. The TV star wanted her dead, the motive being money. The counselor was passing secret love notes, and Leonora was also passing love notes. Or was it poison? The young man here was taking Greta's money under false pretenses but he was also at the fair early in the morning. Leonora spoke before Eddie had a chance. I'd made a quilt. It was the house we talked about building. We wanted a pink cottage by the river. I had the spot selected to buy. I had the note in the quilt, and he would have known to whom the quilt belonged. I wanted him to come to me, accept me, and then we could have the life we talked about the pink cottage in my quilt, Eddie. We talked about such a house. I didn't know things had gone that far. I was too embarrassed to tell you before, but now I don't care. I know he's not the man I hoped he'd be. In our notes, we had planned a life together. I told him I'd leave the community for him, and he was buying us a house. That's what he wrote. The counselor flew to his feet. It was I who was deceived. He made to run out of the tent. Stop him, Eddie called out. Chapter 38 Shand Hollow's bodyguard stood in Martin Cruz's way so he couldn't leave the tent. You can't keep me here, Martin said to Eddie. You poisoned her. I did not. You poisoned her, but you didn't kill her. Sit down, or I'll tell the police everything I know. The counselor did as he was told. You had papers for her to sign, didn't you? You drugged her just enough so she'd do what you'd say. When I saw you put something into your pocket, you'd already put paperwork under your sports coat. I know how paperwork can easily be hidden in clothing. She looked over at Elsa May. What did he put into his pocket, Eddie? A pen. A pen that was left there along with the contract to rescind the lease. Shand was paying you to pressure her. 
If Greta was planning on closing down, she wouldn't have raised the amount of commissions, and she would have told all our ladies. The counselor sat there, not saying a word. Shand, you were seen here at the fair the day Greta was murdered, and you were wearing Amish clothing. I was not. I already told the police where I was, and many people saw me. I wasn't entirely convinced of that until I remembered a comment that Anne-Marie made. What? Anne-Marie sat upright. You told me you weren't at the fair, that you were at your store and you'd come in early. You had to have known the time she was killed to tell me where you were at the time. It was in the papers. The exact time was never in the paper or any of the news reports. I just guessed. Anyway, I had no reason to kill her. I'm not staying here to listen to this. I saw you. I saw you at the fair. You were talking to Greta just before she died. You went to the tent and had a disagreement. Hate whirled around your head, and you put your hands to her throat and took the life from her body. Then you pushed her under the table and took off. That's why there's no record of you being at the fair. You were gone by the time the police arrived. It's not true. No, it's not. Because the person I saw wasn't you. It was you, Shand, in a wig. And right after you killed Greta, Shand, you made your escape from the tent wearing Amish clothing. Yes, Shand, you and the counselor were in it together. But even though your aunt was drugged, she still wouldn't sign those papers. You were pretty sure she wasn't going to sign, and you'd planned to kill her if she didn't. Why kill her at the fair? What better place than a public place? The killer could make a better getaway, and any evidence would have a better chance of contamination. It was clever. Almost anyone could have done it. This is silly. I've got better things to do. Shand got up to go. Did Greta deserve to die? Eddie asked her. Yes, and that's even before I found out about the money she let my sister squander. Money that should have been mine. You admit it? Yes, but try to prove it. Her bodyguard held the tent flap open for her, and she walked out, quickly followed by Martin Cruz. Eddie looked out to see them both in handcuffs and being read their rights. Elsa May walked out next. This will ruin the fair for everyone. No, it won't. The fair hasn't started. They'll be gone before everyone comes. Kelly walked forward as everyone walked out of the tent. Raymond, your charges have been dropped. He smiled, relieved. For real? Yes, for real. And I've seen to it that your name is fully cleared of suspicion from that old arrest, as well as this one. Mondo ruffled his hair and walked away. Kelly walked forward. Good work, Mrs. Smith. We had nothing on her, and we needed an admission. Elsa May chuckled. It turns out Matilda was right about seeing her at the fair. She was. She's a very bright girl, observant for such a young age. When Kelly headed over to his arrestees, Kate walked over to the sisters. I'm sorry I wasn't too forthcoming when I arrived here. I wanted a new start. My husband was poisoned by eating mushrooms. Thankfully, Matilda and I don't like them. There was talk that I gave them to him. But I didn't even cook them. Matilda and I were out for the day. He wasn't feeling too well that day. I thought he had a cold. He'd cooked mushrooms for himself, and he ate them with toast. We found him dead on the floor of the kitchen. Did Matilda... We both walked in and saw him. That's why I didn't allow her to go to the funeral. She'd been around enough death, and I didn't want her to go through any more sadness. I'm sorry there was talk in your last community. I'm also sorry I suspected you. Kate's mouth turned up at the corners. I forgive you. I do feel better now that someone knows. It's awful to live with a secret. I should find Jane and Matilda. Eddie and Elsa May stood and watched Kate walk away. 
Eddie, I can't believe you thought she poisoned our cookies. Eddie gave a little giggle. You can't be too careful. Anne-Marie and Valerie walked out of the tent. Ladies, we've decided to merge, Anne-Marie said. Merge? We're merging our shops. I know of a large place for lease. It was too big for me alone, but with Valerie's business and mine combined, we can do it. Valerie grabbed both of Eddie's hands. Thank you for bringing the two of us together. Eddie stared at them both in shock. You're welcome. She had thought they'd be angry with her for saying such dreadful things about them. We have so much to plan. Come along, Valerie. Anne-Marie turned and walked away, and Valerie followed. Well, who would have known, Elsa May said. Not me, that is for sure. Didn't Anne-Marie hear the part about Valerie not being good with money? That's not our problem, Elsa May. Let's go home, Etty. I need a good rest. Yeah, after you finish your quilt that you've barely begun. Elsa May chuckled. Chapter 39 Days later, Eddie still felt bad for suspecting Kate and putting her through what she had at the fair when the guilty people had been exposed. As her way of apologizing, she had invited Kate and her daughter Matilda over for lunch. After they finished the meal of roast chicken and vegetables, they sat enjoying a peach pie with cream. Kate asked, How's your quilt coming along, Eddie? Good. I do a little every night, and I'm quite enjoying it. Elsa May likes her knitting, and now I have something I can enjoy. Although I'm not used to things taking such a long time. Eddie likes things she can finish quickly, or she loses interest. Eddie held her breath, expecting her sister to say she never finishes anything. But she didn't. Kate nodded. They do take a long time, but it's such a sense of accomplishment when you complete one. Matilda is becoming a fine sewer. I'm teaching her all I know. I like sewing, Matilda said. Can I play with Snowy now? I think that'll be all right if you finished your meal, Elsa May said. Matilda looked at her mother, who gave her a nod. Okay. Matilda slipped off her chair, pushed it in, and looked between Eddie and Elsa May. Danka for lunch. It was nice. Then she hurried out of the room. Ach, she's so polite, Elsa May chuckled. I'm trying with her. She's not the easiest child. I know what you mean. My parents had dreadful trouble with Eddie. Eddie slapped her arm. They did not. I was a perfect child. I was too afraid not to be. There were always consequences for misbehaving. Elsa May chuckled. Kate, I'm so sorry about the other day in the quilting tent. Don't apologize. There's no need. There was no harm done. I realized that I can't escape my past if I don't accept it. I can't live a lie. I'm not so bothered now by who finds out about my husband. If they want to think I poisoned him with those mushrooms, they can. I didn't even pick them. He went out and collected them himself. Unfortunately, the poison ones and the ones that are edible do look similar. I'm pleased you're not upset with me. I'm not. I think we'll be good friends. Eddie smiled. Undoubtedly. I hope so, Elsa May added as she reached for another slice of peach pie. My sister does tend to overreact about things. No more than you do. You're worse, Kate said. What happened after the fair the other day? I saw those two people were arrested. Yeah, they were, and the police have evidence against them, enough that they both confessed. I'm so pleased. I have heard that there will be a new quilt store opening, a bigger and better one. Will you still open one? Eddie asked. Not now. I think it would be too much work for me at this time. Elsa May flung her hand in the air. I've got an idea. What if they want a third partner? 
The two of them are going in it together. Perhaps an Amish woman such as yourself would be an asset to them. Kate's face lit up. Do you think so? No harm in asking. Don't be too concerned if they say no, Eddie warned her. If it's meant to be, it'll be. Shall we have coffee? I'd like some, Kate said. Half an hour later, Kate and Matilda left Eddie and Elsa May's house. Matilda, Kate said as they walked to the house next door, remember what I said about keeping a secret about where we are from and all that? Yeah, it doesn't matter now. What about our name? Are we going to be Laps again? I think we'll keep our name the same as we've told everyone here. We don't want to confuse everyone, and they already know our last name is Roberts, which was my name before I married your father. I know. Okay. When they reached the front of the house where they were staying, Kate asked, Do you think you'll be happy here? I do, but I'll be even happier when we get a puppy. Kate giggled. When we get a house of our own, I'll think about it. They opened the front door and walked in. Tomorrow, we're going into town back to the quilt store. Again? That's right. Mama has some things to see about. Once Eddie and Elsa May had finished washing the dishes from their midday meal, Eddie said, I would have thought Detective Kelly would have stopped by to see us before now. He's probably busy. Don't worry about him. We're busy, too. I'm busy with my quilt, Elsa May announced. Sit in the living room. I have a gift for you. For me? Eddie frowned, wondering if this was some kind of a joke. Yeah, for you. Go on. Elsa May shooed her away. Eddie walked out and sat down on the couch. No one ever gave her a gift for nothing. It was such a lovely thought. Elsa May walked into her room and came out with a small parcel and handed it to Eddie, and then sat in her usual chair. Dinka, Eddie pulled on the pink ribbon to undo it. Pink? She looked up at Elsa May, who had voiced a strong and distinct dislike of this particular shade of lolly pink. You like pink? Eddie grinned and placed the ribbon on the couch beside her. Then she unwrapped the paper. There in the folds of the gift paper was something she hadn't seen in a very long time. She picked it up. It's my old knitting, Nancy, for French knitting. Where did you find it? I was cleaning out a few boxes yesterday and I happened across it. Now's your chance to finish something you started. When you finish your quilt, and then my quilt, you can do some French knitting. Then I'll eat my words about you not finishing anything. Knowing Elsa May, she'd probably kept that knitting Nancy for over 70 years for such an occasion as this. That's the kind of annoying sister she was. Eddie picked up the knitting Nancy and laughed. I have a gift for you, too. Elsa May grinned. What is it? I started buying you something wunderbar. But I didn't finish it, Eddie giggled. Elsa May's mouth turned down at the corners. I don't see how that's funny. The look on her sister's face made Eddie laugh all the more. And then she laughed even harder when she looked back at the old wooden and faded French knitting implement. This has been Threadly Secret. Written by Samantha Price and narrated by Sarah Morsey. Copyright 2019 by Samantha Price. Production Copyright 2020 by Samantha Price.